and, and not confusion about how these models are used. Um, so I'll sort of uh, touch on that after we have a recap on this. Am I the presenter yet there, Steve? Yes, I'm Steve. <laughs> I should have logged in as Martel's nightmare to scoop Merrick, but thank you. Okay. Talking about my bumper sticker. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, Steve Kamer, I wanted to remind you all that salmon is for sissies, and we're speaking about halibut. The there we go. Yesterday we spent some time basically talking a lot about operating model and and scenarios, and the emphasis I was really trying to uh, point out is that the assessment models that we work with, um, as Ian put so eloquently yesterday, it's like driving a car looking in the rearview mirror. And, and those models are also very important for uh, determining what the appropriate or the harvest policy should be. So when we estimate parameters in those models, <clears throat> those parameters, such as natural mortality rate and selectivity in the fisheries, et cetera, get carried forward into our harvest policy models. So that's the linkage between the assessment models and then the, the models we use to drive harvest policy. So as things like size at age changes or as things such as the selectivities in the fisheries change for whatever reasons, changes in gear, changes in the distribution of fish, the harvest policy could become uh, inconsistent if there's a dramatic change in, say, natural mortality rates or recruitment rates or, or selectivity rates in the fishery. The point we really tried to emphasize with, with the assessment model scenarios is there's a lot of assumptions in the assessment models that when you do sensitivity analysis may appear to look insensitive to what you saw in the rear view mirror but they're actually very sensitive in terms of how you go forward. And I hope that that message sort of sunk in yesterday. Um, we'll let osmosis work a little bit longer, and, and, and I think it'll slowly, through repetition, sort of understand. It took me a long time to understand that, that connection between uncertainty and, and the parameters that define the harvest policy and, and how you should move forward in time. That being said, the, when we come up with a range of operating models that we want to test, uh, our management procedures again, and, I, and again I qualify management procedures as things we can control and change, like size limits or areas fish or time area closures, etc. We want to make sure that we choose a suite of models that is very divergent in, in the predictions in the future. If you pick just one model, and, or pick model and they all have the same sort of predictions in the future for, for how the stock will respond to various harvest policies, then there really isn't a, a point in doing this, going through this process. You just sort of take a leap of faith, uh, just like changing the size of the fishery and, and, and play with live ammunition, that that was the right thing to do. Um, just like a, a structural engineer who would you know, build a model of a bridge and subject it to all kinds of small scale tests in a lab before they actually go out and build the bridge, the purpose of doing that, that model building exercise is to make sure that you don't put lives uh, in jeopardy when they start driving over that bridge. And when we <clears throat> embarked on this management strategy evaluation approach 
here at the commission, we were trying to do things the same thing. We didn't want to just change the harvest policy without sort of testing to make sure that the harvest policy is consistent with our objectives for this fishery. And, and that's essentially how uh, fisheries management and, and fishery science has really changed in the last 10 to 15 years. As people are do, is doing more of this simulation testing. Actually, the Halibut Commission was one of the first agencies in the world to do this. I think it was, Ian, was that paper in the 60s? Yeah, it, when, when computers were as big as this room, uh, the Halibut Commission was the first agency in the world to actually do this sort of testing, simulation testing and management procedures. So again, the, the take home point is, is we're really trying to develop an operating model that spans the range of uncertainty with respect to the policy parameters, not so much the biology of the animals, et cetera. Um, the other, we spent a long time yesterday really focusing on the procedure th side of things and things that we can manage or control uh, through regulation or, or incentives, however you want to try and control them. And we really uh, tried to take the thought exercise one step further and ask, should we trust our intuition? And I think we had a couple of, of examples yesterday. Um, one was the slot limit for the halibut. It's sort of, you have an intuition that this would be a good thing for uh, a spawning stock biomass. And what it showed is that it really didn't have any influence on, on spawning stock biomass, at least at the 55 inch, whatever level we put it at. So. That's the utility of, of the exercise we went through yesterday is that you can start to control, change things like the, the um, size limits or the slot limits or, or other things that you can control in the fishery, the selectivities in the fisheries, and sort of get a, a, an immediate feedback on how it may change uh, the way the harvest policy would be shaped here at the Halibut Commission or any fishery for that matter. Um, I'll open it up for questions here in a second. We talked a little bit, just sort of organically, about research priorities, and there was a lot of uh, questions that were brought up regarding the biology of the animal. What if growth changes, and what if size changes, and, and all those sorts of things. Again, those are fantastic questions, and those are things I think we need to uh, look at inside the scenario development of the operating models, but they're not things that we can directly control with respect to our management procedures. So again, this process is about looking for a procedure, so a harvest control rule or, or setting our spawning stock thresholds to a certain level that would be robust to changes um, in growth or mortality or, or uncertainty in bycatch or uh, uncertainty in discard mortality rates. So that's the idea is, is let's test this procedure, much like we would test a bridge standing up to the load of cars uh, in a computer before we actually test it with real live am ammunition. And see, if, at least within our frame of thinking uh, in a computer, it's consistent with our objectives. If it's inconsistent with our objectives, we have to, have to start asking the question, well, why are we missing a key feature uh, in, in the model? Uh, we may never know the answer, and we may actually have to go out and do field experiments. Um, we may find out things like migration rates are really important to know, or the sex ratio of the commercial catch is really important to know. So we need to start making investments in those areas uh, in our program here at the IPHC to sort of shore up those sources of uncertainty that affect the harvest policies. So that being said, this process, um, what was the term you used yesterday, Bruce? It was sort of the, the not the, the dumping grounds for all the ideas. Uh, and, and that kind of scares me um, to be viewed as a dumping ground. But it, it's, I think that's what the MSAB really needs to focus on is that we were, we're asking the right questions that are directly related and applied to the fisheries and not so much to the uncertainty in the biology because there's not a lot we can do about getting halibut to grow faster. Thank you. Yes, that's a better idea than the, the dumping grounds. Um, that being said, we need to start uh, thinking about these things more clearly because as we you know, invest a lot of time and money into to coding this stuff, 
we need to make sure that we can address the appropriate questions and we need to start a list, a formal list uh, that the MSAB would compile and submit for um, sort of examination. And then we also need to rank these and prioritize these items on, on this list uh, for the brainstorming center. Thank you. Um, any questions on, I'm sure there's a million questions on what we did yesterday. Peggy. Thank you. Um, I keep going back to a couple of things we said yesterday and I'll just ask about one of them which was Bob's suggestion that uh, this model doesn't allow us to play with the concept of 70 million fish or much beyond what these graphs go to. And my question, and that's, you know, fine. I guess my question is to um, people who know population dynamics a lot better than I do, which is probably everyone in the room. But this is a tough one. Is there anything we're losing by not, in terms of helping us um, come up with really robust scenarios in not being able to use this tool um, to, uh, with the background of a much higher recruitment, a much higher population, a much healthier stock? Okay. Um, I'll answer that question. Uh, now, and I, I think we're going to spend a little bit more time answering it even in, in more detail. Um, your question is a really good question, and in the previous harvest policy analysis that Bill Clark and Stephen Hare did, basically the, the scaling components of the population, when I talk about scale, I mean how big is it, uh, how much spawning biomass would there be if there was no fishery, and those sorts of things. They essentially adopted two scales, uh, a positive PDO regime and, and recruitment during a negative PDO regime. So based on the historical data uh, and their, their assessments at that time, they figured out what the average recruitment was during the periods of positive PDO and what the average recruitments were during the negative phase of the PDO. And then they simulated into the future, <clears throat> I think, with the probability of shifting from positive to negative once every 20 years, if I'm correct about that, 20 to 30 years. Yeah, and then they, they did that thousands and thousands of times and basically took the average of all of those simulations to figure out uh, what harvest rate you would use in periods of high and what harvest rate you would use in periods of low. And then I think the optimal harvest rates they said on average about 25 percent, I remember, I can't remember what the initial numbers, I think it was 25 percent at the time, it was a good harvest rate in both regimes. Um, in addition to that, some previous work that was done by uh, Anna Parma when she worked here at the commission and, and Carl Walters, they simulated this idea that you'd have healthy stocks and then unhealthy stocks and it was somehow related to climate and they ask what would be the best harvest control rule that would maximize the long-term yields. And what they found was, was using a, a fixed exploitation rate policy. So that's how we got the CEY, that constant exploitation yield, uh, into our harvest policy here. Um, your question is, can't we use this model to have periods of high recruitment and low recruitment? And the answer to your question is, yes, you can. Uh, what I've done here intentionally for this meeting was didn't allow you to have any access to the sort of biological parameters of this population. I was trying to get the group to focus on things you can manage and, and things you can change. You can't change halibut growth. It would be nice if you could. Um, they certainly, uh, you, but you can change the selectivity of, of the fishery somehow, whether it's, you know, incentives or regulating hook sizes or, or uh, what's the other one we use, reduce the discard mortality rates by careful handling practices and careful release practices, sorry. So those are the things that you can manage. You can't really manage the biology. I just want to just 
expand on that a little bit because it, it is an important part of your question, Peggy, and it's that um, we want to get to that stage to be able to do the sort of dynamic things and the, the immediate concern or the immediate impact of something like that from the perspective of an MSE is, for example, if you make recruitment a very dynamic function, then in your evaluation of the control rules uh, for sort of like the 30-20 control or something like that, the more dynamic you make the population, the more likely you are to sort of hop up and down amongst those control rules there. So the efficacy of your control rule can oftentimes be very critically related to that dynamics in the background there. So it isn't that these these things are sort of you know totally separate. I mean that's that's the thing that we need to get to in terms of trying to evaluate these. But I think you know we're sort of trying to do this in a sequential fashion so we bring all of us together and sort of understanding what's going on as, as we make these developments. But that is a very important question in the longer term. So I was just thinking that with selectivity for instance, do does a stress stock like this behave in the same way on selectivity alone as a much more healthier stock, much more healthier. That's a good way to put it. So that was my question. Thanks. Bruce uh, Gabbard. Oh, sorry, I had Paul uh, Ryle, then Bruce. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Maybe a, the first one that comes to mind. Yesterday I heard you say, Steve, around the operating model status that you had uh, spatial data together for a four area uh, model. So I guess, um, do you have a four area model that can use the spatial data? Uh, the short answer to that question is no. We have the infrastructure set up to address those, but Ian just put those together and we haven't actually put them into the model yet and started to play with those things. So. Um, when do you think you would have that kind of model put together? Uh, when the person sitting to your right comes down here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she just has to move down there? <laughs> <laughs> From Vancouver does, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, when, when we have, uh, we're trying to get Katarina to come back down here for s s another <clears throat> period of time because uh, the power of two seems to increase our productivity a, a lot more, and, and she's um, going to be an important resource to get these sort of sort of things working. <coughs> okay. Um, the other thing I'll add to that is uh, the other piece of research that I have on my books uh, is the same concept, but the same equilibrium concept. But in addition to the controls, or the biological controls, you'll have migration rates and you'll be able to set up uh, area specific catches and discard mortality rates just to see how you can play with apportionments and those mm -hmm. sorts of things in the long term. And the reason to do that in an equilibrium approach um, is to be able to have this kind of framework where I can show you on the screen the immediate feedbacks of, of your decision. The, the part I think, and I think Alan will probably re reflect on this, that's difficult with the MSC process, and I think we've already dis discovered this, is that a lot of great ideas get put in a room, and then you come back six months later, and, and we were only able to touch one or two of them, and you find out both of them were dumb ideas, or both of them were great ideas, and now you don't know which way to go. So the idea here is to use these sorts of tools to sort of pre-screen the stuff we really spend money on, or time and money on. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the next question I had, and I guess maybe you as a comment, then maybe it leads to an answer. Um, so when I look at model scenarios and management procedures, I guess I would be looking for some guidance from you and the IPHC on some of the model scenarios, meaning that, okay, so we have some uncertainty in po policy parameters, and I would assume some of those are going to have a bigger effect than others, or maybe you're more concerned about others than for example, I don't know, uh, release mortality. We're using 16%. It's an estimate that was produced uh, a number of years ago. Um, do we care whether it's 16 or do we care, do we think it should be 2% or what's the effect of that? And I'm, you've spent more time thinking about that than I probably will in the next year. And I think I'd like some guidance on, you know, that I could come up with a whole big long list of all the assumptions that are made that go into the model and really for me I guess I'm thinking more about the management procedures that would uh, lead to potentially some changes in the way that we um, 
uh, think about what we want to achieve out of a management of halibut more than the range of uncertainty in the policy parameters that clearly have a big effect on the outcome of the policy procedures. But I guess that's where I would expend my effort um, on the procedure end. And so, um, and I guess, you know, looking at what we did yesterday when we were playing with the model, um, we looked at a slot limit looked like it didn't have an impact, but I guess, you know, did we really explore that very much? I guess I would answer not a whole bunch. Um, I think it was probably based upon 16%, for example, and what if that was a different number? Maybe mm -hmm. that would change the outcome. So, anyhow, I guess that was going through my mind um, about where I would like to go. And, and in the previous meeting, we spent a lot of time um, thinking about the, uh, the objectives that we were trying to achieve which led to some discussion around both scenarios and uh, and management procedures. So I think we do have a list and and probably could go back to that and see if that's still the list that we want and uh, maybe it'll evolve uh, later today into a, a new list. Oh, with regards to the... To the management procedures, procedures. and scenarios. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I'm happy with going back and, and having a look at that list and, and discussing that further today. I think we've got some time in the schedule to do that. The regarding the you know examples uh, we had on the slot limit and the discard mortality rates, uh, and your comments about the guidance from the IPHC on on which things to explore are are fair comments and. The uh, I agree with you. I think we as staff can advise uh, the commissioners and, and the board members here on some of the assumptions that we're making where the policy parameters and even the assessment to that effect is very sensitive to, to the key assumptions in the models. And those will certainly uh, form the suite of, of, help us form the suite of, of operating models that we test. Uh, I guess I want some feedback from all of you as to, uh, you know, is it just enough for us to stand up here and say the model is sensitive to this or does, do you need to understand the details of why is it sensitive to discard mortality rates and why should we sort of deal with these sorts of issues? And that's where it's this sort of communication gap is am I talking to a group here and giving you the, the 15 second elevator ride on on what's the important key problems or uh, do we need to have a, a more thorough understanding I've been taking this from a, an approach giving you more detail maybe than necessary so that you can go back and answer questions um, to your constituents when they start asking those questions well why uh, why are we changing the size limits again and, and and then you have more information to explain that information so expand that. I guess that's your question, Paul, in, in terms of things like yesterday looking at slot limit. I mean, we just did a really quick pass through that kind of thing, did not play with the DMR, but the DMR is controllable within the, the mm -hmm. shiny tool there, so we can start to take a look at that. That was part of the reason about putting that, that particular component of it into there, but this tool is provided mainly for you folks to sort of work through your own ideas on that and, and sort of come back to us and saying, okay, I'm not getting what I think I should be getting out of this thing given these sorts of assumptions on it. So how does that actually relate to that? And that helps us to build a better tool for you as well. Um, I had, sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Um, on the discard mortality rate, um, so it, in looking back at, at our previous discussions, we wanted to have the, the OM to be reflective of, of what's realistic and, and we understood that we may not fully understand uh, what's behind status quo, for example, or, or the 16%. But at the same time, I think we need to have a good understanding about what we can influence through management procedures. And I think the discard mortality rate is a good example where, yes, we can play with it anywhere from zero to 100%. I don't know why we would want to go up to 100% or actually even play with things that are much higher than, than where we are or assumed to be currently. 
Um, but I would think that there would be some, some bottom floor that perhaps we would not be able to influence below. Uh, I don't know that we would ever get to achieve a, a zero percent. And so I guess I'm looking for the operating model relying on, on the experts to, uh, to kind of tell us what, what the bounds are for right. what we can reasonably assume we can, we can influence. And then um, I guess the, the second thing to follow up on Paul's point on the management procedures, what would be helpful to me is to look at the list of management procedures and get some general sense of the pros and cons, trade-offs, the effects of those different procedures. And, and that might be on different management areas and different sectors of the fishery. But I don't think I have a good understanding of that. And so if I were to play with the operating model, I'm going to run through different scenarios and, and, uh, and we'll probably um, hit a few brick walls if I try to propose those from one sector or another or one area or another because I don't know what the full effects are of what I'm proposing. And so um, that's another potential uh, to look at placing some sideboards perhaps on those uh, as well um, that I think given our goals and objectives we don't want to be suggesting anything that would be too extreme or would adversely affect one sector, one area greatly um, more so than another. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Bruce Gabrus. Yeah, it's Bruce Gabrus. You know, as we go through these models, one of the things that keeps coming into the back of my mind, um, you know, we want to try to get as accurate of a predictor, if you will, as you can, but the reality still is that the precision of the model is still going to be limited by the precision of our measurement and our knowledge of the data of the base stocks. So we're talking about uh, one of them was the PDO, you have a regime that's positive or negative. Dr. Stewart and I had a discussion yesterday can't even agree on necessarily what regime we're in, depending on which piece of data. I'm not. It's not a criticism. It's just that when you look at the data, it's it's not clean data. It's it varies. So you can't even you can't even agree with if you're in a positive regime or a negative regime. Then it's pretty difficult to use that as a as a tool in the model to say, well, we can predict it under a positive regime or a negative. You just got to tell me which it is. So that's a problem. And the same thing with uh, mortality rates, you pick a percentage, is that accurate? There's been some studies done and it's probably a best guess right now. And I'm okay with that. And I, I guess what I sense is that trying to achieve precision in the model that doesn't exist in the underlying data is uh, going to lead you to a, a position of false comfort. So probably the biggest tool that uh, the commissioners have is what's the harvest rate going to be? We're going to harvest at 15 percent, 20 percent, or 25 percent. You know that's going to affect the stocks. We know that. You may not know exactly why or how, um, but I don't think we should be afraid of keeping a um, fairly, I don't want to use a term simplistic, but I can't think of a better word right now, but a fairly basic model that captures the big parameters without trying to get down in the weeds for small factors, which first off may not be a big influence, and second off may not even be correct if you have the real data of the stocks. So, so that, that's my concern. I, that we, we shouldn't try to achieve precision that's not available in the in the data. Can I, can I just? I think that's a really good point, Bruce. And what I would take that. The other side of that saying is that we're not trying to find the perfect model to describe things perfectly. What we're trying to do is develop management procedures that are robust to being wrong in our assumptions about it. That's, that's, that's the, the goal of something like this is to protect yourself from your own ignorance in it and, and develop a procedure that doesn't get you into problems if you happen to be wrong about it. Just as a follow-up to that, Bruce, that's, that's a good point. But what I see from... Uh, perhaps from the outside as a criticism of, and we all fishermen particularly have our own idea about you've got to have this factor and you've got to have that factor of whether you're day fish or night fish or whatever. But uh, 
they're saying that maybe your models are simplistic and not, and not a true reflection of reality. We've all probably used that argument why our area needs to have a higher harvest rate than others. Uh, but um, I don't always say this tactfully. Uh, but I don't want to say that the folks are wrong in doing that, but the, the magnitude of their new idea, which you mentioned yesterday, Steve, that somebody always comes in, there's a, they got the fix to the whole problem if you just do that. Probably we as a body and, and as a commission in general need to tactfully resist that state of things that we know and are the, the, big, the big fundamentals that are reasonably um, uh, determinant you know, that you can determine. And for, for example, uh, the 16 percent on the mortality, is it the right number? We know for sure it's not zero, and we know it's not 100 percent. So I guess that, until we find something better, I guess that's as good as any other number uh, for the now for the modeling. So I guess, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm comfortable with those kind of assumptions and don't want the staff to spend a lot of time on something that would appear to be a very minor factor, unless there's some indication that it is significant. And the slot limit was a good example yesterday, that maybe it's significant, um, but maybe not. And if it's not, we need to move on. Jim. So thanks. So when Paul, I think it was Paul said, uh, is 16 percent the right number? I actually thought that he meant maybe as responsible users, we ought to work hard to reduce discard mortality, <laughs> and and so. So maybe that's a place that this group could make the most effect on uh, on increasing the halibut resources by not killing them when they come on the boat, reduce it to two percent. Completely absent what, what whether sixteen percent was right in the model, which seems to be where the conversation is going, whether they've estimated it correctly. But you know, as the directed fishery on that resource, that's one thing that probably the only thing we have really good control over. Is, is what happens to the fish that comes up on their boat. So I'm not sure that kind of a th thought is ex explored well in an MSAB, but I, but I do think if we want to continue to say, and I know we're on the air, but we're better than the trawlers, I think we've got to be better than the trawlers and do the best we can not, not to uh, kill a lot. Any halibuts you don't have to kill. Bob? <clears throat> Well, I had a similar opinion as Jim uh, when that 16% was mentioned because uh, my, my concern is that the Commission continually updates its assumptions on, on these variables and, and keeps up with what the fleet is doing. An uh, increasing portion of the fleet is using auto line gear and that is uh, creating a, um, a higher, in my opinion, uh, uh, in, uh, rate of of mortality in the directed halibut fishery than say a uh, 18 foot old style large circle hook and um, I'm not sure we're keeping up on on that aspect and also the outreach uh, from the Commission could be better to to do what Jim is suggesting is that the, the directed fleet try to take more care of those fish I've been told by my own fleet that when those 42 inch hooks start coming, if they've got bycatch and other stuff on them, it's hard for the the crewman to, to clear all that clear that fast enough at the at the roller. And then also on the the peacod fishery up there, <clears throat> where you're hauling 60 to 70 thousand hooks a day, and have I think our own survey shows nine percent uh, hooking damage in northern 4A and southern 4D. I think it, it is. Um, it, it okay. It's higher higher than that, and suggests to me that maybe the 16 percent isn't accurate and needs to be upgraded in other other areas. So those would be my interest. Is that the variables that we do have in the model are are um, looked at periodically? Yeah, the, you're referring to two different rates. So within the directed fishery, we use 16 percent for the discard of of uh, how that in the other bycatch fisheries, we actually Ian can explain this better. We actually have a 10% mortality rate for the good fish, and then uh, I don't remember what the other rates. I'll let Ian answer that one. 
in the non-halibut target fleets, uh, we use the observer data. So the observers categorize each uh, a subsample of the fish they observe being discarded into injury categories from uh, very, very low injury to severe injury. Each of those codes has a discard mortality rate estimate associated with it. And the weighted average of those for the area that you're talking about, Bob, um, the, like the Peacock fleet in the Bering Sea gets a weighted average of between 9 and 13 percent depending on the year. Um, those rates are updated every three years in Alaska, in Alaska based on the observer, the collective observer data over the most recent three years. And this, this year is a, a year of update, so we'll be looking at whether or not those rates appear to have changed in that fishery. But those are actually based on direct observation from the observers. It's, it's expanded out to the whole fleet but a subsample of the fish that those observers have witnessed being discarded is actually brought on board and they look carefully at the um, injury category. Bob? Well, I, I think that that may be a flaw in, your, in the assessment because uh, when you're releasing the fish that doesn't come on board for the, the, the observer to look at, that's probably the best looking fish you're going to see, the one that comes aboard. But the hook straightening is 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 that that gaff has got to be just right for it to to exit and and to bend that hook out to get to, and you're not the observer is not necessarily seeing those nine percent hook damage jaw damaged fish in my opinion um, they're seeing the ones that are best taken care of that uh, come aboard and are, are released inside the roller not outside the roller. So, Rachel? I just had an easy question, I hope. So the, the process that you just described for estimating the discard mortality for the different fisheries, is that written, described somewhere? Where's the best place that... I've had a lot of people in my office basically ask me for a description of that, and I have had trouble finding it. So I'm wondering, is that in the rah-rah somewhere? Could I get that again? I'm sorry, Rachel. <laughs> the process of estimating discard mortality for the different fisheries that Ian just described, the observer data. I'm just, is that summarized somewhere uh, that I could reference people to? So I, I think it was either the 2011 or the 2012 RARA. Uh, Greg Williams put together a report as they were um, re-estimating the rates that were going to be applied to 12, 13, and 14. There's a, there's a description there of the variability, the, the broken down by fishery, the distribution of the different injury categories and the mortality rates associated with each of those. And there's actually some estimates of the variance among vessels from the observer data at that time. Because it's only updated every three years, I think since that RARA, which would have been 2011, I believe, or 12, um, what's been reported is that same discard mortality rate and then estimates by fishery of the totals. But I believe this year is the year for Alaska to re-estimate those rates based on the most recent three years. Just, just for clarification, the observers aren't estimating the rates. The observers are actually categorizing the injury codes. The rates are somewhere else and they get applied to the distribution of injury codes. So th that's what the observer does. They don't estimate the rates. That's right. The, the rates were estimated from previous tagging studies where we categorized fish into different categories and then looked at the relative return rates of tags on each of the categories. And that work is fairly dated, although the argument there is that the biology probably hasn't changed. An injury you know, 20, 30 years ago is probably still, if, as long as they're being classified correctly. And I, I guess that gets back to Bob's question, which is there is a bit of a disconnect between classifying injuries inside the vessel and classifying injuries outside the vessel. And they're, they're there's potentially a study that could be done that, that actually captures fish outside the rail in some manner after they've been released in whatever method they were going to be released. The only, the only thing that, that makes it a little bit better perhaps than, than what you've described is that the roller man doesn't know until the fish comes up that that fish is going to be um, requested by the observer. So they don't, it's not like they get to pick and choose which ones they're going to hand to the observer. The, the observer waits until the fish is right there and then says, okay, I want that fish. But you're right, there is a difference between measuring the fish that's brought on board and, and outside the rail. And I don't, I don't know if this applies, but there's, you know, they've also, and I don't know how you could estimate it in a discard mortality sense, but there's also uh, 
it's been shown that there's an observer effect. And so people may, if there's an observer on board, they may handle the fish more carefully than they would without an observer. I think that's true of, of where you have partial observer coverage, but in a lot of the, a lot of the fisheries, particularly in the Bering Sea, where freezer are long under fleets, you have 100% coverage on them. Jim? So, so uh, sorry, Jim Lane and then Jim Balser. So. Jim. <laughs> that's okay. So it, this comes out the way I've been thinking about it. So we've gone around this discussion on with an example of the discard mortality rate from maybe we shouldn't really spend any time of it to actually this has been it's turned out to be a significant issue framed by some of the information Steve brought up yesterday about you know what is the impact of significant injuries or jaw injuries to the growth and not just survival but what's the growth problem so and and going what Paul said earlier about you know some direction from staff as to where we should be looking or directions about some of the research priorities and then how do we then you know look at that as how it impacts sort of our harvest policies so I think you know if you look at the, the shiny tool there's a number of categories there one is discard mortality rate bycatch selectivity um, to me just looking at those categories those are a pretty good selection of things you may want to discuss, we've discussed discard mortality rate, is that something that you want to spend time on as far as the research about, okay, what would that actually, what information you need to sort of clarify things and how that affects your harvest policy? To me, there's already direction from staff what they think are important, not everything. And the other issue is, okay, what are some of the other maybe management priorities or uh, research issues that maybe some of the members have or some of the harvest policy scenarios we want to look at. So Canada is, you know, we talk about, you know, you know, a very, you know, maybe 20% overall harvest rate, but variable within regions. Now, whether that's the operating model handles that right now, I'm not too sure. I'm not, I'm not too sure. I know you answered the question, but I don't know if that pertained to that aspect of it, so sort of that spatial yeah. thing. But I think we have some direction here, and we have. Looks like it there. It's at least it's important for the staff. I don't think we can quit there. And maybe that's the way to sort of, we're kind of going in a circle on this, but it's really it's helped because it's identified that this discard mortality rate is actually a significant issue and how that affects the harvest policy or, what our, or how that affects what the harvest rate may be if you're having significantly higher or lower, your assumptions on the discard mortality rate is, is wrong or it's differentially wrong depending on the fishery you're talking about or the methods. So is that an area that you want to spend the staff's research to look at? I mean, Sounds to me that there is. Sorry, just getting a question clarified by Bruce. Um, Jim, I think you, you bring up some important points, and, and I guess this is why I just approached Bruce. A lot of the uh, sensitivity issues we talk about in the assessment model and the harvest policy thing, we discuss internally quite a bit here amongst the staff, and then we also have um, uh, meetings directly with the commissioners uh, just sort of giving a, a heads up on on our research and where we're going and maybe that's a bit of a disconnect in, in that we should also be presenting uh, the research we're doing to this group as well as and we're certainly doing it through the SRB anyway so m maybe there's just uh, some misinformation there um, for example I'll bring up one issue the discard mortality rates I think are a significant issue and when you look at the observer report for the Gulf of Alaska Bering Sea Aleutian Islands that came out last June, um, they estimated uh, about 39 million pounds of bycatch in both the directed fishery and non-directed fisheries net weight of halibut. And But when we get the numbers and present them at our annual meeting, it's only 8 million pounds because we've applied a discard mortality rate. The landed fishery was 22 million pounds, and we caught 39 million pounds, or the estimates are 39 million pounds of bycatch. 
So even a small change in the discard mortality rates amounts to a huge change in the, in the discard mortality that we would put into our stock assessments. So I appreciate, I think, Paul and Jim's comments about more direction from the IPHC staff, and I apologize maybe for not sharing some of the other research uh, that we're doing here in-house um, on these issues, but your point is noted. Thank you. Jim Balsiger? Sorry, Jim. I don't, there wasn't a need to apologize for. I just think people are, it's, I think it's there, right? It's that, that you're putting some points out there and we discussed it and it's coming up and it's, the group is being, is realizing that it actually maybe is significant. But I think, yeah, I think that there's some direction there that, or some points that the staff think is important. I think maybe, you know, a little bit of more clarification, but I don't think it's anything to apologize for. It's just a matter of, okay, how do you communicate this stuff out to a number of different groups and, and different per, and different sort of backgrounds? Jim. I was just curious about uh, the observer procedure, if it's the same on trawlers as longliners and all of that stuff, but I think perhaps we're past that point here and I'll just find out off, offline. Yeah, I have no idea. Ian. In a nutshell, it's quite similar except that on the trawlers they actually give the, the fish a condition category and on the hook and line vessels they give it an injury category which have different rates associated with them. Uh, Peggy and then Bruce and Scott. Sorry, Scott first. <laughs> Peggy. I just wanted to give you some feedback on my thoughts of Paul's comments and Michelle's um, and probably other people's too. I think we get um, a pretty good sense through just the process from the staff of what they're looking at and how important it might be. And if we, um, my experience has been if I'm curious about something or I haven't paid attention during one of the presentations and I've missed it one year and I ask it the next year, then I get a pretty clear answer about the historical research and where the status of, of that issue is. Um, However, I think what Michelle suggested is really a good idea to get from you some parameters helping us understand from, and maybe we need to be a part of that discussion among uh, all of these different stakeholder groups to see what the impact would be of moving these um, factors one way or the other in playing with this model. Who is next? It was Bruce Gabries. Well, you know, the, the, the whole discussion about the mortality, I guess one thing that comes to mind is says, how many of these fish that are damaged and go back end up being food for everybody else down there? And then if you didn't damage them, certain percentage of those are going to become food for them. It's just harder to catch them, I guess, if you're there. So we're going to lose a percentage of those um, because of the food chain issues there. Um, but I think Jim Balsinger's point was a good one. It says we should strive to, you know, do the best handling practices we can, regardless of what the actual mortality rate is, because we do know that if we kill less of these fish, mm -hmm. that's the better for the resource. So that, that that's kind of an education tool, primarily from the harvester's side. We need to work on that. Um, but with the the actual rate. We spend a lot of time and money determining precisely what the rate is, if it varies from 16%. Where, where is the benefit of that? Does that mean that we can have a higher rate of harvest? Or what's the, what's the ultimate benefit from that to the group, whether it's really 16%, if it's 12%, or if it's 20%? I mean, in, in the end, I'm not, I'm not so sure from a modeling standpoint that over the long haul, um, how do we benefit from that if we know precisely what that mortality is? I guess that's my question. So, great question. I just answered it on the screen for you. Um, if you lower the discard mortality rate from, say, 16% to 11% in the directed fishery, the good news is you would spend less money fishing and you would catch more fish. So, looking at the graphics here, if I can stand up for a second. 
this graph depicts uh, the exploitation rate. So you would actually slightly lower the exploitation rate. The teal color here is scenario B, where I've lowered the discard mortality rate from 16% to 11%. My apologies for you who don't have bionic eyes in the back of the room. Um, and you, in doing so, there's actually going to be more fish in the stock. You'll catch slightly more yield. All I've changed is, is uh, created the incentive for, for better practices. So you lower the overall total mortality rate, you get more fish, and then you actually require less effort to catch your quota. So just as a follow-up, so if we could convince the commissioners that there really is a lower mortality rate, and they convince the staff that you just need to change the number, we all get to catch more fish? I mean, and that's where I'm having a little bit of a problem with that, is that that would be the logical conclusion, assuming the modeling is correct and assuming our assumptions are correct. Um, but I'm not so sure that with the available science and money that it would take to get better science, that I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if we can really make that, we can conclude that we're going to be able to get a better number without spending a lot of time and money. Um, quick answer, as John, I'll quote John, said, there's so many moving parts on here. The only moving part I changed was the discard mortality rate. You're clearly correct on the, all the other assumptions. Scott. Yeah, thanks. You know, I, I guess I have a like a two-part question, and one is, so you've you've developed this equilibrium model. <clears throat> you said it, that you did it to try to get us to think more about the things that we can change, and I'm wondering how this is going to fit in ultimately, how how these types of uh, controls, things that we can change, are going to fit in whatever the final operating, is this like a, a sub-model of the final operating model or is this just a separate model that you just want to use to stimulate discussion or what's um, the... You get, we have a more follow-up on this, but essentially you, you can think of this as being the end product of an infinite time horizon. So, or another way to think of it, this is the target on the wall that you're trying to get to wherever you're currently at. Um, is the sort of short answer to it. The, the reason for developing this sort of thing is, was twofold. One, to help you actually construct a harvest control rule uh, that's consistent with the objectives. So one of the objectives is, is based on these spawning biomass limits and or sort of, yeah, limits and threshold reference points. And that's something you can change here, whether you want to be more conservative or less conservative. So it really helps you build a harvest policy and a harvest control rule that's consistent with the objectives. Then you can apply that inside the dynamic operating model um, coming soon to a theater near you uh, and play out those, those scenarios and see how they actually work. Okay, thanks. So the second part is in recent years as like the catch sharing plan came together in Alaska and allocations in in Canada between recreational and commercial uh, size limits have increasingly been used to manage the recreational removals and there's been some concern expressed about a lot of concern expressed about discard mortality in the recreational fisheries and I don't know how you'd build a recreational fishery and have the same kind of controls over selectivity and discard mortality rate in here it's because those are applied area specific but at some point will this equilibrium model be will it be like an area specific version of this for and sure could we add in the recreational piece too yeah yeah just due to time constraints i've built a, a very not only due to time constraints i didn't want to come in here with a, a you know, we all have a radio at home. It has two knobs on it. And then if you go to a professional studio, they, they've got this thing that's got 10,000 knobs on it. I didn't want to bring you that 10,000 knob model for you to play with. It would scare you and, and scare me. Um, but there's two fisheries in here. There's a directed fishery and a bycatch fishery. It's just a matter of, of adding. <coughs> the only real constraint here is screen real estate. It, it, but to add another recreational fishery just means putting another tab on there and dealing with the recreational spec aspects of it. Um, and then to add the, the spatial components, you know, the, the three, four major management areas uh, into this thing is yet another 
thing that we'll be looking at in the future. And the other reason I'm interested in doing those is they're, they're, they translate into immediate feedback in a room like this. I'm lost on the list. So <clears throat> on um, this mortality issue of, on the directed fleet, if, if the people participating did nothing different than they're doing right now, but you reduced the size limit, this model that you have up here uh, shows a, a positive effect on, on wastage. So we gain there. But don't, don't we get to move the um, assumed discard number? Because a lot of those fish that were being tripped off are now being retained and not being and, um, killed. So actually we get a twofer. Yeah, you uh, get a twofer. Yeah. So all I've done here is change the discard mortality rate back to 16%. Uh, put the size limit in scenario A, which is the orange colored bars, it's the size limit is 32 inches, and in scenario B it's 26 inches. So this difference here is an increase in yield. Here's the reduction in wastage from about 1.6 million pounds to less than 100,000 pounds because you're not no longer throwing fish overboard or dying catch or retaining them. But you kept it at 16%. What would happen if it went back down to 12%? If I drop this down to 12% again, no. you get a little bit more. Keep them all. So you, you've done the two moving parts that you've looked at are both positive effects on reducing the total mortality rate in halibut. Uh, because you um, are now retaining fish within the directed halibut fishery that are smaller, you can actually catch your quota a lot faster because you're, you're keeping these smaller fish. So you spend actually less days at sea or less fishing mortality. And that's reflected by this graph. You can have a slight reduction in how much fishing effort it would, would require to catch that quota. These are they're kind of a relative scale. You don't have, they're not 0.2 days or anything like that. It's just a relative scale. So there's a win-win situation there. But then that's just looking at the absolute catch, the tonnage. If you then look at the, the same graphs, but then multiply them by the price composition, you actually make less money because now you're filling the market with smaller fish that are worth no, no dollars. So here we go to John and say, John, what are you going to pay us for five pound halibut? And he's going to give you a number and it might be 20 cents and it adds no value to the fishery. But if he gives you, you know, two dollars a pound for them, now you're making the same money you were getting before. But moreover, you're spending less money on fuel and bait, and you're doing a lot better for the resource by reducing the wastage. Not a lot better, but you certainly reduce the wastage uh, within the directed fishery. This is, I just want to when you talk about doing things like this, it's worthwhile sitting and spending some time thinking about this. So for example, if we decide we're going to decrease the size when you go down there, so the fish that you're discarding now, you're discarding fewer fish, but you're discarding primarily smaller fish, okay? And the mortality rate on those smaller fish guards is actually higher than it is on a larger fish. So it's those sorts of things that trade off on those. So it's, it's worthwhile thinking about these things, and this is what this tool is supposed to do, is allow you to look at it and say, okay, maybe if it's a larger discard rate on a smaller number of fish, what's the trade off on that? So again, this is what the tool is supposed to help you do. You're assuming also that the, the fleet is static and that you, you could have exactly. the fleet uh, reconfigure how they're fishing too. Uh, I have a, a few questions or comments. And, okay, so uh, coming back to what I thought was the original point of the discussion, we're here to give you guys our thoughts on some research priorities, our scenarios and management procedures. Okay, so I'm, I've got that part right. Okay. Um, this is just a question for my, uh, my, my ignorance here now. A scenario is something that we can't control. I got that part right. Okay, here's where I'm struggling, and maybe it's just a 
if we can control the size limit, why is it a scenario up there on the board? Uh, mostly because I ripped off some software from an economist. Um, yeah, it, it should be procedure oh, okay, A, procedure okay, okay, B, okay, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Just wanted to make sure I was on the right page. Okay, so just to, to get some thoughts that I'd like to see for possible scenarios, um, I would like to see to be able to vary the proportion of total reported catch. Remember uh, the very first shiny object you gave us was what if, what if there was some missing fish? I'd like to be able to just, hey, let's just see what happens, 85%, 90%, just to see if it does anything. Um, something else I'd like to see is, and maybe this comes when we get into a, looking at it by area, is be able to vary the rate of migrations. Migration, you know, just play around with it, see what happens. Um, well, let's let's say hypothetically that there's underreporting somewhere. Yeah, so you know, let's just play around with it. What if, for example, it was ninety percent? We're missing ten percent somewhere. What happens if it's ninety-five? Again, these are just things that if I'm gonna have all these buttons to push, these are buttons I'd like to push. Um, uh, size at age, I, I would like to kind of be able to, and I don't know how to, I'm just throwing this out there, I don't know, do you do it over a trend over time, do you do it just, because I mean size at age changes, so I don't, I don't think how you can just say, oh this is a size at age from now till forever, um, but I just think that might be something that um, fascinates me and I'd like to be able to do. Um, and then for management procedures, we've got size limits up there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to management procedures because I want to think about it a bit more, but, but that's just some of my thoughts off the bat there. Sure. Thank you. Um, can I just, uh, your first comment regarding the mi missing fish scenario we did in the management strategy evaluation. And basically the point of that exercise that was I think two meetings ago was to show can we find a harvest policy that looks robust to under reporting. And the lesson we learned from that is is yes we can, but essentially what happens is we underestimate the productivity of the stock uh, and the, and by how much is relative to how much. To do it in this tool you could sort of simulate that effect just by by changing the bycatch mortality to 10, uh, but you presume it's 8, and you can see what the net effect would be uh, just looking at by changing the total bycatch cap. Okay, I mean, I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. What I don't want to do is look like I'm, by doing that, saying, I think that this, like blaming it on bycatch when it could be something else. That's exactly. all. I just, you know, yeah, it, no, we don't want to create any bad blood or anything. Yeah, Bruce Gabris. You know, we're talking about discard mortality rates, um, and another thing that uh, has been an issue and uh, probably needs to be addressed, and I'd like to know what the current status is, is now that we're into the catch sharing plan, where basic a percentage of the harvest goes to charter sector versus percentage of the harvest goes commercial, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the modeling currently uses a zero mortality for the catch and release. And in the charter sector, there's about a half a fish to one fish released for every one that's retained is my understanding of it. So uh, we, I think it's pretty obvious we know it's not zero. We know it's not 100%. So there should be something assessed there. And I don't know if that if there was discussion about having progress towards coming up with a mortality rate and assessing that to the charter sector. Uh, and I'd like to know whether or not it's still zero or if it's going to be something other than that. that that's a really good question, Bruce. And uh, we raised this with the commission a couple of years ago and did an outreach with all of the agencies responsible for sport management and said we wanted to get their best estimates of what mortality, release mortality was in sport fisheries. And, and the only agency that responded in a positive fashion was, was ADF&G and Scott, uh, I, Scott et al. produces some of those estimates, uh, but that's not, that's the estimates we're using, but I, the commission has, has put the agencies on notice that we're going to use something uh, for this because we know it's not zero uh, for those things. But Ian, do you want to respond any more on that? Yeah, just to reiterate, we are intending to use um, 
a, a best estimate for each regulatory area for recreational discards. We have estimates directly from Scott for 2C and 3A, and we're going to be piecing something in. La in last year's process, I did do a sensitivity analysis in the assessment to an increase of 5% across the board to recreational mortality, which is probably bigger than we would estimate the discard mortality in addition to the retained mortality is. I wanted to make it just a little bit bigger to see whether even if it were on the outside it would be um, would, would have changed our perception about where we were. Where it will have, and it didn't have much of an effect there, where it will have a bigger effect is in the catch tables where the harvest policy is actually applied and, and you should see that this year in, in those estimates. I think there's a, a secondary part of that is that one is uh, what's the DMR that's used for release recreational fish, but the bigger question is how many recreational fish are released, and we don't have that as a comprehensive estimate across the coast. Well, I, I guess I'm a little confused by that answer, you know, that previously when you have an allocation going to the charter sector, there was zero accountability for any catch and release mortality. That was how it was calculated. When, when in this case the commercial sectors are assessed 16%, of what we what our estimate of release were that's that's part of the kill, so I notice there's an absence of a number, uh, Dr. Stewart, in your answer about what that is. I mean, we're using 16 percent. Um, I'm very familiar with Scott's work as far as the the data and the stuff they have. So, if we're going to if we're going to use it, what do you think the estimate's going to be, and when is that going to be implemented? And I'm assuming that will come out of that share of the charter sector. So Scott can speak to what the actual discard mortality rate that he's estimating or using in his estimates, but where, where my focus is is on what is the incremental increase in total removals from the recreational fleet. And what, we, what I got out of Scott's report last year is I think it was between 2 and 4% additional on top of the retained recreational catch was, was associated with um, mortality associated with release. And so that's why I did a sensitivity to 5% across all areas. In most areas, as Bruce pointed out, we, we won't be able to distinguish between the rate, the discard mortality rate and the total numbers of fish. What we're going to probably have to do is just put a proxy estimate in there of X amount of pounds as a, as a fraction of the total pounds landed. The, the problem with the recreational fleets, even within areas in Alaska, but especially as you get to other areas, is that all the regulations are different. And so that, you know, for example, in Washington, we don't have a minimum size limit, and it's a one fish bag per day, so it's, it's not at all clear that, that the same kind of percentage might apply in Washington that it would in BC, which has got its own regulations, and Southeast Alaska, which is different. Um, the situation we're in is we've asked all the various agencies for their best estimate. Where we get them, we'll use them, and where we don't get them, we'll use something like 2 to 5 percent, because you're right, we know it's not zero, uh, but we don't know exactly what it is. Um, thinking about uh, procedures, Chris's uh, comments triggered a few thoughts in my head. Um, we have talked about looking at um, different control points. So right now in, in this particular fishery we have a control point at point two and point three and maybe you could just remind me how we derived the point two and what performance metrics we used to decide that that was a good thing to avoid. And then um, if we're going to explore some others, I'd like to understand that first before proposing anything else. But the other one that we have, um, we're currently implementing, we have an over, and it was triggered by your comments earlier, Steve, that we have an overall harvest rate that we think is going to lead to um, a sustainable fishery and provide, um, I forget, optimized yield. And, um, but we do have different harvest rates in different areas in the fishery currently. So what impact does that have on the overall assumption of a fixed exploitation rate <clears throat> as the best way to manage? And what happens if one area had a, um, I don't know, 30% harvest rate, for example? And so what would that look like? Uh, the short answer to the question, I don't know. Um, but the more detailed answer is, is the Equilibrium model and the tool we presented here and, and even our coastwide assessments can't really address uh, those area specific harvest rates. Um, my understanding, Bruce, I'll let Bruce um, 
provide more detail is is that the lower exploitation rates to the areas out west uh, was due to just more uncertainty at the time in the area-based assessments when, when that was being done, and they had a higher exploitation rate in the core areas of the stocks, so area 3A and, and south of there uh, all have higher exploitation rates. The answer to your other question with regards to area-specific exploitation rates being, say, 30% in one area and 20% in other areas is uh, entirely conditional on the migration and movement and dispersal of fish among all of the areas and what time of year it happens and what time of year the fisheries are prosecuted and, and everything else. So um, it's not clear that we could ever address that question uh, with the models we currently have. I think we can, and that's my first priority, is to start uh, using an, a spatially explicit equilibrium model to start looking at how sensitive uh, those kinds of questions are conditional on, on the tagging data that Ray Webster's put together on, on what we know about migration so far. And, and again, those data are just a snapshot of one period of time, uh, and those migration rates are subject to change or be density dependent or any other process. But again, I think you're asking a question uh, that really is how sensitive is, is our overall picture to, to these assumptions about my, migration rates and could we have higher exploitation rates. Um, you know, I think Ian would agree with me. You could probably harvest out on the tails of the distribution if, if it's a sort of a one-way trip for halibut. You could probably harvest as hard as you want and never really impact the overall fishery as long as as long as there's food coming down the pipeline all the time. But I, I don't know what those rates would be and how it, in, it would impact the overall stock dynamics. Just to talk a little bit about. Um, harvest rates, and that's a perfectly reasonable question, Paul, and that's one of our long-term goals is, is revisiting the harvest policy at some point. But um, I did give a presentation, I think, in our second meeting on the basis for the existing harvest policy and where those rates came from and why they're different in the, the western areas versus the eastern areas, so we can go back and review that. But uh, I, I think we have not, uh, when we're talking about um, optimum harvest rates, we haven't done that additional analysis at any point yet because we wanted to sort of try to get some stability in the assessment process before we started to go back and look at the, the harvest policy process in this, but then that's also tied into what we're trying to do in this in this process here. Oh. That helps. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, thanks very much. Um, maybe just another comment. You know, uh, Jim's comment about uh, going back to the uh, release mortality I think is a really important one. And that, you know, I think it's important to know whether we think 16% is the right number or not. But even more important is that one can make changes to management that uh, lowers that number, whatever it really is. And that's been de demonstrated in a lot of fisheries. And so you really, as I think Bob talked about, you kind of win-win. You know, you get better information, but you end up with uh, reducing <laughs> that overall impact. And sometimes they're not big changes to what you're actually undertaking. So it's, it has a low cost, at least I've seen it in some other fisheries. And then sometimes when you actually go out and collect that information, uh, you can be quite surprised by the answer. Like I know I was when we did a, a release study in the Fraser River on salmon and uh, the recreational fishery, and uh, it was such a low number that no one believed it. And uh, so we did it for four years or something like that <laughs> and kept on coming back with a number of like 2%. So this is releasing of uh, sockeye in fresh water. And I'm not saying that anyone's going to get down to those levels in all sorts of fisheries, but the point is that one can make changes as well and uh, and end up having a much better outcome. Yeah, I, I think that's that's quite correct, Paul. And I, that number shouldn't be actually, actually all that surprising because I think the, one of the reviews that Scott did a number of years ago I think that's the kind of level of releasing recreational fisheries, the sort of DMR you might experience for that. But I'm going to come back to a point that Ian made yesterday, and this is extremely critical to these things, is when we talk about changing whatever management procedures we're using or control we're using, control rules that we're using, we need to have the data gathering exercise that goes along with that so we can actually estimate what the results are of doing that thing. So when we talk about changing size limits and so forth, we better have the data collection process that says, okay, here's what the actual catch looks like. Here's what the discards look like. If we don't have that, then we're still going to be whistling in the dark to some extent on this. Yeah, our, our definition of performance metrics in these models includes the term measurable. Uh, it's one thing to 
think it performs well, but never have any data to actually test whether it performs well. So this might surprise you that I have a comment rather than a question. Um, and I think this discussion this morning mostly has been about bycatch. And my comment is just it's helped for me anyway. Um, you know, there are many moving parts to this um, procedure, these procedures, this, this document, this thing we're looking at. Um, and we only get the two knobs, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what would happen if we got the, the hundred knob <laughs> version? Um, but what this discussion this morning has meant to me is, is not just many moving parts. Within this bycatch issue, is it 16 percent? It varies by area, by fishery. Um, there are a huge number of moving parts, and, and all that does for me is suggest that you know, this output, we're trying to predict where the hurricane is going to hit land, and again, this discussion makes me think it's going to be somewhere between Key West and Bar Harbor. <laughs> and not that that's, yeah, not that that should stop us from doing this, but it's just, ultimately, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, ultimately, um, I'm relying on you as the biologist um, to use all those hundred knobs and come up with the best answer. And we can certainly provide input, and, and I think the, the message this morning was uh, research priorities, um, and I have a few, but I'll, I'll wait. Uh, but really, what, what you want to know, what we want to know is, what is the, is this thing most sensitive to? What is the, uh, is the prediction for catch most sensitive to? What data? So that's really what we want. That's what we need. Right. And we have some of that data, but we have varying degrees, and so we don't really know. I mean, you might have some data for something that, that is, is, is important, but you need better data. Just, Bruce, as you said, you, you got to have, you want this release data right now. And I think that's probably where the research priorities need to go. But um, I left yesterday thinking, yeah, there are a lot of moving parts, and I'm kind of, uh, you know, I just, it, it confuses me. And then this morning I'm thinking, geez, between each, in, within each part, there are a whole bunch of moving parts. Uh, it reminds me of trying to read the, about, about the string theory. <laughs> anyway, thank you. So we've talked a lot about the discard mortality rates, but I, I think an important uh, area of research is also the, the underlying catch estimates or discard estimates that are applied to those mortality rates. And you, you mentioned them uh, briefly, Steve, but um, it's worth pursuing working with NIPS uh, on the observer data, even though I know for 2013 the coverage rates in the, in the directed fisheries was only 7% or so. And there's uh, um, average weights applied to those discards are, are not, um, were the landed weights, and so they're not the, the right weights. But I, that's an area where as, as the observer program begins to collect more data from the directed fleets as we get a better, better coverage, then you will be able to apply those if you work with NIMS on that. I know the, the council is very interested in that. Um, as well as the uh, the size of those discards, and I think that was one of the one of the areas that we recommended continued work uh, between the two agencies mm -hmm. to really verify whether uh, I I just don't think that the estimates that the commission is using based on the survey information for discards is is accurate. It goes back to um, Bob's comments about the gear spacing being a lot different compared to the surveys. And so I, I think you really have to pursue that. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Who has the initials GR? <laughs> Gary Robinson. 
so quiet back there. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jim Balsiger. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd also like to comment on uh, on uh, discard mortality. Um, because it's always been a thorn in my side that the commercial fishermen were got dinged for our wastage, and the sporties never did. So I'm glad that the commission is going to pursue that. And I seem to recall Scott presenting several years ago at the commission, and it seemed to me like it was five or six percent in this in your sport fishery. Anyway, I'm glad that number is going to be pursued. Regarding the discard mortality, though, off commercial gear. It, it surprised me when Ian said that it was, uh, what did you say, 10 to 13 percent based on condition of injury? Because if it, you know, I, I, I couldn't really see those fisheries being lower than our 16 percent range in the halibut longline fishery. But then, uh, soak time might have something to do with that, though. I mean, if it is observed, so I just wanted to throw that in. Soak time in those fisheries, I think, is quite a bit less than the halibut conventional halibut fishery. I also wanted to comment that uh, I, I was reading this little paper, Tips and Tricks, that was sent out to us. And uh, I kept rereading this last night, this paragraph on constructing OMs, or operating models. And uh, one point the authors point out is that it says a range of OMs is required uh, because various uncertainties affect the consequences of management resources. And I'm assuming that, you know, you've got five sliders up there and then two other data points. So you've got the seven knob bottle here in front of us, <laughs> not the hundred knob model. But every time you reset those sliders, you're looking at a different scenario, right? That's what you call a scenario. Uh, yeah, I've just relabeled to procedures. Thank you, Chris, for, for pointing that. Okay, so, so that's in, in essence, a different version of the operating model right. every time you reset those sliders. Uh, no, it's a different, a different um, management procedure, what they called CMP, a candidate management procedure in that paper. Uh, would be changing CMP, the CMP, okay, yeah. candidate management procedure. Correct. Anyway, uh, I noticed that the, un the, the uncertainties they're talking about in this paper, they, uh, they break it into two categories. Um, one set relates to the fit of the model to the data, what they call uncertainty in the parameters. And the other set is what is uncertainty about the processes operating in the real world. And I assume that's things like, you know, migration and recruitment, things that we are kind of mysterious to us. Anyway, I'm I just encourage everyone to read that little par couple paragraphs there because it, it was very helpful for, for me last night. So, so this, this next version, which is going to include migration, and, and I see in the notes uh, to uh, our last meeting, which you sent out a few weeks ago, you, you promised it in 2015. So, <laughs> so that's in answer to Paul's question as to when it's coming out. The year 2015 is his promise there. So. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. <laughs> so, December 31st would be my best bet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, my other point is that, well, two things really. Um, just regarding going back to discard mortality or what we call wastage in the commercial fishery, I wonder if we don't want to even add an objective to uh, minimize wastage in our fishery. That might be important to arguing for uh, a 30-inch size limit versus 32. So folks yeah, might we, want to we do about have that. we do have an objective. We don't. I don't remember if we specified an actual value in that table of objectives, but we did. Yeah, it was less than 10 percent is what we. Thank you, Dan. Um, we did specify an objective of trying to reduce the discard mortality of less than 10 percent of the landed catch. Um, and there's one other way I haven't showed you how you can do that uh, as well, and that's by changing the fishery selectivity. You don't have to change the size limits, you don't have to change the discard mortality rate. 
you just have to fish smarter and avoid catching small fish. And Gary, you yourself right. tell me that you move your gear yeah. to try and get a 23 pound average rather than a 19 pound average. And I think it, if that information, so I've done that on this scenario here, I've just changed the fishery selectivity so the fishery is actively trying to avoid areas with small fish. And the first thing that happens is you reduce the wastage by over 50% with right. just a, a small change in the fishery selectivity. Right, right. I was playing with this shiny tool last night, and I noticed that with a 30-inch with size limit, the uh, amount of discards drops by about 6 million yeah. uh, pounds, and the amount of wastage drops by just over a million pounds. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. Jim, I think, was next with Jim Balzer. <laughs> And I'd just like to take this opportunity to, to announce that I'm going to be a grandpa for the second time in May. Thank oh, you. Congratulations. <laughs> um, it's 10 o'clock now. Why don't we have a, a short break? We'll break for 15 minutes. Come back at uh, 10, 8, 10, 20. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome back. This is where we are on the agenda, uh, the sort of development on the status quo versus perfect information. There's this really, sorry Chris. Sorry, before we get to perfect information, um, just on the research priorities, I, I just think it would be helpful um, once we get a list, because I'm sure we'll want to revisit them once we've all seen it written down. In other words, I'm doing what you know, lawyers reserve to write to recall that witness type of thing. Um, just because I'm really interested in hearing this hate discussion and, and what happens there and the like, and maybe that could tweak something. So thank you. Yeah, I'm about to um, put Alan on the spot here in just a few short minutes. Um, Alan's going to make a, a presentation on the Pacific hate stuff pretty quickly here. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on uh, the development of status quo versus perfect information. We're really... Um, our priority has been at this point in time to integrate the uh, model that we use for the assessments inside the MSC product into the uh, suite of models that's used in the ensemble modeling approach. And the reason, the primary reason we want to do that is just to maintain um, some connectivity between what the assessment is because we need the, the parameters from those assessments to condition the operating model. So that's where we've been focusing our uh, efforts. So there's no really new updates on that uh, status. I already reported that we have assembled the, the data and, and we have some other things. So I'm going to, with Alan's permission, if he's ready, uh, turn it over to him and he'll make a presentation on the Pacific Hague stuff. So. Um, how, will you guys give me control or? Yeah, I'm right here, Alan. Okay. And uh, your computer, be sure to mute it. It'll come up. Oh, okay. Um. There you go. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks, everybody, for um, – inviting me and having me here. Um, I really appreciate hearing about your process um, in the halibut world. And this is something that myself and my colleagues have wanted to learn more about the um, halibut MSE. So Steve asked me to maybe just give a quick overview of the process we've been going through with Pacific Hake um, to develop our management strategy evaluation 
Um, and so I'll do that, uh, share a few lessons we've had, and um, to maybe spoil the punchline, it's not a lot different than what I've been hearing the last day and a half. <laughs> I, I was saying to Steve yesterday, if I just substitute the word hate for halibut, this would just be one of my meetings. So, <laughs> um, and before I start, uh, I just want to uh, mention my uh, colleagues and co-authors on the Hake assessment and the management strategy evaluation. That's Ian Taylor, who uh, I'm an office mate with. Uh, Nathan Taylor and Chris Grandin are with DFO in Nanaimo. And Sean Cox is a professor at SFU in um, Vancouver. And we're all members of the Joint Technical Committee of the U.S. and Canada Pacific Hague uh, Whiting Agreement, uh, which is also sometimes referred to as treaty. So if I say treaty or agreement, they're the same thing. Um, so a little bit of background first on Pacific Hague or Whiting. It was mentioned yesterday, is it Hague or is it Whiting? Well, it's both. So uh, we'll just call it Hague or Whiting, whatever comes up. I typically refer to it as Hague, but I believe in the U.S. they refer to it as Whiting as a marketing term. Uh, in Canada, it's more commonly referred to as Hake. It's uh, distributed along our coast from way down south in Mexico to southeastern Alaska in some years. Um, and it supports trawl fisheries in British Columbia and the lower um, 48 here off the US. Um, so really, that's all we're dealing with is midwater trawling. In uh, 1982, Bob Francis published this uh, paper with his migration hypothesis for uh, Pacific Hake. And you can see on the left here that it's assumed that Hake are spawning um, maybe off Southern California or Mexico in the winter time. In uh, April through August, they're typically migrating up the coast into these feeding areas. Uh, up into British Columbia with uh, smaller fish staying further south and large adults going further north. Um, and then after, um, in the fall and winter, they migrate back towards their uh, spawning areas down south. And then in 2006, Vera Agostini uh, published a paper with a migration hypothesis for Pacific Hake, and you'll actually notice the hypothesis is exactly the same, but you can see the improvements in, I guess, um, uh, graphics design, because <laughs> uh, it looks pretty cool. <laughs> so that's about the improvements we've made on the migration hypothesis over the last couple of decades. <laughs> um, and with that mi mi migration hypothesis, uh, given that it's, uh, the distribution of hake on the coast is um, a function of age, it's also a function of environment. And so we really have a variable distribution or a lot of annual variability in the distribution of hake. You can see in 1998, uh, hake were distributed uh, way up into southeast Alaska, whereas in 1995, they were barely up uh, you know, north of Vancouver Island. Um, and that distribution has been variable amongst the years. This is all the years that we have acoustic survey data for. Um, it also has, uh, shows variable recruitment. And um, this is estimated recruitment, uh, or age zero recruits in billions of hake uh, from the assessment model that we currently have. And you can see that basically there's been four very large recruitment events, or predicted recruitment events, over the last few decades. Um, and just to note, these were such large recruitment events that they actually support the fishery for up to a decade at times. The 1999 year class, which isn't even the biggest of these four, um, supported the fishery throughout the uh, early 2000s. And we're still catching some of those fish in the fishery. But along with those big recruitments are a series of small recruits. Uh, this sort of blue band is you can consider sort of average recruitment or range of average recruitment. And you can see that there's long time series of below average recruitment. So what this does is it just means that there's a lot of variability in our population. <clears throat> Hake also show uh, variable growth. So um, I think you're starting to get the picture here. There's a lot of variation in here. Um, this is basically a graph of weight at age over years on the y-axis. So starting in 1975 at the bottom to the current or the recent data we have in 2013. And the age along the x-axis with colors being red showing small weights at age and greens and blues showing large weights at age. So you can see in the in 1990s, 
we had a period of time when hake weren't growing as large, and they seem to be growing a little bit more large um, in recent years. And on this theme of variability, well, we're just starting to investigate maturity in hake, and that we've seen in the small amount of data we have that there's a variation in the maturity at age, or um, maturity at length also. And what this plot shows is length on the y-axis, age on the x-axis, and then in green are uh, mature observations and blue are immature observations of fish. And what I'd like to just point out, in 2009, all of the observations we had were mature fish at age two, but in 2012, most of the observations we had were immature fish at age two. These are from actually collected from different sources, um, I believe a bottom trawl survey and an acoustic survey, but it's something we're investigating and trying to understand the variability in maturity at age or length. And this results in variable fishery catches. Um, this is a catch history over time from 1966 for Hake. You can see in 1991, um, most of the fisheries shifted from uh, foreign type fisheries <clears throat> to more domestic type fisheries, uh, especially in the U.S. And um, over time, you see the heights of these bars are quite variable. 2009 was a very low year of catch. Um, but the proportion in these bars is, is relatively similar. So these are different sectors, and those sectors are basically catching similar amounts from year to year. And just to note, too, that they aren't always catching the entire um, total allowable catch in every year, um, not because they can't, because there's other allocation. Uh, it's catch is allocated to tribes, say, and the tribal fishery may not catch a total allocation. Um, and there's other things that are keeping them from catching the tack rather than um, availability of fish. And then finally, a new plot I've been looking at is the economics of Hake over time. And this is just basically the landed value of Hake in millions of dollars. Um, and <clears throat> given the variability in the catch, there's also been variability in price, and that results in some variability in economics. Um, so you can see in recent years, the Hake fishery has been uh, high value, sometimes over $50 million. Um, and we definitely want to avoid things like what happened in 2009 with a low price and a low tag. So all of this variability results in uh, variability in our assessment. One, in there's fluctuations in the population of Hake. They can go really high. Um, if you look here, this is our equilibrium unfished biomass, or B0 as it's called. Uh, just over 2 million metric tons of female spawning biomass, but the Hake population has been predicted to exceed that equilibrium biomass at times and then quickly decline, quickly increase, quickly decline, and again, in recent years, it's actually um, been predicted to be increasing quite fast um, due to a 2010 um, year class that's quite strong. However, um, there's a lot of uncertainty in those estimates. The blue is the uncertainty around that, and you can see that we just don't have a good idea what's happening currently in um, the Hake stock. And so this is an issue for deciding on tax and trying to plan for the next five years when you don't know what's really coming in in the next five years. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uncertainty given the um, the per, the paradigm that we're living in with hake, in that the fishermen are out there in the U.S. They're sometimes catching one-year-old hake in the fishery, not very often, but they are. They they are now marketing two-year-old hake, and a three-year-old hake is actually a very marketable fish. So. But our acoustic survey goes out every other year, and it's only measuring fish that are age two and greater. And so you see there's a little bit of a mismatch, and the fishery starting to fish on fish that we haven't even seen yet. So we just don't know what's coming in while they're still fishing on it, and that just lends a lot of variability in the population. And feel free to interrupt me with any questions as I'm going along. Yep? Can your acoustic survey just not see one-year-olds? Um, the question was if the acoustic survey could not see one-year-olds, and they just believe that they don't see one-year-olds well enough to index them um, along with the adult biomass. 
We are currently looking into methods used in the acoustic survey to provide an index of one-year-olds. And, and that's a great segue into the MSE part of this is we want to introduce into a management strategy evaluation. What if we did spend the money on an age one survey? Would that actually improve the management of Hake? <clears throat> Sorry, I've got no, one no quick problem. question before yeah, we get sure. to MSE. I was wondering about the variable maturity. Was that over the full range of this population? Um, yeah, the, the maturity data we're currently collecting is just the start of hopefully a series of maturity data. And that those data were collected by um, mainly by a bottom trawl survey, which is only in the U.S., so we, not, we do need to look at it more spatially, and also we need to look at it by which gear um, was catching those samples. So this was a bottom trawl survey, which is different than a midwater trawl survey, so we're not sure if there's differences between those two um, uh, gear types and what type of fish they're catching. So I have a quick question, too. Yep. You, when, you're, when you're doing your survey, are you doing it in the, in the winter when they're aggregated in Southern California and Mexico, or are you doing it throughout the year? No, um, we're not doing it. Um, in, we're not doing it in the winter. We're basically doing it in the summertime when they're in their feeding areas. So the hypothesis is they're moving from their spawning areas into uh, the feeding areas uh, closer feeding to areas the coast, and then the coast, survey, and is, survey capturing is capturing them when they're, they're um, in those feeding areas. It would be ideal to catch them or to survey them when they're in their spawning aggregation. And there have been attempts in the past to find that spawning aggregation. Yeah. They found it one year, and then in another year, I think they didn't even find any um, spawning aggregation. Hmm. Um, and there's plans for them to go out this year and do another survey. In the so my other question is, and it went by me too fast, but the, the, the size and age thing, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've looked at that relative to those recruitment events, too. That is, looked at you know, what impact that huge increase in population has on, you know, subsequent size and age? Yeah, that, that's, um, that's correct. And there's actually a lot of people at the University of Washington that have been looking into those effects. So they've been looking at, are these differences in size and age or differences in growth, you might call them, a function of environment or a function of cohort size or possibly both? And I think the real answer is both, but how can we how can we really model it and introduce it into this model is something that we're doing a lot of investigation on right now. Al? Yep. One, one other quick question. You said that the uh, directed fisheries are all trawl fisheries, but then you mentioned a tribal fishery. Is that also trawl? Yeah, okay. uh, the, the tribal fishery is a trawl fishery. They have a few boats. There were times when they actually cooperated with the mothership fleet. So we have an at-sea fleet that does at-sea processing, and they would deliver to, um, yeah, the mothership fleet. Um, however, in recent years, I think they've been delivering to shoreside plants um, where they do the processing on land. Um, and the tribal fishery, it can only fish in a very small area off of the coast. Um, it's called its usual and custom area. And they've had a couple of issues. One, they have not been seeing many fish in their area, I think because of the age structure of the population and the migration of the fish haven't been moving into that area. Um, but they have also haven't been reaching their catch because they haven't had the infrastructure for transportation of getting those fish from the boats to the plants. So there's a lot of issues here with Hake and why they're not realizing their full um, catch. Okay, um, <clears throat> so that's the um, assessment results, and just to give you a little bit of background on how we do the assessment before we go into the MSE here, is we're not specifically modeling growth, and this is something that when Ian Stewart, when I worked with Ian Stewart at the Northwest Fishery Science Center, he really introduced us to this concept of using empirical weighted age and, um, and how that can just eliminate a lot of problems in trying to model growth. <laughs> when you're trying to make that linkage from uh, weight to length to age, that's a tough one when you have as much variation as we have. So we found that it, it actually produces a, a, a much more stable assessment model and a much more useful assessment model um, for the assessment of Pacific Hake. And we're actually doing some investigations on when you sh what types of stock should be used in weighted age or empirical weighted age type models and when should you be modeling growth. Um, there's some students at UW I'm working with on that one. 
We have fishery and survey age compositions. We have a biennial acoustic uh, survey index, unless we can convince them to do an annual one. And we managed to do that in 2011 <laughs> with a lot of complaining. But um, it, was, it was really useful to the assessment to have that survey. And I'll talk more about that later, why I mention that now. Uh, recruitment's highly variable. We model it as a single coast-wide stock. Uh, we're now estimating annual deviations in selectivity, so selectivity is time varying. Uh, we found that to be very useful. Um, and we do assess it annually because of that variation again. We, we really need to be knowing what's happening and what the latest data are telling us. And we're using the stock synthesis assessment software. <clears throat> so that's the assessment of um, Hake. And just to give you a little bit of background on the management of Pacific Hake, and um, just to note, Paul is a, uh, a member of our management committee team. And if I do say something incorrect, please jump in, Paul, and correct me. <laughs> um, I am more on the science side of things. So I mentioned there's this international agreement for Pacific Hake and Whiting. And this is an international agreement between Canada and the US that was written in early 2003. Um, it says somewhere that it was implemented in 2006, but in reality, it was actually practiced or implemented in practice um, where we formed the committees in 2012. Um, and I think the actual date of implementation that is referenced um, in the political realm is 2008 or something. I, I, th there's a lot of dates floating around on this one. But um, we are practicing it now, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, we acted in the spirit of the treaty for many years. And when I was working with Ian Stewart and Steve Martell in the Hake world, um, this is when we were acting in the spirit of the treaty and cooperating more between the US and Canada. And now we have that formal agreement in place um, where it's formed four different international committees. The Joint Management Committee is composed of the managers, uh, US and Can and managers from US and Canada. They're responsible with uh, deciding on the TAC and guiding uh, other research and management um, ideas. The Scientific Review Group uh, reviews the assessment, and that cons again consists of Canadian and US uh, people. The advisory panel are uh, stakeholders and people interested in the Hake uh, industry. And they advise all the different committees. And then the Joint Technical Committee, which I'm a part of, is responsible for the um, assessment and the research and any sort of quantitative analysis. <clears throat> and hang on there. Um, and so the, with, with that agreement in place, our assessment process is really a collaboration between US and Canadian scientists. That's the JTC, as I mentioned. And we have public meetings, uh, two, at least two every year, one in December, one in January, where we discuss uh, the data and the preliminary assessment results. We review the stock assessment over a period of a week in February. And then in March, the, all these committees meet, explain their points of view to the JMC, and the JMC comes up with a total allowable catch that is then implemented in that same year. So in March, they make the decision on the catch for that year. Uh, the season in the US starts May 15th for some sectors, uh, for the at-sea sectors, and for the shoreside sector starts beginning of June. But I think in Canada, they can be fishing in April. Is that right? Yeah, um, there is some fishing going on in, in early spring, but really the fishery, similar to what Alan's talking about, gets underway really later in May, June, July, and carries on throughout uh, November. Yeah, which makes the fishery going into November, December, makes it a little hard for the assessment scientists to <laughs> make sure they have the most recent set of data before they have to turn it around by uh, a February assessment <laughs> deadline. <clears throat> so the management process, once we finish the assessment, we bring the uh, assessment results and all the committees meet to, um, with the JMC, and the JMC decides on a coast-wide um, TAC at that March meeting. Now the agreement defines uh, a harvest rate and a control rule. That's basically an FSPR equals 40%. So that's the harvest rate 
and a control rule where if the stock is below 40%, there's an adjustment um, so that the catch declines faster than it would under that harvest rate, and then the catch would be zero if the stock status was 10% of its unfished biomass. So you can think of that as the blue line in this figure here, where you have the harvest rate de decreasing the catch when it's relative to the exploitable biomass. And then once you get below 40% stock status, that, that line increases a little bit faster. However, the JMC has a lot of flexibility. Um, the agreement states that if the JMC feels differently, they can change the tack accordingly. And so they might take the, the role of, well, let's, let's change the harvest rate. We found that there's enough uh, support for a different harvest rate, a lower harvest rate, and we're going to follow the red line. Or they might go along with the blue line, but then have uh, follow the blue dashed line and not allow catch to go above some level. So there is a lot of flexibility, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later when I'm talking about the management strategy evaluation. But I think here it's important to realize that the agreement defines uh, the split between the U.S. and Canada. That's actually a defined percentage in the agreement. It's down to the second decimal point, 26 point something something percent. I can't remember. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And then that split then goes to each respective country, and then within each respective country, they decide what to do with their quota. I'm not exactly certain how it happens in Canada, but I know in the U.S., uh, the split is a defined percentage between the sectors after the decision has been made how much to pull out for tribal and research quota. Now, but, are, are you going to talk about the in the MSC the control rule? <clears throat> Things are in the sort of 40-10 versus like 30-20, I think? Um, I'll talk a little bit about that control rule, but okay. not really specifically. Uh, I'll just be more um, that we've investigated it. That's, that, that's all that I'll mention here. I guess the, the question I have on is that if, when it's something like 40-10, you probably spend a lot more time in the adjustment zone than when you have, um, say, something like a 30-20, but the, the adjustments are more dramatic in a 30-20. Has that sort of been evaluated within the MSC? Um, it's something that we haven't looked specifically at in the MSE, but it's a great concept that we've been thinking about, and we've been um, we, we've started looking at that concept in um, trying to help stakeholders understand that when the stock is above 40 percent, that yeah, you're going to have greater yields um, or a, the ability to have a greater yield because you're not being reduced by that control rule. Once you drop below 40 percent your harvest rate is getting reduced at a, at a greater value. So, you, so um, what I'm going to talk about and a little foreshadowing here is the objectives, and we've been trying to define the objectives, and given that that's the control rule, is the control rule defining our objective, or do we want to find a, define an objective that then defines a control rule? And that's sort of where we've been struggling at in this process. <clears throat> so in the management process and the... Um, Something I did realize yesterday is that the decision making is really at this coast-wide level so for the management committee, and then each country is de then deciding what to do with their portion, but it's not, the JMC is not getting together to decide how much is going to each country. That's currently defined by the agreement. However, in the, it is uh, up for review, um, I can't remember when, but that that proportion or that split may come up for review in the future, which is something that we're thinking about in a management strategy evaluation. So getting into this MSE and the call for a uh, management strategy evaluation, um, one thing I want to caution you against, uh, I'm not sure where the Marine Stewardship Council sits with the uh, Pacific halibut, but um, Pacific Hake is currently certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, and they defined a condition, which is to investigate the performance of the harvest control rule. And so, they, and, and that was it. So we're like, well, that's pretty ambiguous, but it sounds like we're pretty open-ended on this. Um, but we didn't really have anything to weigh it against or what, what, what they really wanted. They just wanted us to investigate it, so we did. Um, <clears throat> but... It, um, it, it started us on the road for management strategy evaluation. And one word of caution is when I started explaining an MSE to uh, stakeholders and managers, 
many of them thought I was saying MSC for about a year, I think. <laughs> so that was a year one. Um, no, but so um, one person uh, from Canadian industry suggested we call it MS Charlie and MS Echo. So every once in a while I will refer to it like that. When I am talking about MSC or the Marine Stewardship Council, I will try to say it, Marine Stewardship Council. Um, so that's pretty much all I'll say about MS Charlie right now. Um, but it was the impetus for us to start down the road a management strategy evaluation, and that would have been in 2012 when we started this process. And there was a lot of initial trepidation from the stakeholders and the managers partly because they didn't understand what a management strategy evaluation was, and maybe because they also didn't understand that I was saying MS Echo instead of Charlie. Um, but uh, it was, it was um, an interesting start in that the scientists thought, this is a great thing, this is going to be a lot of fun, and stakeholders and managers said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we really want to understand more of this. And so we didn't just go to our computers and start coding, we actually had to start thinking about things. Imagine that. Um, <clears throat> but as scientists, we realized that there were many more questions of interest that could be answered with an MSE. Um, and things like, would it be for Hake with this quick, um, you know, this uh, quick turnaround, the, the fishery catching young Hake, the, the survey, a biennial survey not uh, indexing Hake that are less than two years old, would we actually improve the management by having an annual survey. And so we wanted to investigate that um, as well, and we embarked down that road too, because as scientists, again, we are always asking questions. So that was really year one um, to investigate these things. And we didn't, we jumped into this process where we wanted results quickly, mainly for uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, because these conditions had to be satisfied um, especially now that Hake is up for renewal this year under that, um, under that certification. And so we wanted to get an MSE going quick without doing a whole lot of background thinking um, because I really like to jump into things, I guess. So we decided we'd use stock synthesis as an operating model and um, also as the estimation model, very similar to the assessment that we're doing. And this can be done, um, <clears throat> and it was done in year one. And we decided to look at the harvest strategy defined in the agreement and this annual versus biennial surveys, and we'll report those results one year later at our February um, meeting in 2013, I guess it was. So before I go any further, I just wanted to show you how we thought about the management strategy evaluation in this first year and carried it into the second year. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on on how we thought about management strategy evaluation and how we're sort of learning some lessons and maturing over time. So we started with the assessment model. That was really the way that we conditioned our operating model was we used assessment model um, as an operating model which has um, these estimated recruitments up to this year 2013 in this case. Um, it has a trajectory with uncertainty around it for spawning depletion and it has a fixed catch series because these catches are known um, exactly, of course. However, we have uncertainty in that assessment. So we don't know recruitment exactly. We don't know depletion exactly. So we used Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling to characterize the uncertainty in the, this historical time series. So for example, um, this blue dashed line, you may have some high recruitments early on and some smaller recruitments later on. Than, than what the average model says. And that would result in a spawning depletion trajectory looking like this blue dashed line in the um, figure below. So it's not quite increasing as fast as some other scenarios. And so really this uh, variability is a way to introduce our variability in the scenarios so that we don't have just one scenario going forward. Now we have scenarios where natural mortality is different, steepness is different, um, selectivity is different, and all those parameters in the stock assessment are slightly different, giving us some variability in our projections. However, the catch is constant because that is a fixed catch that was taken out of the water. Yep, go ahead. So, um, 
if you look at one of these big recruiting events, and I think the last one was 12? 2010. 10. Mm -hmm. So in this year, you're catching a four-year-old fish that came from 210. Do you go back and look at, do you make an estimate of that is, looking back, I'm always looking back, um, but do you go back and look at, okay, in 12 we saw this, in 13 we saw this, in 14 we saw this, so every year that goes by, you should be able to make a better estimate about what actually happened in 10. Yeah, that, that's, you, you know, we have this plot that was coined the squid plot, and it's, it's a look, if you don't mind, I'll break from the presentation. I tried to include it in the presentation, I just couldn't find a good place, but you found the good place for this. So I am going to, no, that, that, this, this is great, because I really wanted to show this plot. This is one that we really like. Um, this is our assessment document, as Ian Stewart taught me to say, close your eyes, because I'm flipping through this fast. Um, and find the squid plot is pretty obvious. Um, there it is. So um, this is this is sort of the retrospective bias in estimates of recruitment. <laughs> oh really? Uh oh. <laughs> I'm kicked out. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, anyways, in the Hake world, this is our squid plot and. Um, this is our inability to estimate recruitment until we have a certain amount of data. And so, so, so you're exactly right. In, in 2011, we had no observations of that 2010 cohort because we have no data coming in on those fish. Um, actually, I think we had a tiny little bit of data and it really blew up our model. But I'll show you an example in, um, see this light blue line that ends in 2008. This was one where we had, when that, that stock was, or that cohort was age two, we had a very small indication from the fishery that was getting a small amount of selectivity um, for that age fish. It said, hey, there's a lot of that cohort out there. And so our assessment model estimated that to be a very strong cohort. As we updated that with additional information, including information from the survey now, um, it downgraded the size of that cohort quite a bit. So this is something that we're very interested in reducing the amount of this uncertainty in estimates um, uh, with a, a small amount of data. And so you can see there's a number of patterns we have here that as we get more age data, we tend to estimate the um, size of that cohort a little bit better. There's been a few cases where we've overestimated it including 2005 and 6. And the good news here is that if it's a small or a large cohort, we tend to get it right pretty quickly. It's just we don't know the exact magnitude of that cohort right away until they're about age 4 or 5. And then remember I said the fishery is operating on age 2 fish a lot of cases. So this is something we have to be very careful about that we understand that there's the potential for this um, uncertainty in the estimates of these. So these are sorts of things that we do look in our management strategy evaluation is what sort of things can we do to reduce the amount of uncertainty in this and I can't remember yeah the, um, so we introduced time variant selectivity because it actually buffered against uh, us making this mistake a little bit um, and that's one thing we investigated with the management strategy evaluation. Yeah Peggy. <clears throat> Could you explain the bottom part of that chart? I don't understand okay, the sorry, negative. Yeah. So, yes, sorry, I jumped into this one. I was so excited about getting to show it to you guys. <laughs> um, the the, the x-axis here is the age of the cohort, and the y-axis is the deviation from average recruitment. The different colored lines now are a specific cohort. So let's look at the 1999 cohort, which was one of our most popular cohorts in the Hake fishery. And when that cohort, the 99 cohort, was age two, we estimated it to be a somewhat strong cohort. And so that would have been an assessment done in um, 2001. And it's actually this same assessment just backed off 
to 2001. So it's not the actual assessment in 2001. This is, so this is saying if we did this assessment model in 2001 with data up to 2001, this is what we would estimate that cohort size to be. And then once we get another year of data, that we've increased a little bit. And as we kept adding data, we kept updating the estimate of that cohort size. But by the time that cohort was age four, we had a pretty good idea how big it was. Yep, um, that one, yeah, that one's negative. And so, and, and that's an interesting pattern that we do see occasionally with these small cohorts is we thought it was even smaller than it was. There could have been aging error perhaps confusing us or it's a small cohort so we have little data coming in. It takes a long time for us to actually get a picture of that cohort. So I think that there's actually, it's actually more difficult to estimate the small cohorts than it is to estimate the big cohorts. When there's a big cohort, you're going to see those fish and you're going to know this is a big cohort. When it's a small cohort, you might not see them for a long time. Do you have any more, Peggy? Or? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Well, so just a couple things. Um, <clears throat> we don't have, I haven't seen, or maybe I have seen, I've just forgotten, um, a chart similar for halibut, and, and I think part of the reason is you don't we don't see halibut typically show up um, until they're well beyond four years. Where you you see this fish show up clearly at four years, you don't see halibut show up. So you don't have this kind of we don't have this kind of graph. We don't have a squid graph. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's an interesting one. We actually took this concept from Jimmy and Ellie. He does it for his Pollock assessment, which is very similar to Hake. Um, it, I, don't, I don't have any intuition how it might look for halibut being you know, a longer-lived species and not showing up until they're eight years old, but it, it might be interesting to see it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, we haven't had a stock assessment model with a long enough time series to produce anything interesting until last year. Mm -hmm. But now we do have some models that estimate multiple cohorts over a pretty long time span. So we, we actually could produce a plot like this. In fact, I just wrote in my notes, make a squid plot. <laughs> well, hopefully it doesn't look like a squid. <laughs> it's named that because of the pattern it shows. So getting the big picture, I still don't quite get the big picture. This mm -hmm. is fascinating because you can look back at the cohorts and see how strong they looked over time right. or how weak they looked over time. <clears throat> But I just don't understand what recruitment deviation means. Those words to me mean that there's either a big deviation or a small deviation. Right. But that doesn't really say it unless I'm not seeing it. The negative numbers, why, why negative numbers? Okay, yeah. Um, it, it, um, I guess I'm used to people in Hake of, you know, we have our terminology and our plots we show. And so um, it, it's going to be helpful for me to give a little bit more background. So when we have no information about a stock or about a cohort, size of that cohort, all that we can say is that cohort is of average size. So when recruitment deviation is zero, that means the, the cohort is of average size. It's not deviating from the average at all. What is that scale on the <clears throat> What is the one It's in log scale, so it means a an, it means one order of magnitude, two order of magnitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, e to that e to that value. So it's 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 a huge uh, a value of three is what eighteen sixteen times greater than average or something exponential three, so something like that. But I think one is like twenty point, twenty times twenty times. Yeah, e to the three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it shows you how variable the Hague population is. And just to note too that. The real concern when we first did the, um, this squid plot was when we were estimating this 2008 year class. And in our first one, this blue line came up, and then it came way down. And we weren't sure how that blue line was going to continue. And so that was of considerable concern to the Hake fisheries, that if this cohort doesn't pan out to be what we once thought it would be, then we're going to not have any fish out there. So that was the concern behind this. I think the other message is trying to put in this plot is that it actually takes you four, five, <coughs> six years of data before you actually figure out how big that cohort was. Yeah. yeah. 
Go ahead. But if I look at this graph, I'm feeling comfort because year one, it looks like generally you're underestimating, I mean, it looks like the big years you're underestimating what's happened. That's because you just don't see it. The other thing I'd be curious about is, you know, for like 2008, it looked big. Is that because those fish didn't have as much competition for food and they grew bigger and therefore they showed up more in the fishery because that's how you're measuring what you're seeing? Um, I mean, there are all kinds of things like that. Th it that's right. Sort of There's, th there are a lot of hypotheses. And, and the one thing I'm not telling you here and unrelated to squid plot is Humboldt squid. Um, we're <laughs> I'm really confusing you now. <laughs> I got MSC, MSE, two different types of squid. Um, in 2009, Humboldt squid were, were highly prevalent off of our coast, and if that caused a higher mortality rate on hake, that could have caused that decrease in that 2008 year class. And so those are the types of things we're trying to sort out. We just don't have a lot of data to really pin it down to one cause. Yeah. How many, how many otoliths did they get out of that one squid? Oh yeah. E, e, how, how many was it, Ian? They had they had emptied one squid stomach that had like 200 juvenile hake otoliths in it. But they were from they were from young of the year hake, not adult hake. But there are there are there is documentation of Humboldt squid, which can be 30 kilograms, yeah, eating eating full grown hake. No, the, the Humboldts only live a year to a year and a half. Oh yeah. And they grow 30 kilograms in one year. So. They have to eat a lot. Yeah, well, and they were all over for a couple of days. <laughs> did, did you have a comment about this graph, Ian? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, care. I just remember seeing, um, you know, IPHC estimates of recruitment, and I just recall that, uh, you know, you tend to put error bars on them, and those er there's a huge error bars on year four, five, six, and then they get progressively smaller as you become an, uh, more more determined what the actual number is. So you're not actually using error bars here at all, but you're, we, this yeah. is just a point estimate for each year. That, that's yeah. right. We have a plot with the error bars on it. It just is a big glob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, but, but, but you're right. The, the more data you get, those error bars do shrink, but for Hake, they, um, in recent years, they shrink a bit more. We don't have, we're not getting any more historical data, so they're not shrinking a whole, whole lot. But um, there's still a lot of uncertainty with Hake um, in the estimates of the cohort size. <clears throat> any other questions on this plot? I'll head back to the presentation if not. I just got one. It's actually a okay. halibut question. If we applied such a thing to halibut, we're going to that that the unknown data, we don't start picking up visibility to a cohort group to what, year four, five, six? So we'd have a, we'd be downstream of that quite a ways. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that's actually the comment I was going to make, which is that if you took this thing and moved it to the right about six years, it would probably look fairly similar for halibut. we got a similar situation. The, you're exactly right to say we estimate average recruitment for the first five years that that cohort's in the water, because we don't have any estimate, no data to tell us how big that cohort is. Then at age five, we start to see a few of them in the survey, six, seven. And I suspect it's not so different from Hake, and, and I'll make some of these plots, but that it takes four, four to six years to really nail down how strong we think that cohort's going to be. But that's four, that's four to six years starting at about age six. And, and not dissimilar to the hake situation, the hake fishery is starting catching a few age ones and catching more twos and threes. Our fishery is going to catch a few of those fish at seven and a few more at eight and a few more at nine. And we're still learning about that cohort as the data start to come in from the fishery. It's not till that cohort's probably 10 to 12 years old that we have a pretty good solid estimate of its abundance. And it's already halfway through the fishery at that point. And that's a good point. I mean, I think what what I'm learning today would be useful on this plot is to show sort of overlay um, fishery selectivity onto this plot so you can see where they're catching these fish and when you're learning about the size of the cohort, has the fishery already been taking them or is it not going to be taking them for another couple of years? And if the, if the fishery is not going to be taking, um, you know, if the Hague fishery wasn't catching fish till they were five or six, 
this plot wouldn't be as big of a concern, but the fact that the, the, they're taking fish at age one and two before we have a good idea how big they are, that's where the real concern in setting the catch comes in. Yeah? I guess just if I look at 1999 and I go out to year 14, there aren't very many fish there. That's right. It's just relative to what other 14-year-old cohorts look like, this is a lot of them. And, yeah, and a, yeah. a hake is probably generally, I mean, most of the hake are probably dead or, or gone at age 10 or 12. I mean, you get a 14-year-old hake, that's a... You'd be surprised that 1999 year class comprised more than 10% of the Canadian catch last year. Wow. Uh, when it was 13. Yeah. So, but bigger fish are going to move further north. Exactly. So um, it, it's and and, and there was there's a long string of poor recruitment so that Canadian fishery has been really surviving on this 1999 year class and a couple other smaller cohorts but you know more than 10 percent of their catch being made up of these 13 year old fish is, is really unbelievable. Peggy? Do we know in the fisheries that are 100 percent observed how the um, you know, if they're catching one-year-old halibut, is that ever is that ever recorded? You know, the babies that might just not even be. We do get some length frequency data from the discards, and there may be a few one-year-olds, but I think primarily the the bycatch. I'm thinking actually. A, one of our better sources of data is probably the Bering Sea Trawl Survey, where there are a lot of juvenile fish, and they're, they're actually using a caught end liner, so they're catching even, even smaller halibut. And primarily, they're catching, they're catching some two-year-olds and some three-year-olds, but mostly actually four- and five-year-olds in the Bering Sea is sort of the peak of the selectivity for that. And I would suspect that the bycatch selectivity up there is similar, but it's going to depend on the fishery and the time of year and exactly where they're operating. Any other questions? All right, well, feel free to um, ask me at the break or, or any time about this stuff. And um, I'll just go back to the presentation now and continue on sort of how the MSE, how our sim simulations are working for our management strategy evaluation. So to recap, we um, start with our assessment model, but we use the samples from this posterior distribution um, that characterize uncertainty. We actually use each trajectory as a potential scenario to simulate into the future. So that's sort of how we introduced or quickly introduced variability or variability in our um, operating model. This is, you can think of this as multiple scenarios. Then projecting into the future, this is highly uncertain, um, where we are now just drawing random recruitments from a very potentially wide range of recruitments with a sigma or a variance of 1.4. That's one of the highest, um, most varying recruitments I've seen for any fisheries uh, or any fish species. So you can see recruitments are all over the place, um, which results in spawning depletion going all up and down. Now remember, we're, we're basing this immediate projection off of some estimated recruitments, and we believe that the 2010 is large. So most of the time, this population increases, and then catch starts reducing it, and then it starts to equilibrate over time. And that's why you see catches going up really high, because this 2010 year class coming in, <clears throat> our assessment model believes they can take a lot of catch in the next few years, because they, it believes this cohort is so large. Um, and just to note, these catches are mostly greater than 600,000 metric tons. There's some that are greater than a million metric tons. The most that's ever been realized in the Hake fishery is 389,000 metric tons. And our model is predicting a million metric tons can be taken. So, um, yeah, go ahead. But on the catch, that's a function of a management decision that says how much we think we can catch. Yep. Not necessarily how big the cohort is or or the stocks in general, right? It, the, the, this catch is a function of that harvest rate, and it's just simply times how much biomass of things is out there times that harvest rate. And so it's, um, it, it is believing that the cohort is large out there and there's enough biomass, 
such that you can take that large amount of catch. But it's based on a really naive management decision. Well, I guess that's the interesting part because it looks like you're not getting visibility until you're well into the harvest period of these fish. Mm -hmm. So on what basis are you believing that it is either a small or a large cohort? Yeah, so the simulations are just believing it's, it's at that point estimate. But the variability, so in these different colored lines, that's introducing the, very, the uncertainty in the size of that cohort. And, and that's why some of these, um, it's hard to tell here, but some of these the catch is quite, is, well, it's lower. Um, and that's because that's a, a scenario where it didn't believe that 2010 cohort was as big. So it's trying to sort of integrate over that uncertainty, but the point estimate of that cohort from this assessment model with only, say, two years of data in, in, uh, um, in, um, influencing that size of that or the estimate of that cohort, it's, um, it, it believes it's big and that point estimate is very large, so it believes the assessment model believes it can take catch in the future. As we collect more data, then that might be um, downgraded, for example. Um, and that's what the MSC is doing. It's simulating that data collection as well as the assessment process. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if these fish are like Pollock and mm -hmm. four years old, you've got a pretty good idea about what's there. Well, well according to the squid plot, it's showing more like five or six years old. Okay. Um, and and it, I think that's a function of the data that we're collecting and the data that we have with this biennial survey, whereas Pollock has a little bit more data in, in forming. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you may have said this, but so what happens with Hake is this joint committee actually goes through all the data, makes a decision about what the, the TAC or the catch can be, mm -hmm. and then it's divvied up. So it's not it's not a, a, say, a council process that we see in Alaska or, or, or a lower 48. It's a process that it's this joint committee that makes these determinations about what the catch is. That's correct, yeah. yeah. So we're outside of the council process. Um, it's an international committee. The assessment goes through a review, um, very similar to our star panel process that we have for the Pacific Council down here. And, um, and then we go to a, a larger three-day meeting with the Joint Management Committee, present all the results, uh, stakeholders are there, the reviewers are there, and the scientists are there to um, state their case. And then the Management Committee is um, tasked with that difficult uh, task of deciding on the TAC for the year. Yeah, Bruce? Yeah, and just one other. So you mentioned the Humboldt squid that came in and are eating all these hake, and that might be screwing your... Yeah. Your estimates up because yeah. there's a there's a is that a um, is that a routine thing that happens and I guess um, halibut I don't see halibut necessarily as a forage fish for a lot of other critters out there, whereas hake uh, basically a forage fish for a whole bunch of other things that's making a bigger impact on your model than maybe it would for us for halibut. Yeah, I I think that's correct. Um, the Humboldt squid is a, a rare event historically. Um, 2009 was the one case where it was they were quite prevalent. They were prevalent in a couple other years around there, but I don't think we've caught a single Humboldt squid this year or even last year. Um, with El Nino, though, um, they tend to, it's believed they tend, the Humboldt squid tend to appear when the warmer conditions come up, so they might be coming into the future, and so who knows what the future is about to hold with in terms of this, but I think with hake, yes, it has potential to be more of a forage fish for many other species than halibut does, and that might be affecting some of these patterns, especially the pattern of overestimating the size of a cohort and then it being downgraded as we get more data. And, and that's a function also of the assumptions we have in our assessment, in that we're assuming a constant natural mortality over time, whereas, say, in 2009, what if natural mortality went from 0.2 to 0.3, then our model might actually explain that, that observation we have. And we've been investigating things like that. Was there another Tim, question? Oh, sorry. Tim Balsiger, Tim. Lynn Pear. Yeah, so <clears throat> the management committee, I forget how you characterized it, gets to make the hard decision or whatever. So what's your ultimate final table that they work as <laughs> your decision table at the end? They, or does the management committee actually look at these charts with all of the variability and say, now we know it should be this many tons. 
Yeah, we, we do provide a decision table very similar to our Pacific uh, Council process where we have uh, various catch levels and we project that into the future. We only do like a one or two year projection for Hake. Um, and, and then we, we discuss a lot of things that the, the stakeholders feel and a lot of um, uncertainty in this. So we've, uh, in the decision tables, we've done things like, um, and Bruce was sort of getting at this point, is what if we don't believe that 2010 cohorts is big? So we just look at the lower tail of it. So we have data that suggests it's big, but we're not going to believe it's as big as it suggests. So let's base management decisions on the lower tail. Um, and then we've been also been trying to use the MSE as a guide into what might be happening in the future and how we might want to be setting catches. Um, but I think Paul has a comment. And since he's on the JMC, he might be better to uh, to fix the mistakes I just made. <laughs> well, uh, the good news, no, no mistakes so far. Huh? Good. <laughs> but, I, you know, just a couple of things on the agreement. I mean, it was signed back in 2003 and was never really um, fully implemented in 2012, as, as Alan has indicated. But um, and it officially, once all the diplomatic notes are exchanged, it was, I think, July 2008 is my recollection of the date. <clears throat> but there was a, a process in place between 2003 and 2012 that pretty much followed the agreement. What happened is it got more formalized with people actually being um, appointed through various processes to, to be representatives on each one of those committees that, uh, that, would, that was shown uh, earlier slides. Um, just a couple of comments too. I mean, what as he said, what started all this partially was the Rain Stewardship Council certification process that said, "Well, what about your rule?" Which is a pretty common question that comes back from the council when they certify. They always ask, "Well, how how well is your decision rule working?" And so there was a requirement to assess that, but it really has evolved since then, um, and starting to look at a lot of the questions that we've been talking about here in the last number of meetings and and uh, in May of this year um, led to developing of some draft management principles and I realized actually I don't have the final copy on my computer but I have them in the presentation. Yeah, okay so he's going to go into those later so I won't go into that now but um, comment just on practice so the we meet as a joint management committee in March and uh, the assessment is presented and there was a very large assessment uh, as far as abundance for Hake uh, based upon the 2010 year class. And it was such a, a large number, there was a lot of uncertainty about, well, and looking at those squid plots that were shown earlier, there was some earlier ones that started out really large and then three or four years later down the road they didn't turn out to be that large. And so does one necessarily need to make a decision that you think it is that big and, um, and set the tack at that level? So um, we didn't. We uh, had a lengthy discussion and ended up, I think, as indicated, around the tails, like a 10% or so sort of tack limit, uh, meaning that, you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to be larger than what we chose. The, the, and it has implications, obviously, that the fish don't get into Canadian waters until they get older, but they also don't get into uh, some of the uh, Washington state waters until they get older as well. And so, you know, part of the agreement that each country gets its share <coughs> is part of the deal. Um, and it always amazed me is that the uh, agreement has uh, two digit points, 26.12, and so, like, I don't know exactly why we negotiated point one two, but that was before uh, my time, but I think it had to do with historical catches actually resulted in 26.12. But going back to the uh, decisions, you know, there was a lot of discussion about do we really think that there is that a level of abundance out there, and uh, the decision by the committee was no, we think we want to see more of that and do another year of assessment to figure out really at least uh, another year to figure out whether we want to fish that much. I mean, there were some other auxiliary reasons, but that was a big driver for making the decision this year, mm -hmm. for setting the tack. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. There were a couple other questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm obviously looking for a bright spot on hell of it here. <laughs> but uh, besides, it looked like your later years in your squid plot there, the more recent years, you know, looked higher than higher than average recruitment, except for your your humble squid year, I guess. Uh, have you overlaid this with uh, uh, with, with PDO? See if there's any correlation. 
Um, we haven't done it formally yet, and that's something that we are in the process of doing. So we're hoping to uh, introduce in, we're, we're a major research um, point that we have for the future of Hake is, is one, the MSE, but also to investigate um, recruitment and how re the process of recruitment and Hake, because we don't believe it's just a random event every year. We believe there's some autocorrelation, that there's uh, relationships with environment. People have in the past, um, and they've shown Hake recruitment different in different regimes, um, you know, with PDO and stuff like that. But we'd never really pin down that relationship enough to use it in the assessment model. And we're trying to figure out better ways, now that we're forecasting with this MSE, we want to understand recruitment a little bit better. So we are working on that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So answer Sorry. Well. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Was there another question? Yeah, Peggy? <clears throat> yeah. Um, oh, where did Paul go? Well, it, um, this huge prediction that is there's so much variability, I was curious to find out what extraordinary steps you took to check your assessment model or um, or the operational model, and so far, Paul said, um, do you know go very precautionary, take the mm -hmm. lower end, but also do a um, survey. So does that mean that there will be a sequential year-to-year -year survey for this short time, or do we wait for the biennial? <clears throat> yeah, that's something the scientists have been arguing for is an is an annual survey, just because it. The, the survey is really what pins down the size of these cohorts for us because we believe it's more standardized, it's not as subject to changing selectivity from year to year, things like that. However, we were unable to to have a survey this year. So, um, and actually the, the survey typically occurs in um, odd numbered years. Yeah, odd numbered years. And we had an, a survey in 2012, which we convinced them to do. The reason we had that survey in 2012 wasn't necessarily for the 2010 cohort, it was for that 2008 cohort. And then it was a good thing that we happened to do that survey in 2012 because we got a little bit more information on that 2010, which was two years old in 2012. So you see, if we would have missed that survey in 2012, we wouldn't have indexed those age two fish, which were the 2010 cohort, and our, our model would have been much more uncertain. And so what we're trying to do with the MSE now is to, um, as a management procedure, so uh, having an annual survey as a management procedure and comparing that to a management procedure that's a biennial survey and make comparisons on how well does management do with those two different management procedures. So that's one of our big questions that we're trying to resolve with this management strategy evaluation. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, thanks. And is the survey done across the range of this population? Yes, it um, it uh, starts in California and it goes down to where it doesn't see Hake and then begins, um, and then it goes up into Alaska and it's it has to go up to where it stops seeing Hake. So, um, Hake are obviously moving during this time. It's a long distance to cover, but we believe it's covering the entire range of Hake and not double counting. Um, I'm just not sure where we are in the presentation. Is it? Is there more to come? Oh yeah, there's a lot more to come. Okay, it's, I can hold my question. It's because my question might get answered. I okay. don't want to jump the gun. Yeah, I, th I think it'd be useful to continue on, and um, a few things have been coming up that I actually have later on. So, um, but feel free to stop. I'm, I'm here for you guys. Um, so the future is highly uncertain, as you can see, and. Um, Given that, that highly uncertain future, the real goal of our management strategy evaluation was to develop performance statistics related to short term, so this immediate next 10 years, or a long term reference period, say from 2033 to 2042. And it was to really characterize the distribution of possible outcomes. It wasn't to try and predict this is what the Hake population is going to look like in 2042. No, it was to characterize things like, okay, there's this probability that under this management procedure and the way you're determining catches, that the Hake population will be below 10% um, of its original biomass. 
or we can characterize things such as the median average catch over a 10-year period way in the future is this. So really, it's a different concept than an assessment trying to forecast into the immediate future and say the Hague population under these catches is going to be at this status. We're really trying to forecast given management procedures, mimic what's going on with our uh, international agreement and the management and the assessment, and say, these are the probabilities in the future. This is what you might see, and these are the risks associated with um, doing things this way. So that's why I said it's not really a forecast. It's really a tool for comparing different strategies. And what we want to do is then minimize or maximize certain performance statistics. Like we want to maximize yield while minimizing uh, the risk of falling to uh, low levels, low stock status. Minimize bad things happening, maximize good things happening. Yes, Steve? It's not a question. It's um, maybe a help clarify some of the equilibrium model stuff okay. that we were showing you earlier. Is Rather than doing all of the huge number of Monte Carlo simulations, what the equilibrium model is trying to do is it's actually trying to give you the peaks of these distributions for a given harvest policy. So I'm not trying to model the distribution of uncertainty, but I'm trying to give you a tool that says here's where the peak of that distribution is going to be, but then it's the uncertainty that's inside the, the assessment model and the simulations that we set up that actually defines the distribution. So the equilibrium model is essentially allowing you to define where the peaks are going to be given a harvest procedure, and then the dynamic model will just be the tool that says here's how long it will take to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, Steve. It's, um, it's seeing your equilibrium models and realizing how much time it would have saved me over the last two years. <laughs> Let's not tell my supervisors they may want some money back. <laughs> um, so after this first year of doing the MSE in this way, uh, we reported things like the stock status, the fishery yield, and then the annual variability in yield. How much was the yield, like the TAC, fluctuating from year to year? So, for example, if we don't have a survey, we don't have much information about the Hake stock, and the yield's probably going to fluctuate a lot. Um, and with an annual survey, we hope that it would um, calm that down a little bit because we'd have better information about where the stock is. We did realize that the operating model was simplistic and was very similar to the estimation model. Um, things like constant selectivity in the fisheries made uh, the fisheries data very informative, so it actually washed out the importance of this survey. So we're, we're working on improving our operating model now. And, and this really was, you know, uh, it made us realize that a management strategy evaluation isn't something you go in and you just quantitatively do real quick. It takes a lot of thought behind the scenes, and um, it's something that I'm really happy to be here seeing how you guys are thinking about this process and Steve's up there defining scenarios and what things can we control, what things can't we control, how much variability are we going to have across these and how are we going to develop models and that's something that us Hake scientists are definitely starting to go down that road. Um, and then finally we reported all of these performance statistics and we realized we had no objectives to measure them against. So we had things like, okay, we have average yield, great. <laughs> what do you want average yield to be, you know? And we didn't know those things, and the stakeholders hadn't really formally thought of those things. So we had to take a step back and start thinking about objectives, start thinking about operating models and scenarios. Um, and so that was after year one. But we were still a gung-ho, so year two we still continued down this road. <laughs> takes me a little while to learn, I guess. Um, but we introduced a little additional complexity into the OM. We started looking at past management behavior, and we started talking to stakeholders and managers a lot more in defining their objectives. Um, this is something new, I think, that Paul um, probably has not seen. I can't remember if I showed it real quick last March or not. But something that, that we've been looking at is um, how have managers actually been behaving over the past decade or so. So what I have plotted here is um, predicted female spawning biomass from the actual assessments that have occurred in the past. So you see there's been some assessments which predicted spawning biomass to be around you know, a half a million metric tons, and then some with a really high spawning biomass. So think of 
you can, it's sort of a proxy for low stock status, high stock status. And then you would think, okay, if it's low, you'd set catch as low. If it's high, you'd set catch as high. This is what the actual TAC was set at, not what the actual catches came out of the fishery, but what the managers actually said, this is the maximum catch that can come out of the water. And if you remember the uh, harvest rate control rule plots I showed earlier, you would think that these lines would be increasing as you have more biomass, you would expect catch to keep increasing with more biomass out in the water. But in reality, the way managers have behaved is they basically put a cap on the catches around 400, 500,000 metric tons. And this 425,000 metric tons is the TAC they set in 2014 with one of the highest biomasses ever predicted by our current spawning biomasses predicted by our assessment model. So there seems to be some precautionary behavior in past management over the last decade or so. And in actuality, the Hake stock has benefited from that. We haven't been, um, you know, we've been a little bit risk adverse and the Hake stock has been doing fine and we've been learning a lot about the variability. So um, we're trying to learn a little bit from our past in this way. But also, we're trying to model into the future to have sort of a status quo management strategy evaluation. We sort of need to mimic management behavior as it's been occurring. So um, actually, before I even started looking at this plot, the stakeholders came up with the suggestion of capping a catch at um, certain values. And in the Hake fishery, they don't want to have a TAC of a million metric tons out there they're going to go out and try and catch it. And they know that they're going to go out and try and catch it. And that's probably not going to be the best thing for their markets or the best thing for the stock. And so if they have these limits in place, they realize um, that this is probably a good thing. So they want us to investigate this. So we looked at some catch caps. Yes, Peggy? I wonder how much um, dark blotched rockfish or other bycatch <laughs> species played in those management and stakeholders thinking. Um, it's you know, I I did not get that feel from them specifically, and I, um, I know that that thought is always in the back of their minds, but I can't speak directly for them. Um, and I'm not and sure, I'm not sure. You know, I can't you know, say I, can't I wasn't say around, around, around. I've only been around, around since about 2009, so I'm not sure how managers actually behaved thinking about bycatch. I knew that the Hake fishermen knew that a, a TAC of a million metric tons would never be caught because of the bycatch limitations. Um, and so, um, but I don't know, they're thinking of limiting the management. You know, some of the stakeholders are definitely like, I don't want any sort of limit to be out there on my potential harvest. Um, and others say, well, this isn't, this is a pretty high limit and we're never going to go over 500,000 metric tons. And the argument comes back that we don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. Maybe we will want to harvest 600, 700,000 metric tons. So. Um, it also shows you that this is an evolving process in itself, but I'm not sure how bycatch is coming in on this. Um, so we introduced things, and this is really the only results that I want to show you, and I'm just showing it you not to show you the specific results, but an example of how we were showing things. So we have a case in this um, column here with unlimited catches. Uh, in this case, in this column, we have catches can only be 500,000 metric tons or less. This one, 375,000 or less. And this one, um, because we we're putting an upper cap, some of the stakeholders suggested a lower limit so that catches are always greater than 180,000 metric tons, but less than 375. And we reported things like the median average depletion in the long term over that 10-year period. And so you can see that limiting catches increases the stock status, so it makes the stock a little bit greater, which also increases the median average catch. So their catch increased by about 17,000 metric tons on average. Um, and then when we had a lower limit also, so catch was always 180 or greater, so they would take um, very high exploitation rates occasionally. You can see stock status was reduced, but the average catch was higher, of course. Um, and then we have things like the average annual variability in catch. So with catch caps, that average annual variability was reduced quite a bit. 
Um, and then we looked at things like probability that the catch was zero. Basically, the fisheries closed when the, catch, when the stock status is below 10% because of that control rule. And so we have things like um, the fisheries never closed because it can't be closed according to the limit, um, but 10% of, of the time it's still being closed. So, Bruce, you had a question. Well, I, I noticed at the top of the chart you've got long term and it's got 2033 to 2042, and mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's the year. Yeah, that, that's and that's years more than now. a full life cycle of these fish into the future. Yeah. How is it that you? What was the logic between using that time frame in this particular example? Well, we wanted so so we have a short term statistic that I'm not showing here, and we're looking at the short term, basically the next 10 years, um, and then we we wanted a long term, which more um, is more like an equilibrium state, like Steve was saying. And so we really wanted to just basically go through two generations of fish, have fishing on two generations of fish to sort of remove any of those effects of that, say, 2010 cohort are bringing in, as well as the fishery responding to that 2010 cohort. So we just felt two generations. Other than that, there's no formal uh, reasoning for deciding on that time frame. Yes? So, Alan, can you help me with that second line, median <clears throat> average depletion? Um, yeah, those are complicated uh, terms. <laughs> well, what I'm curious yeah. about is if we harvest less than 500,000 tons, the median average depletion is less is 42 percent, and we average we ha we harvest a smaller number, median average depletion is higher. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I would get criticized by a few of our reviewers for using the term depletion, and maybe that's where, I don't know if you guys use depletion here. Depletion is probably not what you think it is. <laughs> it's a more of a mining term. <laughs> um, so depletion here is really stock status. So it means the stock is 45% of its unfished value. So a higher value is actually a, a, a higher stock uh, size. So um, it means it's less depleted even though the number's higher? Yeah. <laughs> We're working on changing that terminology. It's so ingrained in fisheries literature, it's not that easy. And then the median average is coming from the long term. Um, it's the average depletion over the 10-year period, and then the median of those 1,000 simulations over the average of that 10-year period. So it's, yeah, we spend a lot of time just trying to explain our statistics in our um, thing. But people are, are understanding it now and getting it. Steve? Can you give me a sense of, to compute all these numbers, how long that takes in computer time? Uh, to, to do, say, this table, to create this table, the simulations um, take, and, and remember, we have, a, uh, the Hake model runs fast. So doing this with a ground fish model is impossible right now. Uh, a ground fish, I mean a rockfish model, because they, they run a lot slower. With the Hake model, I think to create this table took me, so with four different scenarios, and if I ran all four at the exact same time, um, I think it was three days to, do, to, to create this table with a lot of cooperation of a free computer with many processors on it. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> so it's time consuming. And then, of course, I usually make a mistake and have to go do it again. So, <laughs> yeah. not in this one. I've done it many times. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, by hand would yeah. Um, so an another thing that we've really learned from this process so far is that, um, and when defining objectives, some objectives just simply cannot be met. So some stakeholders and managers came to us and said, you know it would be really nice if we had a catch greater than, say, a minimum catch we've had in the past, and depletion or stock status was always greater than this value. So in other words, they wanted to be, you know, have good catches and have a, a high stock status, which is a great goal to have. But that would be this sort of upper right quadrant in these plots. And so what I plotted here is these four scenarios again, you can see catches are capped at 500,000 metric tons in this lower left plot. Um, and you're up in that upper region 34% of the time. And then you might say, wow, with this, um, with this scenario where we never let catches go below 180,000 metric tons no matter what, 
um, we're up in that quadrant 40% of the time. However, look how often we're below 40% um, of unfished biomass, and that's 60% of the time, as opposed to um, whatever that summation is, 50-some percent of the time, 52% of the time. So really, when, when thinking about these objectives, um, you have to think about the objectives carefully and that you cannot um, satisfy two mutually exclusive uh, um, objectives at the same time 100% um, of the time. And so really, we want to think of developing the harvest strategies that are minimizing and maximizing different objectives so that we reduce risk and increase yield, say. Bruce? Alan, just one question. In the upper left-hand corner there, you've got unlimited catch. Can you define that scenario? That means you go fish 24-7 for 365 you, you, days you a year? fish according to that harvest rate. So the managers determine the tack according to the um, harvest rate. So yeah, unlimited catch is probably not the best term. It's still okay. managed um, according to a TAC, but there's no cap on that TAC. Um, so when a million metric tons can be, or the model says you can have a TAC of a million metric tons, the fishermen go out and actually catch a million metric tons in this simulation. Exactly. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. <clears throat> So we're 10 minutes to 12. Um, I'm nearly done the presentation, and I just want to go over a little bit about, um, as Paul mentioned, defining um, objectives. And one great thing that's happened uh, last March was the JMC came up with some uh, management principles that they have defined. And these are these five management principles. Um, they're very general principles, things like you know, utilizing the best available science in a precautionary, sustainable manner. Sure, that's a general principle, but it begins to guide us towards objectives, defining objectives, to maintain a healthy stock, to make sure that both countries are um, able to attain that, uh, what the agreement has given them, for example. Um, and then that management principles, I like principle five because that ensures that I'll have a job in the future, <laughs> and that's that uh, management principles are dynamic and shall be reviewed annually as long as Helen does a good job. And uh, <laughs> so uh, these are some general principles that the JTC then has grasped. And we've tried to um, use these principles in defining further objectives. So we're really trying to get the uh, involve everybody in the process, managers and stakeholders, in defining objectives. And we sent out a document that looks exactly like this with questions like, what is the desired status of the stock? for example, abundance. And then we, we tried to give some metrics, you know, the average stock status, which I've already showed, or the probability that a stock is above or below some value. Um, what's desired age structure? Uh, what's desired availability in each country? And then over on the right, we've noted whether or not we can answer those questions with our current operating model, or whether we have to develop a spatial operating model or a more complex operating model to um, answer those objectives. So the actual objectives and the questions here aren't all that important because they're very Hague specific, but the process this is the process we're going through to help stakeholders and managers and scientists understand what might be important and what objectives might um, come out of this process. And then we did similar things with yield. Um, you know, what is the minimum acceptable TAC? And what is the minimal acceptable TAC in each country? Questions like that. Um, are we think are very important and so what we're trying to do is define an exact objective and a performance metric to go along with that objective which sometimes means we have to define a new operating model. <clears throat> so after two years of work which is basically where I'm at right now our biggest concerns have been availability of fish to each country avoiding a low stock status it's come it's not changing there we go um, and avoiding a low TAC. So we, we want to have a healthy stock, but we also want to have a healthy fishery. And really, after two years, uh, something that I'm realizing is that it's really understanding the purpose of an MSE. And I'm not, I'm not talking here understanding the purpose of an MSE to stakeholders and managers. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this 
that I need to also understand the purpose of an MSE. And I've had a lot of learning and a lot of lessons over the last two years. And I just wanted to go through um, a few of those lessons, which I'll go through a little bit later. Um, so those are our biggest concerns after two years. And I know one question a lot of people ask, has the MSC actually affected management? And I just wanted to put this slide in there real quick. It's not directly affected management. The managers hasn't said, these are the results of the MSC, and therefore I'm going to set a tack based on those results. But it certainly has guided managers to say, yeah, we might want to be a little bit more precautionary this year with the TAC. Or, you know what, we probably can take that much TAC out. Um, and it's, it's really helped people think about these objectives and defining objectives. And it's been a supporting argument for a lower TAC in 2014, as Paul was saying. Um, it was set lower than the model suggested, based on that naive harvest control rule, and it needed to be justified. And the MSE was just one part of many different justifications for that lower TAC. So some of our lessons that we've learned are um, the input from all interested parties are, is very important. Um, divine, defining objectives is also important but can be difficult. And it takes a lot of time to really understand the power and usefulness of an MSE tool. And um, Steve Martell is, is a great person to help with this. He's definitely helped me a lot. I've read the book, Mar uh, Walters Martell, um, which has helped me a lot in understanding this. And in that vein, collaboration is very helpful. So Steve, I hope that we collaborate a little bit more so you can keep teaching me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Another lesson learned, and this is a lesson that I learned, is um, that really I showed you, I went naively into an MSC process, jumped right into the simulation part of this, not realizing that MSC is really a large process of many different uh, facets to it where you, you really, this is a, a plot that Sean Cox has helped me put together, and Sean's another great person um, to help understand MSE. Boy, he just schools me every time I talk to him, which is great. But he, he helped me put together this plot, where you define your goals and objectives, you define your management procedures, you simula simulation test those things, and then you apply the, the management procedure that you think is best, or, or whatever you think is best. And then you go back to finding more goals and objectives. So this is a, a, a process that's ongoing, but also it's a process that within you're backtracking a little bit once you learn a little bit. You might look at these equilibrium models. You learn a little bit from those equilibrium models, redefine some management procedures, go back to simulation test it, maybe put it into a dynamic model, learn a little bit more, maybe you apply something, you learn something from that application, define the goals. So it's a, it's a huge process. It's repeated, and it means I'm going to have a job for the next 20 years. So, <laughs> so this is great. Um, and this, just to show you where, where I was focused on when I first started, was just this one little part of it, the simulation testing. I love to, to code, and I love to run models on computers, so I really got sucked into this, where we had this operating model. And then I would define these management procedures, which a management procedure can consist of surveys, the monitoring, the stock assessment itself is just one part of the management procedure, and the harvest rule is another part of the management procedure. And that all determines the TAC, which is then put back into the operating model. So um, <clears throat> finally, an, an, an important lesson is that MSC is a difficult concept. It was felt when I first introduced it that it would play, replace the assessment. I'm still wondering if that's because people thought I said MS Charlie instead of MS Echo or not. But they weren't sure what it was, um, and they just didn't want it to upset the status quo, at least in the Hake fishery. But now that they are learning more about it, actually stakeholders are coming to me with some great questions that can be answered with the MSE. And, and that, that, was, that was really neat to see for me. Um, Sometimes they want the assessment to do what an MSE is, like forecast 100 years into the future, which isn't what an assessment is really meant to do, in my mind. Um, so we're understanding this. Um, and it's, we've had a lot of uh, lessons learned about understanding what an operating model is. And one thing I learned quickly, and a woman uh, involved with industry up north pointed this out, and she goes, you know, even though you have this operating model, that is not the truth. So don't call it the truth. So, so we try not to call 
the, the operating model the truth, but it's more the simulated population. So that's one lesson that we've learned. Um, and we have not found a good analogy. You guys have been talking about hurricanes. I heard flight simulators. I've heard uh, re uh, retirement funds in the pack, bank analogies. I just have not found a good analogy for a management strategy evaluation that really helps you understand what it is. But really, what I've learned is it's a tool to help you identify management procedures that are robust over a wide range of potential scenarios. And that's sort of the definition that I've been currently using, which will probably be updated on year three. So overall, the conversations in the Hake MSE world are not much different than I've been hearing you guys talk about today and yesterday. And the Hake world is hoping to collaborate more with uh, Halibut people as well as others doing management strategy evaluation, um, collaborating on operating models, analogies, explanations, um, all of these things, and understanding the, the power that an MSE has and what that can do in the future. So with that, I'll show you where my, uh, takes a while for it to change here. So I'll show you where my stance is in terms of uh, salmons for sissies, but I love hake. And, <laughs> and um, it's two minutes to lunch, so I can take any questions or answer questions later, however you like. Yes, Peggy? Any chance you could send us your presentation? Yes, I finished it this morning, so I w would have sent it earlier, but I will have this available for all of you. Yeah, we'll mount this up on the MSAB site for you guys. Uh -huh. Do I have to keep the I Love Hake slide in there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they are. <laughs> I don't know if those are dark blots or not. But <laughs> so thank you, Alan. I, I think this was extremely helpful for sure. us. Uh, if, if nothing else, then to see shared misery, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. In, in the so, of, but it, it is very important for us to sort of get the feeling for um, what struggles you've been through in trying to define things. And in a sense, we look at this and sort of say, okay, are we sort of farther behind the curve on this thing or not? But it, we actually we started actually in different positions uh, in yeah. trying to approach this. So I mean, it's it's been a, a useful uh, exercise to understand that. So yeah, great. So we can come back after lunch with some questions if you want. But let's break for lunch right now, and we'll take uh, say 45 minutes. Does that work? Review. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yes. Yes. Thanks. thanks. Great. So the first thing is. Uh, give you a chance to ask any lingering questions you have of Alan. Alan, again, thank you very much for the presentation. That was really terrific. As I said, we're, it's nice to have shared misery or so. Uh, so if you've got some outstanding questions for Alan, please ask them now. We'll give you about half an hour or so to ask all these questions. <clears throat> okay. Well, just... Uh, Formal thank you from the IPHC for coming over and doing that. Really um, appreciate uh, you sharing the, the lessons and views you went through uh, and, and the process the Pacific Hake fisheries are going through with their management strategy evaluation process. I had one comment, and this is um, not the first time I've heard the term MSE and MSC uh, be confused in a uh, colleague of ours, Doug Butterworth, always referred to, uh, we should be referring to these things as MPEs, as management procedure evaluations, because it's not for any other reason other than it's distinct from MSE, uh, which is the Marine Stewardship Council, uh, and we all know those things. And at one point, I, I made a crack at the MPE thing, and no one knew what I was talking about, so I gave up. Well, th thanks a lot. I Really appreciate being here. Um, it's nice to commiserate with others. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and just to let everybody know, I sent the presentation uh, to Ian and Steve, and I guess they'll get it on to some website somewhere. Um, I also sent a link to our Pacific Whiting Treaty website, which contains a lot of information about the, the treaty process and also has the 2014 stock assessment document on that website with the squid plot. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So thanks um, again. I do have one one question. Uh, one of the big um, issues we have in, in our process is uh, that the different countries and the different regions don't have catch share or a, a sort of fixed 
percentage of the total coastwide TCY or whatever we call it, the TAC, uh, that's something that the treaty brought into play was, was that 23%, 76%, whatever the, the decimal places are. Had that not been in place, two questions, had that not been in place, would you anticipate the process being much more difficult? And two, um, with it in place, do you hear uh, industry talking about, you know, there's times when the fish just don't show up in Canada and they can't catch their allocation. Is there any sort of agreements or negotiations or talking about actually letting the U.S. take that fraction of the harvest? Uh, to answer your first question, um, it would be a much more difficult, I think, um, management process without those proportions in place. There would be a lot more negotiations, but I, from what I heard, I wasn't around here when those negotiations for those proportions went on, but I heard that it was not a fun time for everybody. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> to get into the second question, I believe the agreement states, is it eight years it's up, or ten years it's up for? Well, it, actually, it's, um, there's two uh, clauses in the agreement. One says, you know, here's the share, 26.12, and uh, the difference to the U.S. And uh, there's another clause that says uh, either party can provide notice to terminate this agreement, and uh, if done, it uh, it will expire basically uh, a year hence, uh, at the end of December 31st. So you'd have a uh, a year's notice at, at the minimum, and either party could bring that forward. But otherwise, that share uh, stays in place regardless. It says, you know, I don't actually know, it's not clear why the wording was that it's for 10 years, and then it says, and then thereafter, why it didn't say there forever, <laughs> unless you terminate. I don't know the history of that, but basically the reading is that the, the share is in place unless one party decides that they don't want the agreement anymore. And to answer your question, Steve, um, I do think the percent share did uh, provide some uh, benefits. It took quite a while to negotiate what those share arrangements were based upon some historical catches and some negotiation. Um, and there's a different agreement here in place in the Halibut Commission. But, um, you know, and it's not just that the fish don't sometimes swim in the Canadian waters, but they also, um, as Alan talked about in his presentation, the uh, macaw have a, a usual and a custom place to go fishing, and uh, they don't can't go fishing outside of that, and they've not shown up in those waters either, and so that's also impacted upon their ability to harvest hake. So it's not just a matter of you know Canada not getting its part of it, macaw has also not been able to, and it, <laughs> there's not been any discussion of if one party doesn't get it to transfer it to the other, maybe that would happen, but it has not so far. But I think within the U.S. there has been some discussion around whether the uh, the share in the macaw goes elsewhere or not, but um, the, they could do that probably maybe somewhat easier. But, um, you know, I do think um, the MSE process uh, in Hake has really evolved, as Alan clearly showed over the two years from when it started. It really, as I said earlier, I think it's kind of started to deal with the Marine Stewardship Council situation and uh, it really has evolved into thinking about um, much further down the road and one of the principles that uh, Alan had on a slide talked about you know think um, making ensuring that each party gets its share that's agreed is one of the principles uh, one of the four principles okay. so how that's going to get <clears throat> you know tested out and thinking about how that could happen? Well, you know, 2010, it was identified that really large abundance, well, how big of abundance that is, um, and you fish it differently to it, because as Alan also talked about, the previous large recruitment kept the fishery going for 10 years, and we're still fishing some of those. So maybe you, maybe there's some differences in the one way one fishes earlier um, to ensure that both parties get what's uh, agreed upon. Yeah, I think Paul summed it up nicely. Um, and just to, add, just to reiterate is that we are planning to use the management strategy evaluation as a tool for investigating more of the spatial patterns between U.S. and Canada mm -hmm. and um, investigating those 
I guess, percentage, you know, percentage of availability in each country of the stock given different management procedures. And there is concern of, you know, the U.S. is encountering those younger fish before Canada sees the older fish. So there's these sort of downstream effects that they're concerned about and high harvest rates on young um, cohorts, especially before we know the full right. size of that and have good certainty about the size of those cohorts. Um, so we're, we're going to investigate some of that. And then with the tribal fishery, um, typically 17.5% of the U.S. allocation is um, given to the tribal fishery to fish that year. And if they have not, um, if, if they do not believe they're going to catch that entire amount, there's typically a reallocation. And I say typically in a couple of years there hasn't been a reallocation from the tribal, alloc tribal fleet back to uh, shore based and at sea fleet. So there is some movement within U.S., but I've never seen a movement across borders. <coughs> okay. And one other question regarding the process and how it's changed since the treaty's been in place. I remember Canada used to have carry forward, so if you didn't catch the, the quota last year, you could carry some of it forward next year. Is that still happening? Um, one can still do that, make that, uh, yeah. So is there procedures or protections in place if, if the carry forward happens but next year's assessment shows there was a strong retrospective bias and the quota should have never been that high. Are there procedures in place or do they just still get to have access to what they shouldn't have had in the first place? <laughs> I don't think we've faced that yet uh, as a, something to make a decision around, Steve. But, you know, I do think, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Okay. There's no explicit rule that one would need to do it that I'm aware of at this point. Yeah, I think some of those concepts are being interpreted right now, you know, as we're learning in this treaty process. Right. Like Paul said we've formally formed the committees. Um, there's, we've been operating under the auspices of the treaty for a number of years, and the council's been making a lot of decisions here in the U.S., but now at the JMC there is some learning, and we've been fortunate that we haven't faced a lot of really difficult questions thus far, but um, it, there's still some interpretation of the agreement and to, to be had, and, and we're still getting a few kinks out. And then uh, this is, I think, more for the, our, our whole MSAB board. <clears throat> um, fundamentally, there's two very different things going on in our process, and it has nothing to do with the differences in the processes per se. It has to do with the trends in the current stocks. Hate is sort of on an upswing and it's pretty happy go lucky there seems to be a lot of fish and a lot less uh, issues surrounding the directed fisheries whereas halibut is, is trending in a, in a different direction and now uh, the issues outside the directed fishery are much more um, what's the word heightened <laughs> yeah to say the least so I, I would just highlight that for the the whole MSAB board is that uh, we're sort of more looking at the crunch time, whereas I think their process is really uh, yeah, not I think so that, critical. Yeah, I, we're, we're pretty fortunate in the position we're in with Hake, where, where things look like they're, they're going up, and we're still acting precautionary and, and learning a lot of lessons right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a great time to be learning these lessons, and we're, yeah. we're very fortunate about that. Um, yeah. But we still have our challenges, um, availability in Canada of fish, and making sure that we're not over harvesting those young year classes before we know how big they are and right. before they have a chance to get to Canada. So those are things we're working on. Cool. Any other questions for Alan? Yeah, it's Bruce Gabriel. At, at lunch, I had an opportunity <laughs> to talk to Alan. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you, are you concerned? Tom, <laughs> Tom Marking, are you concerned about areas of uh, local depletion, or do they, these things move around enough migration back and forth to kind of resupply themselves? Well, they, they, they move around enough. I think we're not worried about local depletion, and I'm not including any Puget Sound or Georgia Strait hake stocks in this. We're just talking the outer coast of hake stock. Um, so we're not concerned about local depletion. We are more concerned about depletion of different cohorts. Um, so when we're talking about the availability in Canada, because, um, what was it, two years ago, 
the Canadian fishery encountered basically 99% of the fish they caught were all age four and older, whereas I think 80 some percent of the fish the U.S. fishery caught might have been age twos and threes. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're allowing enough fish to remain in the water so that Canada has their negotiated share available to them um, in Canada. So it's not it's it's not a localized depletion, but it's more like an annual ability for fish to migrate to different areas. Alan, just to expand that a little bit, do you <clears throat> contemplate at all sort of cohort-specific fishing mortality rates? If we could. <laughs> we don't have the luxury in a trawl fishery to incorporate size limits and things like that. So, But we, we might be able to, I, I mean, this is way in the future, and this is me just thinking off the cuff here, but, you know, maybe there's area-specific um, harvest rates or something like that that does sort of get at that. I, I don't know, but that's that's things for us to test in the MSE and to to present to stakeholders and managers and let them make the decisions about what they feel would be best. Bruce? Bruce? Bruce, Bruce. <clears throat> Is it really my turn? Your turn. Yeah, it's your turn now. <laughs> well, and, and I apologize for that, Tom. Um, uh, it was interesting. At lunchtime, I had a chance to talk to Alan, but he's saying, well, maybe we should incorporate some economic um, performance statistics, performance or, statistics yeah. in their, into their process, and I was somewhat surprised uh, that the reason why we manage these fisheries and why we're spending millions of dollars to do this is because there's economic value there. And my response to that is that, you know, I don't see how you can't have a process that's not targeted towards some form of maximizing the economic slash social value of that resource. So um, I think that's was one of the things that were incorporated. We're talking about stability of the fisheries and things like that, which are very important. And I just wanted to comment that uh, I was surprised. And you think there, there aren't any economic indicators, if you will, in the hake fishery. I would submit to you that there probably is underlying economic indicators that are driving your other ones, mm -hmm. though. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good comment, Bruce, and um, you're right. I think when people look at yield, they're automatically in crunching the numbers, thinking of the economics in, involved with that. But um, to just tell you a little story, my experience with the process is in December, at a December, was it? No, it might have been at a January meeting for Hake when we're presenting MSE stuff and talking about objectives and the, the JTC, the scientific committee, um, brought up like, you know, it would be great to have maybe some economics in here. Maybe we work with some economists and come up with some economic indicators, performance statistics, and one comment from stakeholders was we don't believe economists. And they're all schooled. They've never managed a business. Leave the economics up to, up to us. And I mean, that's almost a direct quote. And so we're like, okay, then we're not going to deal with economics. At the review meeting a month later, that same person came up, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea to introduce some economics into this? So it's just, it's just showing me that the process is a, is a learning process. It's understanding what, what's going into these things and what can come out of these things. And so that's why, you know, I might have rushed into this into the modeling of it, but I, I should have, I'm taking a step back now and talking more with people and helping them understand the benefit that this tool has to them. I think that, you know, just to encapsulate, Alan, some of our discussions on economics is initially I think we, we went down the same route and sort of said maybe we should have some, some econo economics in this thing, and it was then argued that, well, is the yield a proxy for the economic right. thing? But what that doesn't cover is the cost of operation, which Steve's trying to cover in terms of the efficiency of the, the yeah. economic efficiency of the fleet, because it doesn't capture the input side of it, it's just capturing the output side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that, the, those concepts that I've been learning about in the last couple of days, is this efficiency and, and how hard do you have to fish to get the same yield. Sure, yield, you might get that yield, but it's going to be a lot harder to catch it. <clears throat> Bruce? And just one final comment about economics, uh, which is, uh, I think this has been a U.S. experience, and I know for certainly it's an Alaskan experience with the different fisheries and the different gear types. If you're going to go down the path about saying what's the most efficient way of harvesting a resource to minimize bycatch and all that, if, um, uh, use an example, like in the black cod, if you have long liners and you have pot fishermen, 
if the determination of the economic basis is that we should all turn into pot fishermen, the longliners don't think that's economically very viable at all. Right. Uh, and it's the same way with saners and gill netters and everything else. So I think there's a recognition that uh, there is an interest in, pre in preserving the mix of harvesters as they were when the discussion started. Now, I'm not defending that that's a good approach or not, uh, not a good approach, but uh, if you go down that path, if you have a divergent, if, if you're all draggers, then I guess it doesn't matter. But, um, but that, I think that's one of the, the U.S. history there is that there was some uh, recognition that you're going to keep an approximately same gear type split, and that skewed some of the economics of it. Can I ask uh, Chris or um, if you would just encapsulate the basis of that decision when they went to integrated management, when you had the, the multiple license structure, and what were the sort of guiding principles that they took into that discussion? There was, <clears throat> there were, um, DFO set five objectives for the fisheries, and um, that kind of said, look, this is how we're going to manage the fisheries starting in this year. And it was mainly directed towards rockfish, and the industry leaders looked at that and said, oh my God, this will shut us down, is basically what people concluded. So um, there's, I think, seven ground fish fleets. Everyone assigned two representatives and an alternate, and they locked themselves in the room for about two years, three years. And then after about year two, Stockholm Syndrome set in. And um, no, and in fairness, I mean, those guys put a lot of work in, uh, a, a lot of time, and, and that's how it was, it was developed. It was around how are we going to be able to meet this and keep, and keep fishing. And I'm trying to recall the exact wording of it, but it was, this, I mean, you know, all rockfish mortalities will be accounted for. It was the one that twigged a lot of people say, oh, hold it. And, and you know, there will be the monitoring regimes would, monitoring, fisheries monitoring regimes would be implemented to be able to uh, account for rockfish mortality. So that, of course, led everyone, it started out with the rockfish discussion, but then the rockfish guys looked at it and said, well, yeah, we've got the rockfish, you guys want the rockfish, and the trading began. <laughs> I think one of the points I was that struck me about that was one of the one of the initial guiding principles, if I'm not mistaken, was that there would be no development of new fisheries as a result of integration, which which was sort of the the uh, the baseline saying that everybody has a right to exist the way you are right now. The the fisheries may evolve, but there would be no new fisheries developed on that. Is that right? Uh, yeah, what it was basically that there was sort of DFO set those um, um, guidelines, objectives, or guiding principles, and then the industry themselves agreed to some principles. And one of them was um, that you know it was within the within the fleets you would still be targeting on your species. You know, if you wanted to target black cod, you had to have a black cod license. If you wanted to target halibut, um, but also that uh, each sector would only get an allocation of species they'd been permitted, an initial allocation of species they'd been permitted to catch. So it drew that distinction, and then, like I say, then the horse trading began. Uh, Chris Spohr, um, I just, I'm just trying to, could you go back to the slide where you put up the principles, or the, the new principles, or the... Um, yeah. Five management principles. Yeah. When did those come into into play? Control right now. Oh, okay. Or you could just back it up to. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, my my question is coming around to, those came into play fairly recently, or were were cause, just cause, last March? Oh, really? Because what I'm struck by is, are are those becoming objectives or could they become objectives because what I'm kind of in in watching this presentation what's struck me is that by having these shares between countries you've moved it out of the area what happens in each area and you're able for at least the first part it was really talking about how the stock and how the style we're going to meet these objectives and then uh, so it almost made it seem it's a little simpler instead of people are looking at now, everyone's looking at the TAC and not trying to say, what does this mean for my area, because I already know what it's going to mean for their area, which is one of the things Dr. Martell commented on for, for this process. 
and then just now that this this one about you know ensuring that uh, all the parties um, number uh, four yeah number four yeah um, you can be able to receive the intended benefits so I mean I, I guess now it allows you to move to another level and use as you said management strategy evaluation to how can we set up the fisheries to meet that I mean is that that's where it's going I just wanted to clarify or is that where it could possibly go that I think is where it could possibly go I mean these management principles are so new and, and these really as I see them are some of them are interpretations of the treaty right and I think that the way I see it is we're still working out some some of our ideas and exactly how we're going to manage the Hake in um, relation to this treaty and I think Paul I don't know if Paul wants to step in on this or not but um, the way I see it is we're, we're still working it out and we're seeing where the direction is going to go. <clears throat> Alan would it be fair to characterize these as sort of uh, qualitative measures of where you're trying to take the process and then part of helping us guide and choose management procedures is we need to have a quantitative uh, performance measures in order to help us evaluate which which procedure would perform better so the the real challenge then is is translating these qualitative things into perf quantitative performance metrics that essentially still achieve the, the underlying management principles yeah that that's right and we found it just helpful we I guess as a scientist we just sort of jumped into trying to have stakeholders and managers give us those quantitative objectives but we really needed to do this in a stepwise process of defining some qualitative overarching principles and um, once and, and actually that wasn't the scientists idea to come up with these it was the JMC's they finally said look why don't we just define these principles and that will be the, the roadway that the start to defining more quantitative objectives so we might even define some qualitative objectives after looking at these principles and then come up with some more specific quantitative objectives which we can then develop performance metrics based on. So, so this is almost like a round two or <clears throat> round three if you will. Is, is well th these principles are probably more like a round one okay. and then we would then go into a round two of maybe some defining more specific objectives. Mm -hmm. But in terms of I'm talking just the whole process you went through I think like you said people have yeah. now sort of said hold it let's do this you know after, after being through this and learning all this this is going to be helpful to take us to the next few steps yeah yeah and and it was something that that personally I didn't see I was jumping over a lot of steps that other people might need to do to actually get to where they really wanted with these objectives um, and and like I said in the start I just jumped into the simulation model put out a bunch of performance metrics and then realized wait a minute I have nothing to judge these against and so now we're backing way up and developing these objectives which then leads to performance metrics and then we have something to judge the results of these simulations against to see if they're going to meet our objectives because that's really the purpose of this what are the objectives of this fishery how would we want to manage this fishery what do people want out of it and how can we best do that so hopefully that helps What we wanted to do was come back to uh, on our agenda of looking at um, what are our, uh, our objectives, what does it actually say in our agenda, <laughs> in terms of looking at the uh, our laundry list of priorities and objectives for the MSE process. So we're looking for some guidance from you folks about what specific things we want to examine. And we do have, we have over a series of previous meetings um, developed some set of objectives and some performance measures and some candidate management procedures and what we'd like to do is revisit those and make sure we have the ones right that you guys want us to look at or how these could be enhanced uh, over the next little while because we now are at a stage where we have uh, a more functional tool that allows us to look at these specifically in terms of the halibut fishery. So Steve do you want to sort of run through the what we have right now and then we'll go perhaps <clears throat> 
these uh, bullet points on the screen, uh, screen were straight out of the meeting minutes from our meeting number three. And basically, we had a, a discussion where we were concerned um, about which management procedures should be investigated, and as well as what performance metrics we should we should think about. And these essentially highlight the procedures that we were discussing at the time. And one was was focusing on uh, total mor total mortality accounting, so accounting for all. Uh, sources of mortality in all areas, including the U-26 fish. Uh, and this is some work that Ian Stewart has done a lot of work within the assessment model, uh, per se. This equilibrium tool that we have up here uh, can be modified. It does account for the U-26 mortality in the model. And you can certainly modify the outputs to include the value of under 26 inch fish uh, in the calculations, as well as the total CEY, et cetera. Um, size limits, again, we've had many conversations about size limits. The, the major theme here is, is trying to reduce the amount of wastage in the directed fishery and, and reduce uh, handling the large number of fish. Bruce Gabris, please. Steve, just had a question on the side limit one. Uh, this, I'm assuming this is uh, from our previous meeting. I don't necessarily recall that we had a discussion of 26 inch limit instead of 32. I thought our discussion was something less than 32, which is, which is only significant uh, from the standpoint that maybe 30 is the right number. Yeah, that's, that's correct, Bruce. I, I think the, the context of that was at, at one point the commission did have a 26 inch size limit and so it was um, relating it back to that previous era and whether or not we could learn anything from that comparison. It was, so if we're going to go forward with that, I think it should be, you know, some a size limit less than 32 versus 26, because there's there might be some that disagree with 26, but maybe we would agree with something different than that. That was phrased a little more broadly, so no size limit or um, current minimum size 26. Uh, any it could be any other combination of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I I think that's something we can talk about here in this meeting. Exactly what. You know what is the goal of the size limit? Again, one of our objective is one of our objectives is to reduce the wastage to 10% of the total mortality. And, and perhaps what you can do in that case is find out what how small do we have to make the size limit to achieve that objective. So there's there's another way you can answer that question as well. So I, none of the numbers in here are hardwired uh, in stone. Uh, and I just didn't want to put X inches and Y inches in the meeting minutes either. So, The harvest strategies is currently we have essentially a 30-20 harvest control rule where we fish at, at our uh, harvest rate in each area uh, when the stock is above 30% of its unfished or B100% level and then all fishing in the directed fishery ceases if the uh, stock status falls below 20 percent on the coastwide estimate. So uh, there's certainly modifications you could make to this rule. The, this rule is a fairly steep ramp in terms of how the exploitation rate changes. Uh, you just saw an example from from Alan on the Pacific Hake rule, which is a 40-10 version of this same rule. So again, and, and from meeting number three, the point was it doesn't have to be 30, 20 per se. It could be let's find the threshold values that meet our objectives. So this number may be 32 and a half or 35 or 40 percent, whatever it is. So the point is you go through and you tune the management procedures to try and achieve the, object, the objectives you set forth, uh, which is I think the Marine Stewardship Council should adopt that as their question and not have you tested your harvest control rule. That's a s silly question. So this is about tuning the procedures, uh, and all these procedures can be tuned to, to achieve the, the objectives we set forth. National shares. Um, first time I heard this word was actually from Professor Cox uh, a number of years ago in doing a review for the Canadian uh, halibut uh, fishery. This was pre-Steve Martel working for IPHC and, and groveling for money on the side of the streets in Canada. Um, 
this is an alternative to apportionment where we actually have a fixed share uh, given to each of the regulatory areas or a fixed share given to each of the countries, however you want to frame it. Um, this is something we had a bit of a discussion on, I think Alan's example today uh, that highlights that it's not easy to go in that road. There were some very difficult conversations that happened when that Hague Treaty was being put together and the, the historical catch history had a lot to, to do with that one. This one's a, a little bit of a different argument, so I didn't even know how you'd go into those negotiations, but in terms of setting that up in an operating model, I can do that. That's easy. Bycatch mitigation. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I never viewed this as sort of a, a financial compensation. I viewed this more as, as how do we reallocate the uh, harvesting of the resources to compensate for, for fisheries that behave efficiently and, and, or make efficient use of the resource relative to fisheries that make inefficient use of the resource. And, and I'm really unclear about what the, the definition of, of how compensation should be. So again, we're looking for, for feedback from the MSAB on, on these issues. Um, sorry, Peggy. Well, I'm playing catch up one more time. This, these uh, bullet points you've got here were um, the result of going through our, this thing, this, this table. Okay. I believe so, yeah. Meeting three is starting to become foggy. <laughs> Jeff, looking at the first bullet point there, that total mortality, I'm just trying to remember, I, I do remember this conversation, but I'm trying to remember what the purpose was for maybe moving in this direction. And I faintly recall um, speaking to Stephen Hare back in the day about this, and it was his assumption that if we ever went that route and you started to direct account for all sources of mortality, from the area in which they were removed, there would basically be no directed fishery in the Bering Sea whatsoever. That's where the bulk of the bycatch is, and, and that there may not be any directed fishery if we went that direction. And yeah, I think the context for that, Jeff, is not not managing necessarily total mortality, but we wanted to at least put forward a framework for uh, mortality accounting, because right now we have two different ways of accounting for bycatch, one within the harvest policy and one within the, the catch tables, if you will. And maybe, Ian, you could just uh, summarize that. Yeah, the summary is the hard part. <laughs> it's about an hour long. Um, yeah, I think the, the the comments that you're referring to would be relevant if you just blanket said, well, we're going to keep the same general harvest policy, but we're just going to include all the fish in it. And that wouldn't really be consistent with our understanding of how those fish contribute to productivity across the stock. So, for example, in the Bering Sea, probably a pretty large fraction of the juvenile production from the halibut stock, an unknown fraction, but pretty large, occurs in the Bering Sea. But that those fish, we know from tagging, then disperse and contribute to catch across all areas. So if you just assumed that uh, we were going to distribute the, the juvenile removals in proportion to the adult removals, you'd have a big problem immediately in the Bering Sea. But if you distribute them in proportion to the juvenile abundance, right. you might be in great shape. The problem is we don't have a good metric for juvenile abundance. And this has been kind of the showstopper on this one in terms of actually having say floating PSC caps or, or some kind of direct management where you have an abundance index of juveniles and you link the harvest of that. We just don't have that index um, across, across the whole range of the stock. So as Bruce mentioned, what we've done is, as a first step, we've looked at ways to account for those fish. And without changing the assumption that they're going to be contributing to productivity across the whole stock, we, we have actually put together this year for our commissioners at the, the September work meeting a framework for accounting for all sizes of mortality where we can actually see the trade-offs between catch of juveniles in any particular area and the resulting fishery yields in all the areas. Um, so we've, we've made some progress on that and we'll be presenting, there'll be a document in this year's RARA and, and certainly more discussion on that as we move along. <laughs> any other questions? Um, again, these are, are pretty uh, 
broad procedures and I think what really helps us in this process is that we do have this initial set of, of uh, objectives and performance measures that we can go through and try and, and address these issues. I'm sure as we visit these, these things one at a time, some are certainly going to be much more difficult to resolve, i.e. The, the first one and, and the last one, but some of them may be a lot more tractable, uh, both in, in implementing and also in digesting and understanding. Uh, the size limit one is, is a pretty uh, obvious effect. Dan, then go ahead. Scott. Um, I, I think it would also be helpful to include a description of what would be required to implement them um, and any other factors or considerations that are important to the stakeholders or the commission. So looking at the second one in, in particular, um, if the commission wanted to lower the size limit to 26 inches, then you'd want to be able to um, make sure that it was being enforced and that it, there weren't unintended consequences. So you'd, therefore you'd need to have data collected in the fishery to show that people really were retaining fish down to 26 inches as well as um, enforcement of that. So those are actions outside of the commission process. And then, you know, something, the harvest strategies might might be more straightforward. That's something maybe more specifically related to the commission, but um, I'll just leave it at that. I think there are probably other things so, to consider for each of those. Just to, to paraphrase, um, you wanted to know with each of these points what would actually be required to, to implement them, not from a computing side, but what data would you need to collect to make sure that the, that you were, the change in policy was being conducted in the way in which we intended it to be conducted. I see. And then um, actions outside the commission process. I, I guess I'm not clear on. So maybe this is getting too far down the the road at this at this point, um, but you, you want to test it, mm -hmm. so you want to know what information you need to to be able to okay. to make sure it's it's being um, followed properly. But if it, it were actually implemented, then. Um, enforcement of that lower limit would be by the Coast Guard in the U.S. or other enforcement officers as is currently done or dockside um, or what you know how is it enforced so that you know that um, fishermen are just targeting higher um, bigger fish because that's where the price is. The price the value is. Um, so you need to I mean, yeah. And that doesn't affect whether or not you want to test it or not. I just think it's important to know up front what are the the considerations for actually implementing it. So an example would be the objective of reducing the size limit is, is to reduce wastage. But but if you don't if you fail to go out and actually monitor what's going on in the fisheries, then there's no way to really test whether you implemented that policy change. Okay. Uh, no, Scott or Michelle? I don't think at this point I'm really advocating uh, national shares, but if we were going to have that discussion and go in that direction, I just want to make it clear that the Washington Treaty Tribes would also require a share. Michelle? Thanks. Um, so I guess just to follow up on uh, Dan's uh, comment. Um, so, so my understanding of, uh, my interpretation of, of what he said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is basically for each of these management procedures, you're wanting to know how do we get there from here. So what are the different steps and what are the different management entities that would have to take specific actions in order to implement so that we would have some measurable outcome and could go back and see whether or not 
the objective was achieved. So for each of these things, there may be multiple jurisdictions or management entities that we would be relying on to take some action. And you just want to note what all of those different steps are, maybe gets more to the complexity involved in implementation. Yes, that's correct. I think the, uh, and I, you alluded to this, Dan, is that in, in a sense that's kind of the second stage of things. One of the first things in testing is to satisfy the objectives. Okay, yes, it does or no, it doesn't. If it does, okay, what's involved in an implementation? So maybe it's a two-stage process. Yeah. It is, but I still think it's a good idea to have some sense up front of, of what would be required. I, I'm not asking for an analysis. It's just identifying in some bullet points about who might be required to take what action. I don't think that's too difficult. Just a uh, quick way, yeah, and we're well in line with what Dan was saying. For example, like the bycatch mitigation one, I'm still not sure what that even means. If, if it's not monetary, then what is it? And so there obviously have to be some clarification on those things so I know what it is we're, we're trying to capture there. Paul, do you? Thank you. Yeah, well, I guess um, maybe there's two thoughts captured in that one. One around the, the compensation piece would be, okay, taking the responsibility for uh, or accountability for the bycatch in a particular area, how that, however that may be defined. And it was probably along the lines that uh, Chris was talking about in the groundfish experiment uh, that we integrated these various fleets in Canada. And so... Um, there was quite a bit of discussion around bycatch, and so you have a targeted catch, and then needed to catch some rockfish to go with along with that. So that's one side of it, I guess. Uh, and the other around uh, the mitigation side is well, what co efforts? And this is not really, I suppose, part of the procedure, Bruce. But uh, what efforts can one undertake to reduce um, bycatch so you don't really face that same magnitude of problem, which was uh, the issue that Jim raised this morning. Michelle? Thanks. So um, I guess just a, another a thing to consider in the management procedures, um, I, trying to get a sense of the uh, what's the bang for the buck, if you will, for each of these different procedures. And so what, what are the uh, potential benefits that could be realized. And I guess this kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier this morning. What effect do these procedures have and, and how are those differences, uh, how do they affect different sectors uh, in different areas and but also what are, what are the benefits. And so if, I guess as a, as a follow-up to uh, Dan's comment as well, if we want to look at the, the complexity involved, what's, what's the, the return uh, that we can expect in exchange for that complexity? Part of that answer, uh, or part of that we already try to capture within our, our quantitative performance metrics in terms of, of measuring what's the bang for your buck if, if you want to use that phrase but the idea of, of having these performance metrics and these objectives is is that they all sort of have negative relationships between each other you can't have a big stock and a big fishery Alan very eloquently showed us uh, that metric so it's it's you know trying to identify the trade-offs year I think mentioning more small-scale regional measures, so for example in Area 2A if you're going to have um, changes in policy coast-wide, then, then what would it cost to implement that policy from a monitoring agency perspective? What would, if I get to Dan's point, what would, what would the agencies have to do different in, in monitoring their things? Um, and that's, that's one of the challenges with, I think, this MSC process in comparison to, say, the Pacific Hake or the Sable Fish is this is a multi-agency problem. 
uh, multi jurisdictions and, and countries and First Nations and, and all sorts of things. So um, that's really out of my area of expertise, uh, but I'm happy to sit down and work with the people uh, that can help come up with those measures and do that, but it's it's just asking a hell of a lot for one person to do. So that's my comment on that. I don't know how the board feels about trying to winnow in on those small scale details, but right now we don't really have the tools uh, yeah. to do that in the small scale. So what other? Um, sorry, Rachel, do you have something? Yeah, I just have a. Well, a question about the last two bullets, and I have to apologize, I wasn't here in May when those were developed, and I think I understand what they're describing, but I guess my question is, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, reading the notes from May, and, and sort of the suggestion that the board should look at some coastwide management procedures versus the area specific, so I'm wondering how exactly would you investigate with the the tools that are available right now. I'm seeing areas, you know, in those last two. And excuse me, the national shares one um, is a whole lot easier than trying to do anything on an area specific thing because that's just a, it's a division and it's Alan was sort of like the framework they use for that for Pacific Cape. In terms of the other ones like um, bycatch mitigation and so forth, that that is going to depend quite a bit on our ability to, to do spatial uh, effects uh, with, with the operating model, and we're not there yet, uh, but that's, that's certainly the long-term goal is to have some spatial structure to the operating model so you can at least investigate those sorts of things. But this was a wish list, if you will, coming out of the, the meeting three. Mm -hmm. That helped at all. <laughs> um. Just one more answer to Rachel's thing in the spirit of collaboration. Uh, I think this table that Alan assembled for the Pacific Hake thing where they had specific questions like we're hearing around the room right now, and, and then the, the metrics and whether or not the current, I would change current and operating model to coast-wide operating model versus a, a spatial operating model. I think it would be useful for this group to actually go through and, and do this, and, and this is probably one of the, the things we'll work on immediately after this meeting is just assembling this this table and, and going through each of the metrics. But I think the key part from here on in this afternoon is sort of focusing on the, the questions uh, in this table and, and let's articulate the questions, let's rank them, and, and then we can go through and ask whether or not it's feasible to uh, develop them with the coastwide model or whether we need something more specific if that makes sense. I, say, I think that's a great suggestion and as Alan was doing his presentation that was my thought. You said something about the questions being specific to Hake and I thought no actually these could be really helpful. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, I so I, sorry, if I could just say real quick, um, I have to credit Sean Cox and Nathan Taylor for also helping a lot with the design of this table. So just going further to the, well, you know, if you look on the your shiny tool and you have the scenarios, and a lot of the, and going back to our table that was just up there with the management procedures, so those management procedures cover off a number of those scenarios, but the one that doesn't, and I don't know exactly how to scenario or management procedure, when you talk about you know, discard mortality, right, you talk about needs of research, but how does that fit in? Because we talked about a lot today, and I think we've talked about it yesterday, about potential implications of that to harvest policy on whether it's growth or whether it's just changes you know, differential mortality. So where, where would that fit if we're talking about objectives and um, management procedures, we're, we're, how would you frame that one? Frame the discard mortality rate? I mean, where would it fit? We Scenario, and, they, and, and if you look at these other scenarios, they're actually part of the management procedures, kind of cover them off, you know, looking at bycatch and uh, threshold lifting plates, minimum size, 
those type of things. They're, they're in there. But the other one we talked the most today is, isn't, or I don't see it. And how would you actually put a management procedure for something that you, do you still need research for it? I, mean, I guess I'm trying to hear where we go with it. With Bruce, I'm sure, can help here. My interpretation of the, I guess, your question, Jim, is that um, we're sort of want to know how sensitive are the, the procedures and the performance measures to alternative hypotheses about discard mortality rates. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah, the way you would implement that is no different than, say, a sensitivity analysis, and you can find out exactly how sensitive uh, the discard mortality rates is. I can share one um, prediction, and that's this, as you either change the selectivity of the fishery to catch bigger fish or, or reduce the size limit to just reduce the discard mortality, sorry, the discards, the discard mortality rate will become less and less sensitive uh, to the overall problem because you just, uh, to, it's not discards if you keep them. For the, that's for the directed fisheries. If it's for the other fisheries, and to give an example on that, Jim, um, how that gets translated into a managed procedure are things that the, the council may be looking at for things like deck sorting uh, on, on trawl and so forth. So that's a management procedure that can be used in there, not necessarily under the control, and it gets back to Dan's point about what agencies are responsible for what. But that's the translation into a management procedure for that. Yeah, one thing that I've, I've really piqued my interest in the last two days is the idea of reducing the amount of handling of fish that are not being retained, and which would go to uh, the mortality rate, trying to lower the mortality rate. And the other is trying to make uh, the fishing fleet more efficient and expending less money in gas and fuel and bait and everything else to bring in the same amount or not, if more, fish every year. So I'm trying to think of some kind of a management procedure where we could evaluate the, uh, the efficiency of the fleet and evaluate exactly how much excess handling of fish is going on and how could we reduce that and what benefit that would have to the, to the stock and to the economic value for the fishermen. Okay. Your Santa's list is growing larger. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I think it, it's possible, but I think what, again, what comes out of it is, is there's no, everyone's sort of looking for the Pareto frontier where there's this optimum choice, and, and I think the, the trade-offs actually go the other way. They're, they're concave, so it's either all or nothing for, for one or two variables, and, and it comes down to uh, you know, this process is really trying to map that trade-off so you can see, okay, if I make this choice, here's where I am on that trade-off. And hopefully this is, is the way we can go forward in, in which to help our decision-making process or formalize our decision-making process that we we have an agreement with the trawl industry uh, and, and we're going to have a floating PSC type cap or something like that and, and here's the agreement we got to. Somewhere but between now and then we either have to show that A, we can clearly map out those trade-offs and what the potential costs and benefits are to each fleet and then someone has to have a hard conversation to initially set up those things much like in the Pacific Hake case where, where you, know, you can sit back and catch Big Hake in Canada as long as the U.S. fleet doesn't touch them, or you can have lots of little hake, and Canada has nothing. So that hard negotiation has to happen somewhere, and, and I don't think it's in this room. Uh, but we're certainly, I'm certainly willing to to be engaged and, and provide the tools to map out the trade-off. But I'm not going to be involved in the, the politics. I'll let Jim do that. So just a, a comment on this, and as Stephen, I haven't really talked about this, but one of the things that would be, I think, helpful. Um, in the shiny type tool is is to have the relationship to the objectives yeah. hardwired into this so that when you go through a, an evaluation that you're doing yourselves on the, on the shiny tool and you say, okay, I do this and this, 
how does it relate to the objectives that we have for this thing, and does this plus or minus? It could be a sort of a simple red light, green light type thing, but that might be helpful in terms of uh, embedding the evaluation process with people's looking at. And Gary Robinson. GR. GR, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, um, going back to that um, one item there, was it bullet four or, yeah, uh, regarding the um, size limit. I remember the first time the someone proposed uh, reducing the size limit, seeing as the fish are smaller than they used to be. Um, is it bullet four, bullet three, I guess? No, bullet two on that board, yeah. Um, when that was first proposed, uh, it, I remember that uh, um, the idea was not to uh, create more e-bio such that quotas would increase, but rather to harvest those, those smaller fish down a couple inches shorter, maybe to 30, uh, such that more uh, larger and female fish survived. And uh, in your tool there, Steve, when you when you when you plug in a 30-inch size limit, the um, directed fishery yield goes up. But the the proposal originally was not to get more quota; was was rather to shift the size of fish we were harvesting. So I guess what would you need another slider there to um, uh, adjust the harvest rate at the same time, such that those curves are the same height. Well, the the x-axis there on is the harvest rate. So if you want to, beg my pardon while I stand up at the screen. So I mean, the the, the top curve is higher. The the yield is higher on the on the thirty inch size limit. That's correct. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, change the size limit but yet have the yield the same, you'd then have to de decrease the harvest rate. I assume there's some kind of Equilibrium harvest rate in here. This yeah, is. So if, if this is the maximum yield you get at a 32 inch size limit, okay? Yeah. Let's call it 35 million pounds. And, and we have to achieve that at a harvest rate of about 28% in this model. Yeah. If you want to get the same yield by reducing the size limit from 32 inches to 30 inches, then what do you do is you take this curve and move in this direction until you hit the the blue line. Okay, so that go back down, and now you're looking at it producing the, the harvest rate from 28 percent to about 15 percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's. Yeah, I just wanted to point out though that the you know the the proposal wasn't to try and get more quota from this uh, you know yeah, reducing no, the yeah. size limit. It was that, just to that last little bit of fish actually cost you quite a bit of gas and, and bait to catch it when you have a 32 inch size limit because you're turning over a lot more fish to get to those 32 inch fish yeah. whereas if you reduce that you get to keep a higher fraction of the fish you're currently catching. And that, that addresses thing I think Scott mentioned down there that you know bait and fuel is an, is an, is an issue for us and yeah. length of trip. Thanks Gary. Bruce Gabbers. Yeah I, I get a so something that's uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, the length of fish, and according to what you have up there, Steve, it's showing that we're going to actually uh, improve if we go smaller. But I pretty much remember it from the North Pacific Council for another purpose. You know, they were talking at the North Pacific Council meeting about reducing the the length of fish that we could harvest, and that analysis that was done by the council. I don't know how much involvement the IPHC had with that. They said. If you harvest these fish younger at a smaller size, every one you harvest is actually going to reduce the overall yield of the biomass by like a pound. For every pound you harvest, you reduce the yield by about a pound and a half or something. Dan, you might remember the specific number, but so how do, how do we how do we have two different stories here? Is there two different things that they're talking about? Well, there's four different Steves here, so that might be. <laughs> Oh, do you, I'm not sure I know what you're talking about, Bruce. It, w it would have been a, a, a commission analysis because the council staff 
don't try to do any of that, but I'll but rely on commission staff to do that. But I, I I'm not sure which. What I, you're I think there might be two different. You might be looking at the difference between bycatch control as opposed to directed fishery. I, I think there might be two different things there in your mind. Well, I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. But but I thought their analysis said that if you reduce the size limit, that you're going to actually reduce the biomass of that fish by for every pound you take younger you do lose it by a pound and a half so I, I won't I guess we need to move on if that's not something that makes sense. Uh, Bruce what I was going to say is I remember council uh, I don't know if it's a document or, or paper or whatever but I do remember the one to one and a half I thought that was Bering Sea bycatch and that was because if you take a you know 400 gram halibut out of the system you you every pound you take out. And I think that's how they do, how, they, how, how the bycatch is accounted for in the Bering Sea. It's not pound for pound. There's a certain uh, uh, ratio that's applied. I believe that's right, that, uh, that accounts for that lost yield. Or, or maybe you guys do it when you account for it. Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of different concepts getting mixed up here. Well, one is, one is what are the effect of bycatch. The other is accounting for bycatch mortality. The bycatch mortality is is it is what it is as in, in terms of what information we have for apply for this thing. The impact of it is a separate issue. But I guess Bruce, at least as a harvester in the Bering Sea, I'm not worried about bycatch. I'm always worried about bycatch mortality because that's what drives your fishery. I mean, if you've got a, a ground fish fishery, and we don't participate really in the in the big how the bycatch ground fish fisheries, but um, but if you've got one. The, the, the peacod fishery is driven by your halibut bycatch. And we, of course, we monitor bycatch, but what we're really focused on is that mortality rate because that's what will shut us down. So you're right, but I think what Bruce had heard was just that, and it wasn't with the peacod fishery because you're catching bigger fish, but it was with the elephant sole fishery where you tend to get, or the other flatfish fishery where you, you tend to catch much smaller, and there was a yield ratio of some sort that, that I remember was was applied. Well, I, I guess I'm just uh, <laughs> I guess I, man, I shouldn't have brought that up. But so, I, well, anyway, I'll get that offline and go find out what that was because it, the inconsistency was there. If you take the fish smaller, then it reduced the overall biomass. And this is saying that probably the opposite. Some this would lend itself from the modeling you've done, Steve. That it says that we could probably go to a smaller fish, and it would be a good thing. Yeah, I, there really are two different things involved here. One is one is bycatch mortality. The other is directed fishery size limit, and they're 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 very different things. What you're talking about in the Bering Sea is, as John said, it's the impact. But the mortality itself is it is what it is, and it's put into the assessment every year as according to how much mortality there's been there. But there isn't any kind of scalar put on, on mortality for for yield effects. That's a separate issue, and that's involved with harvest policy and so forth. You know, Jim, did you have a comment? I guess it's more of a question. I'm not sure I'm intelligent enough to be able to ascertain out of this, this shiny tool when I've gotten a little too greedy and I've pushed the size of the fish down so small that I've reached the point of diminishing returns. If, if I study this long enough, will it tell me when I've reached that point that I've gone too far, that I'm affecting the biology of the stock by taking too many small fish? I just haven't studied it long enough to understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's exactly uh, what can happen. Like we, we do have these uh, spawning biomass thresholds and spawning biomass targets that we're trying to achieve through our harvest policy. And that's something on the interface you can change, but right now those two numbers are 30% and 20%. So the depletion level here in this top table uh, shows you if you were to fish at MSY, you would reduce the stock to 25%. But if you were to then fish at the spawning stock biomass threshold of 30%, you would reduce the fishing mortality rate from 28% to 23% to achieve that objective. So you can go to that point where you, you can see that there's diminishing returns. Um, 
and the easiest way to do it is, is to show just looking at this plot here. If you look at the top of the blue curve at 30 inch size limits, as you go smaller, it's going to get bigger. And then as you take away all of the size limits, it'll get even bigger. But that assumes that the fishery hasn't changed its selectivity. So if the fishery decides, well, we can catch everything now, and they start catching little ping pong paddles, then you see you get to a point where you can really push the stock. You still catch a lot of yield. Unfortunately, they're small fish, not worth very much money. Um, but the tipping point or the sensitivity of the stock to variations in, in F, or not knowing the fishing mortality rate, is defined by how tight that curve is. Um, it's the, it's if I can, this is where, by having a link to the objectives in this thing, it might come back and say, okay, no, you didn't, you didn't achieve that objective because if, if our percentage of the time you have to be there is such and such, then no, that was a fail on that objective. That might help in this process. Yeah. Scott, withdraw. <laughs> it might be time to sort of step back for a second and, and just recap of why Steve developed this tool and what, what he was intending it for because we're starting to get some really good questions which are things like, well, what if I change the size limit and I change the harvest rate? You know, could I start to maximize there? And, and, and Tom's question really and, and Steve's answer gets at, well, how robust is this policy? Because in one case you get the same yield but if you're off by 10% on the harvest rate, you still get the same yield. In the other case, you get the yield, but if you're off by 10% on the harvest rate, the stock's basically extinct. So you've, you've lost all that buffer. And that's, that's actually exactly what happens as you reduce the size limit. You've reduced the buffer on your uncertainty because if you're off just a little bit, there's no, there's no buffer there. Those fish are being caught 10 years before they're, they're reaching spawning biomass. And so I think it's worth just backing up a step to say, this, I, and I think if I paraphrase this wrong, hopefully Steve will correct me here, but Steve developed this tool to help identify promising procedures. It doesn't necessarily say this, this procedure is going to succeed and be one that we want, but it's, 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 it's a quick way to screen out ones that don't work and to identify which variables we might want to consider as we're moving forward and looking at more detailed procedures. And then when you start to identify some candidates, like, oh, yeah, maybe there's something to look at here with size limits, then we need to go to a dynamic model where we look at changes in size and changes in, in recruitment over time, and that's going to get into how robust is this policy because when we introduce, say, uncertainty created by our estimate of current stock size from the, the data and from the assessment, and we're, we're off a little bit here and there when it's a full management procedure, we may find the performance of that policy is nowhere near what we thought it was from an equilibrium state. So, if, if I paraphrase that wrong, Steve, hopefully correct me, but I think this is a, a great tool to quickly filter out and, and get to some of the prime candidates, but it's not a tool that's going to be a good one to choose a new procedure with. No. Yeah, I was just going to say it's robustness is proportional to the second derivative of this curve, so your explanation is much better than mine. Um, yeah. <laughs> You just got to calculate the second derivative of this curve, and you'll be fine. No, it's um, Ian's right. This tool was basically put in place here, much like when I interrupted Alan in, in his presentation. He showed you a sort of distribution of outcomes, and and then the the median value of that or the mode of the distribution, the peak of that distribution, sorry, would correspond to the long term performance. That's what this, this tool is essentially doing. Is It's just showing you if you were to tweak the policy a little bit, here's how the mode of that distribution would change. And, and it does so in real time and not three days. And, and hopefully you don't have to repeat it because you found a bug and all the other issues that go along with simulation modeling. Moreover, it's a tool that I'm hoping everyone, you know, pairs over here with his iPad <laughs> modifying fisheries policy and, and that's the idea is you can go back home, show your stakeholders and your constituents and explain these things without having to sit around and wait four days for a computer to spit out results. So that was the, the intent of developing this tool and thank you Ian for explaining that.
So to extend that explanation maybe and just make sure I'm on the right page, when I pull this uh, minimum size limit down to 30 inches, I see a drop in spawning stock biomass at MSY. So that's a, that's a trade-off that we would be able to see more fully in the percentage of the time that we meet whatever spawning, you know, the 30-20 rule or whatever, whatever threshold we're looking at in the dynamic model. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've gotten uh, just through, uh, I've gotten quite a bit of feedback uh, indirectly just from listening to people's interpretations of the table. So I, I thank you very much for trying to play with this and, and, and giving feedback and, and talking about it because it really does help me clarify some of the things I'm clearly missing on this interface that would make your explanations better. Um, I think Bruce had a really uh, interesting point, maybe not for the equilibrium analysis, but when you run the management strategy evaluation things and you summarize these tables, um, you can almost color code them as, as the red and green as in they satisfy the biological objectives and they don't, and then you can quickly draw your eyes to the ones that satisfy our objectives and not satisfy our objectives. So uh, there's some work to be done on, on that part and making this more efficient. So thank you again for having a look at this. So are there any other management procedures that you would like us to look at uh, to put into this process? Mm. I mean, this is a fairly rich suite of things that, we, that you're able to look at right now, but if there's some other things that people are up there, so Scott. Yeah, I mentioned it before, and I guess it's, it's not ready yet because it's not an area-specific thing, but at some point it would be interesting to see management procedures that relate to the recreational sector, too. Yeah, that one... Um not that it needs a, a spatially explicit model. What it needs is a bunch of area-specific rules post-apportionment uh, because each regulatory area has a different set of rules being developed for how, you know, they got cash share programs in one area. We have a fixed allocation in BC. We have um, basically an open access derby fishery in, in 2A and, and all kinds of other things. So. Ian presented this to the staff about how our catch is broken down by area, and, and I was commenting on the number of if statements required to actually implement that in the, the, uh, this model, but that's work in progress. Tom, Tom Arkin, well, just one last final question for me. Would, would it be significant or difficult to find out if you did change size, how that would impact the model as far as the shift from female to male catch? That, um, and that, is that significant? Does it matter? Yeah, that's actually already being computed in here. I'm just not displaying the results on the inter, inter, interface. The other thing that's already being computed in here, too, is the average size of the catch. And, and originally I had that on the interface, but I took that off just because there was already enough numbers on there. Um, but that is a, a very interesting uh, metric to look at. It's just a sudden change in the size limit can have a dramatic change in the actual, um, in the actual average size of the catch coastwide. Moreover, a sudden increase or a sudden shift in, in going from 12 out to 16 knot hooks in the directive fishery also has a positive effect on increasing the average weight in the catch. So your task now <laughs> is to go forth and work with this and give us the feedback that you that comes out of your explanations and your uh, dealing with your colleagues uh, so we can actually try to build a, a better tool in the interim we will be working on the kind of enhancements to this in terms of trying to put some form of spatial work into this and then doing some background work um, hopefully on dynamic modeling so we can then move onward from this as well so there's still lots of work in front of us and Steve in particular on this thing but it will benefit from the results of you actually working with this simulation tool right now so you can give us some feedback on the things that uh, either you would like to see improved or what you think are the most promising uh, management procedures that we can put forward for further investigation. So um, what I would like to talk with you about right now though is um, what I raised on the first day which is um, developing a, a somewhat somewhat different governance structure for this so we could have co-chairs from this thing so that this group can then actually carry forward the message from the MSE process to 
reporting to the, the commission as well as reporting to the conference board and the PAG, which is probably as, as important uh, in doing the outreach from this process. So what we um, are putting before you then is, is the suggestion that you elect um, co-chairs. I think it would be appropriate to have in, in the same way we do for our other advisory bodies as a co-chair from the U.S. and Canada uh, to act as the conduit for information from the MSE with staff support uh, to the commission and to the other advisory bodies. Yes, Jim. <laughs> so this is probably a good idea, but I wonder if you could, you know, the advisory bodies, when they report to the commission, uh, kind of operate without the presence of commissioners or too many high-level staff people. Maybe that's wrong. But, but this particular group has commissioners on it, and it's run by Steve Martell, and you're here. Uh, why wouldn't you or Steve or Paul be the best people to explain to the commission what went on. And I, I'm not disagreeing, I just was wondering what's, what's the difference there, maybe you could help me. It might help us decide who we'd elect. Yeah, I, that, that's a good point, Jim, and, and I, the staff thoughts on this were that this should be a process that's largely driven by the, the needs of industry, the desires of industry towards particular outcomes, in the, in, the, in the fishery management for this. There's a whole idea behind this was to, was to get industry feeding into the development of objectives so that the Commission could consider that industry participation. So that was kind of the thinking behind it, Jim, is that the, the ownership of this process should right, reside with industry. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about this and I have to admit, I've been thinking about how it would best serve us, um, not really serve the PEG or the conference board, but I'm just going to throw this out for everyone to think about. Rather than have sharing chairman or two co-chairs, there are two things that um, Steve, with your help and the other staff members' help, does for us. There's three things. And it's impossible to do all three at once. One is he runs a meeting and he takes notes on who's got their hand up. Two is he answers technical questions that we all pepper him with. And then three, he, he uh, reports back. So taking notes and writing a report and reporting back. So my thought in all this was to um, elect a chairman for the meeting and then elect a co-chair. I don't really if we could call that other person whatever we wanted to, but the role of the other person would be to take notes and disseminate them to all of us um, rather than two co-chairs who I'm not really sure how that would work. So I just took a look at what I thought needed to be done and the skills required and I didn't think we could find equally those in two individual people, so it might be just simpler to think about electing a chairman and a, a scribe or a rapporteur. So that's my idea. Um, I guess I'm not s seeing consistency between what Bruce was describing as as the role of the co-chairs and what and you what what you were describing, but maybe I misunderstand. So I, I thought that the co-chairs would would report to the commission and to the PAG and the um, advisory body conference board but um, it would be based on minutes that are currently taken the way I assume it would occur they would be based on minutes that under the current process we're using so but what you're describing is that is a, a chair and a co-chair who would who would not maybe not somebody would be taking minutes of our meetings rather than Steve so they wouldn't really be participating and I just want to make sure I understand the difference between what you're suggesting and what Bruce was suggesting there's a couple of things um, that are weaknesses in my idea one is that a chairman is in my view a chairman runs the meeting so that person would speak on on whatever he or she wanted to talk about, but it would be after everyone else has had a chance to talk generally. And the other person would just uh, the other person would not be a co 
like I said, we could call him a co-chair, but it would be a person who would um, would do that, would write, would report on it. Um, both of those people could also report to the commission and to the advisory bodies. If I can, the the the, the idea behind having the co-chairs was in some ways to get at either Pear or Bruce's comment about is, is the MSAB replacing the conference board or something like that. This would be a way for industry to report back to itself and saying, no, look, this is a process that we're involved in here. This is what we're doing and so forth. So that, that was at least part of the intent behind that? Well, so several thoughts in no particular order, I guess. Uh, first of all, um, I wonder how it would sound uh, for someone other than Steve or, or one of the staff to report this stuff to um, the commissioners. Um, it might not sound very good. Um, or it might sound like, uh, wow, what are these guys thinking? What were they doing that whole time? Um, and I, I'm thinking about this meeting and I'm thinking without you, Bruce, and Steve and, and the rest of the staff here, you know, basically what's happened here, at least from what I can see, is you guys have presented the the, uh, the MSE and we've sort of um, given you feedback. I don't know how that changes exactly uh, because I don't think that there's any one, maybe, maybe there is, but um, there probably is, but, but it doesn't seem like they're coming forward that, that really a person who, who gets the whole thing and can be you or Steve. Um, the other piece of that is, you know, in terms of, uh, and I'm not sure about the uh, conference board, but the PAG, um, you know, it's a group of 20-ish, 25-ish, and I think the three people or four people who are here from the PAG are going to do a good job of reporting to the PAG uh, what this was all about and where it's going and, and like that. I don't think, um, my guess is we could do that without uh, a formalized uh, process. Um, I'm not sure about the conference board, but I suspect there are people here at the conference board who could, or who are members of the conference board who could probably uh, do that as well. The bottom line, though, is when you go make a presentation to the conference board, they're going to say, well, what about, and, and whoever, that, whoever these people are are going to say, well, geez, I don't know. So you're going to have to have, you guys are going to have to be there. So, I mean, I don't, I get, I get having something separate of, of the staff, but, uh, and probably Steve wants to go do his real job, uh, but I think this would be uh, nigh on, we, we, we certainly wouldn't have gotten nearly as far as we've gotten, uh, and I think that part of the process has to continue. The other piece of that is, um, I think the minutes that we get, are better, at least what I've seen, and they're voluminous, and that's not a good thing, but, I mean, it is a good thing, but you just got to read them all. They're probably better than they would be if it were one of us writing them down and thinking, well, what the hell were they talking about there now? Um, so I think the, the structure right now is, is, is good. Yeah, um, I had a chance to think about this too a bit overnight and, um, you know, I, I think the process has been working well as it is, <clears throat> but I do think, I mean, things transition over time as well, and I do think it would help the process evolve if there were a chair or and or co-chairs. But to me, it's more of a fun, more than just a function of reporting out to the commission, because um, one could take the minutes and report out pretty easily. But I do think uh, there would be a benefit to moving the process along and I think free up the staff to do their work, whether it be Steve or, um, or Bruce or, or Steve, that uh, would allow them to participate some more in the discussion rather than actually um, trying to chair the meeting. And so I guess my thought on it was at this point in time is not necessarily needs to be someone within this particular room. Um, I had someone in mind, but before I would put an, a name forward, I need to talk to them because they're not here. And I guess what I was thinking about as far as, um, you know, as a way forward to address your question, Bruce, it is to delay it a bit, uh, but 
to support your concept in principle to, to identify someone and be willing to have that discussion at the interim meeting um, and come forward with you know at least a, an idea of how to proceed. I guess, a, and a question for you around, uh, I hadn't really thought of what Peggy had spoken about notes I, I, taking. Uh, you guys spend a lot of time up there writing down notes and, uh, and that's a, that can be an onerous task in itself just to do that. And so I, I think the notes that we are getting from the meeting are, are uh, complete and fulsome. But I guess I would ask, you know, like, do you see a need for a note taker? I hadn't really considered that as part of the chair's role. And, and, you know, if you thought that there needed to be someone else to assist in doing that, maybe there's someone could could do it and that would free you up to do some more things as far as participating as well. So a question for you. I'm personally satisfied with the notes that we're getting at this point in time. But um, maybe there's a, an easier way for you. So just to answer that question, that the way the notes are produced from the meeting is really a cooperative process between, you know, Steve, Ian, Steve, and myself on this thing, just sort of we're cobbling together things and usually they come through through uh, one of our offices to, to get in the final stage that we, we share amongst ourselves, but because all of us take down slightly different uh, sort of spins on things, so we, we do actually rely on each other quite a bit to sort of produce the notes for it. Um, it isn't from, from the staff's perspective on this, it wasn't so much the idea that we felt that, um, that the reporting um, necessarily would be would be better coming from uh, chairs or co-chairs or something like that. It's more the, the process of, of sort of buying and, and endorsement to it. When we had the first presentation of this last year at the conference board, the usefulness of having some of these participants sitting around the table to say, yeah, okay, that was working okay, or this is the way where this is going, and this is, is an important part of this, this process from, from our perspective on the staff about us making sure we're getting the, the buy-in and, and the, the communication with the, with the advisory bodies, not so much that we felt that the reporting necessarily would be more efficient or anything from a, a different set of people. It was uh, Pear and then Chris. All right. No, I was just going to say I agree with John. I think the process, the way it is now, is is the most efficient process. If you put a, one of us up there, uh, we may kind of <laughs> blunder along for a while. At least for the time being, we should probably leave it the way it is. And uh, you know, it's always going to come back. We're going to have to ask ask Steve or or get somebody from staff, <laughs> you know, to answer the question anyway. So yeah. Okay. It. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was just thinking, been thinking about this in, in chairs and, and the likely victim, and um, and then I was struck with what Peggy was saying there, just about about the process and and, and Paul's comment too. In that, uh, I, I think I think we would benefit by having someone to to really just their role is to chair the meeting, to free up, you know. Dr. Martell to lead the discussion, and you're not having to worry about who the speakers list or oh that was a good point or whatever. Where you're in, able to engage and lead the discussion, and somebody to be able to say, mm, you know, that's not really we're not really talking about that now. We'll we'll talk about that later. Why don't you guys talk about that during the break or whatever? <clears throat> I think we would benefit from that. Um, the one thing I guess I'm, uh, but I don't know if that person is a is a is a stakeholder. I, I think you need somebody who's a fairly strong chair and and. Quite frankly, as a, as a stakeholder, I want I want to participate in the meeting. I wouldn't want to miss out in, in having to, to chair it. That's just my personal feeling. But um, <clears throat> the other thing is just reporting on at the annual meeting. I guess I'd be a, a little in the, maybe this is a little bizarre, but we haven't had co-chairs or people chairing the meetings like one of us. So I'd be uncomfortable saying they were chairs because we we haven't been chairing the meetings, and maybe that's a little semantics, whatever. But it's just you know. In the process we have now, PAG has chairs, conference board has chairs, they chair the meeting. And so I think if we are going to have um, someone from the group or two people from the group, they should be classified as such. And if we, if we want to move to, to a, a chairing role, then you know, this person will be the chair from X point on. But it's sort of along the lines, you know, I thought you, you made some good points there, Peggy, about um, you know, just thinking about it, being able to free up some of the staff to really engage and lead the discussion and not so worried about some of the notes or that type of thing. Now, I recognize this is a technical discussion, so just bringing someone in to do notes could be challenging. You could end up with something that's even less helpful and more work to produce, but maybe there's a balance there somewhere. 
maybe instead of calling them co-chairs, they'd be more like reporters or liaison or something, because I think that it would be helpful for the PAG and the conference board maybe to hear from the stakeholder perspective about the process rather than directly from s staff. And I think that's the kind of role that, that they don't want to play, because it, then it looks like they're, they're dictating the MSC process, which is um, not what the rest of the um, people in the in the process want to hear. So I think just a r reporter or liaison, somebody who can re can provide those uh, extra comments, uh, fill in the gaps about why this is uh, helpful, um, what will it get us, what the problems are, um, provide some level of comfort and assurance as needed and, and maybe take some arrows too. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, that's sort of a, a, a reasonable approach. I guess though, I, there's two comments here. There's the chair and then there's the reporting out. And I think we have to be clear on the duties of each group or each individual position or positions is going to be. But in, in terms of, I, I think you raise a, a good point about how are, how are we going to report out? Like, we've heard some discussion around the table that some of us might be uncomfortable with trying to explain some of the technical aspects of MSE and, and why we're doing this and who's on first and that. But at the same time, your point, I think there is some value from our fellow conference board or our fellow PAG members hearing from us directly. So maybe it's, um, you know, maybe we need to think about this a bit and how we want to do it. Is it a bit of a, you know, two or three or four people as a bit of a panel just talking about it, a, a sort of a bit of a technical, well not technical presentation, but a bit more of a what happened and then just some reporting out as, as a few of us as members of the group or something. I don't know. I, I, I see both sides of it. I see the, the need for here are the facts, here's what happens, here's how it works and why, and some of us might be uncomfortable on trying to explain that. But I also see some value as being able to say, hey, you know, I've been participating in this process, and here's what's working, here's what isn't, here's what I've learned. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's a, a, a way to deal with it. I guess I just want to give, uh, listen to some of the feedback. I apologize, I missed you. It sounds like Peggy made some awesome statements, and I missed out on those. Sorry about that. From my perspective, uh, Presenting this information to to the annual meeting in the interim meetings is um, awkward because it is supposed to be a stakeholder-driven process. Uh, I recognize, obviously, the the technical aspects, and I'm the engineer behind all the technical pains in the butt that that go into this process. And I'm happy to speak to the conference board and, and the PAG about the technical elements of it. I I feel as Dan pointed out that I think the the conference board and the PAG do want to hear uh, from the MSAB membership uh, how the process has evolved, uh, what the objectives are, and, and how the membership came up with the, the objectives and those sorts of issues. With regards to the technical aspects of implementing size limits and, and national shares and harvest policies and, and those sorts of things, I'm happy to speak on behalf of the board and perhaps what we need is not a chair and a co-chair but an MSAB subcommittee that I would also sit on but then also have uh, industry representation or stakeholder representation to speak and represent the process. Uh, Bruce brought up a point that concerns me is, is I don't want to go to the annual meeting speak to the conference board and the PAG and give the perception that this is uh, an IPHC-led process and, and that all of the things that are coming out of this are just my ideas or, or the Commission's ideas. So that's, that's my perspective on this. Thanks. So um, I had a, a little bit different thoughts on this. I appreciate what um, what the conversation has been here, but similar to Peggy, I guess I saw uh, the need for more of a, a facilitator for the meetings, not necessarily someone to take notes. I was hoping staff could still continue to do that, um, but someone that could help facilitate the meeting and then in uh, addressing the conference board and PEG and, and the commission, uh, I think it's appropriate for 
uh, technical staff to to assist uh, and certainly uh, be able to describe maybe what some of the data limitations are, the model limitations are, that type of thing. But it would be helpful, I think, to have more of a, a neutral spokesperson, if you will, for the MSAB that communicated more along the lines of the goals and objectives that, that we're trying to achieve. So I see two different two different roles there. I also think it would be, uh, well, it would certainly be helpful for me uh, since we don't meet all that often and we spend quite a bit of time at the beginning of each meeting kind of where did we end up last time, what did we do, uh, certainly would be helpful if um, if we had some, and it doesn't have to be a co-chair, but if we had some sort of coordination that occurred in between meetings, and, and perhaps that happens, uh, you know, similar to a, a U.S. delegation meeting that we have prior to the annual meeting and, and a Canadian delegation meeting, that there could be even just a, a conference call or two to kind of go over uh, post-meeting, you know, what was discussed and, and why, and then maybe in preparation for the next meeting, kind of what are, what are our thoughts on the different items that are coming up on the agenda. So I saw that role uh, initially as it was described uh, as the, the co-chairs, one for each country, as someone that may be able to, to pull that together in between meetings. Well, I think ultimately we do have to get to a point where, where the MSA results are reported to the Commission and the public by not Steve. I'm not sure there yet. I'm, I've been trying to think how this meeting would have gone better had uh, Peggy been facilitating it. Yeah, and I think it would have been the same kind of thing. Uh, ultimately, we have to get there. My only question is do we do it right now or do, do we do it after we go one more round of things? And so. Well, thanks, Jim. That's that's good. Uh, we just wanted to put this out for people to consider, and it was it was primarily because the staff is concerned that this isn't perceived as as a staff process; that it's it's in fact an industry-driven process. That's why we invited you all here is to help define those objectives, and that that was the main idea behind it. Um, it would be nice to get at least a decision on which direction we would like to go on this uh, at this meeting, uh, even if we don't necessarily implement it at this meeting. I would like to get some um, strong feeling from folks as to which direction we should go. We have sort of two ideas on the table right now. Uh, one is to have sort of an independent slash chair facilitator um, leaving, the, leaving the staff free to, to do notes and participate in the discussion. Um, and the second one uh, that Michelle was just voicing was to have co-chairs that could act as, as partial coordinators amongst the national sections as well. So I invite comments on that. Maybe Michelle first, if I make sure I haven't mis misstated your, your concept. Yeah, thanks. Um, you haven't misstated the concept in terms of having some coordination that occurs in between meetings, but at, that does not necessarily have to be at, as a result of, of a co-chair, for example. I think that's something where we could easily just do that coordination if there's, if there's interest in, in doing that. Okay. Jim? Bruce? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't think we're that, at least within the room here, that far apart. I think we have reporting out, yeah, it's got to be some members of the board. Who they are going to be is, you know, to be determined, you know, later in the structure. But also with, with staff there for providing some technical assistance. I think you have to do that anyways because there's going to be some questions that we're just going to go, yeah, well that'll be Steve or that'll be Ian or someone to answer. And I think the other thing, like, is the real decision is how do we want the meetings? You know, do we have a current sort of system we have here with sort of Bruce and Steve chairing, or do we have a appointed person who kind of chairs and facilitates a meeting and that could be whoever that and, and Paul put that out but I think the coordination that um, that was brought up we kind of do that we didn't do it this time but we generally do it in Canadian about just before the, the meeting we'll try to do a conference call but maybe that's more of a one of the duties that the board members need to do 
you know, it's kind of one of the things that are expected of it that to review what went on the last meeting, and that's kind of one of our responsibilities, and that's the responsibility of the different, you know, Canadian section and U.S. section because it would be much easier to sort of coordinate that just that way. And this, that's part of our responsibilities, and it's kind of the term, not really terms of reference, but we, you should be, we should be doing that. Bruce? Well, that's Bruce Gabrius. I, I see there's probably two, it seems like there's two thoughts going around the room here about that item. There's one, there's a short-term issue that Bruce identified is that how are we going to communicate what the MSAB has been doing to the, at the, that the upcoming interim meeting and the annual meeting, which is this fairly short term. And I'm thinking that that is more uh, communication, not in the technical aspects of things, but the public's going to want to know, what have you guys been doing? Yeah. And we get that asked that, that individually after these meetings. And then the other part of the discussion is maybe a more um, long-term, how we conduct ourselves, what's, if, is there efficiency to be gained by having a facilitator, coordinator, chairman, as far as how we go forward in our business. And I can't remember who had the um, titling of it. But maybe that uh, for the interim meeting and the annual meeting, there's identified a spokesperson, two or three or whatever, to present this to the public, if you will, in that formal setting of the interim meeting and the annual meeting. But that is not necessarily labeled as a chair or a co-chair, because I would agree that you know we haven't operated that way, so that person should not walk in there carrying that title. But I can see the advantage of having a member of this august body to provide that to the public instead of a staff member that's you know the IPHC. So um, I don't know if that helps, but I think we might want to get through the short-term need first, and then we can discuss you know, whether or not we want to change the, the way we conduct our meetings in the future. John? You know, just addressing how this is reported to the public, um, I got to tell you, a lot of my perception of what the public wants to know is, What's my quota going to be next year? <laughs> and, and does this process help me in, in my argument or does it not? Um, but when we get at least to the PAG, and I think I've been to every PAG meeting since they started, and I know I don't look that old, uh, I think I've been to every PAG meeting. I don't think we have a problem with this. I think the three of us here, we're going to be able to present what happens here pretty, pretty well. We're still going to need somebody who really knows what we've done or, or has the sense of, of how this all works. Um, but I think as far as reporting to our constituency, if you will, um, I think we can, I think at least uh, from the processor's standpoint, we, could, we can do that. I don't think that's a problem. But we do need help. I mean, we're going to need the help. And as far as running the meeting, if, if, if we need to have a, a meeting director then we should but but ultimately it's still going to come down to you know you guys are going to carry the discussion because you got you got all the you got all the ammo I think that's that's fair um, I, I actually personally I, I like the idea of a facilitator coming in here I think that would having an independent person who could come in and just sort of make sure the meetings running along properly would be really great <laughs> you know because you know what we're all like we tend to go off on little tangents on things and so it would be useful to have that that kind of process in terms of the reporting I, I, I guess I see it a little bit differently for the, the PAG versus the conference board because the PAG is, is, is a smaller group with, with multiple members sitting on this right now. I mean, the conference board does too, but it's a much more diverse group, and I see probably a little bit greater need for outreach with that group, maybe that more so than the PAG, and that's no, no uh, insult intended any, on either side of that issue, but uh, there might be a little slightly different needs. But there are a couple other hands are Rachel and then Paul. I was just going to add, not being all that familiar with the IPHC process, more familiar with the council process, it, I understand what you're saying, John, but it, it seems like there could be some value of consistent reporters at the PAG and at the conference board and in front of the commission um, speaking for the group. Um, so I don't have a lot of, I like the idea of reporters, I think the way Dan described it, based on you know the short-term need that we have at least for this meeting, if we're considering trying to develop a, a different structure. Um, I like the way that Dan described it, since, since uh, the, those people would be speaking for the whole group. 
Yeah, I guess uh, my thought press process on this was why, why would we need uh, someone to facilitate or chair, whatever you want to call that. And uh, to me, the, the deciding factor is the reason that Steve uh, and Bruce talked about is that um, we need that because it's not a, a staff-driven process. It's a process that reports back out to the commission. And there are some policy elements here that worry when we talk about procedures. So, I mean, I think we need to address that just from that point of view and how we uh, decide who that person or persons are uh, doesn't need to be decided today, but to me that's why, you know, at the minimum we need to have those people identified. So the, the perception is that this is a process that's being driven by this board that reports out to a commission to make some decisions. And otherwise it could be just that it's a, a staff uh, driven process, which it is not. And so I think uh, that's why we need it. And some of the other reasons that I talked about uh, frees up uh, Steve and Bruce to do other things um, is a, a secondary issue, but also improves upon the performance of what we're doing here. I just wanted to touch on uh, Jim Balsiger's comment about whether this is the appropriate time to do this or whether we should delay this. I guess where I sit now and, and looking at the past four meetings, we're still all in a very much of a, a learning phase. Um, a lot of the everything you know I've been doing and developing these tools is is mostly to the A teach myself how to communicate to you guys without speaking in second derivatives and, and tongues of math. Um, and, and B, also bringing everyone up to speed and trying to learn how all these moving parts work together and, and influence uh, the policy. So we're really in that kind of phase and whether we have a whole lot to report uh, back to the annual meetings, you know, this year I, I don't think there's much to say other than here's the process uh, that we've set out. But what I would put on the table is that in the future, um, this board is going to be not so much in the learning phase, but much more in an active policy uh, sort of recommendation type phase where there's, there's intensive simulation testing going on of, of management procedures, and then there may be four or five preferred procedures that are up for consideration amongst the commissioners, and it really has to be the, the stakeholders who are presenting you know, here's the trade-offs we found through this process, and, and here's how the conference board believes, uh, you know, we should be sitting in this process, and here's how the bag, PAG should believes we should be sitting in the process, and here's some of the key uncertainties that, that would swing things in one direction or another direction. So as this process evolves, I really see the, the need for these chair, communicator, rapporteur type positions to... Um, play a much more extensive or intensive role with the commission staff. Right now it's kind of a, we're in an early learning phase of this whole thing, so keep that in consideration. I, I guess I'd kind of like to second in a way what Bruce brought up. I, that was kind of my perception that the request for have a couple of representatives, if you want to call from this group, to address the interim and the annual meeting from the industry's perspective, what we've been doing here, uh, and certainly I, a technical staff would be there to, to assist if, you know, questions came up, but, and I understand, you know, from, from, the, from the political realm of it, why you want the representatives to come from this group to speak to the PAG and the conference board. Uh, and, and I don't think you have to get mired down too much in the, the technical aspects of it. I mean, those folks would be there to help out with that, but I, I think that's that was my understanding that immediately for the interim meeting, which is coming up, you know, shortly, and well as the annual, that, you know, have a couple of representatives from this group, you know, speak to, you know, that, those bodies as to what we've been doing here and where we think this is going. Uh, and I don't think, you know, as to the long range of having a chair or facilitator, I, I really hadn't gone that far with it. I was more at the representative stage of this upcoming meetings, you know, to have us talk to our own folks about what we've been doing here, and knowing full well that staff is going to back us up if some technical question comes up. That was just my understanding of it. So in the spirit of getting everyone's feedback on these things we've been discussing, um, I'd just like to ask John one quick question. Do you have any feelings on how you want this board to be represented to the commissioners when we 
you know, the different groups will make a report to the commissioners at their interim meeting? Well, I guess I wonder what, if it's not going to be me, but if it were, if it were, what I would say to the commissioners. First of all, there were three of them here for much of this process this time, but I mean, what do we do? Well, geez, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't have much to say. I'd say, well, this is sort of how I perceive the process, and we might all describe that differently. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I just wanted to give everyone my feedback on, I think we really should have a facilitator or a chairman, and someone from outside the group would be great, I think, give all of us a chance to tell everyone else our opinion. On t in terms of the reporting, um, I think uh, Steve's comments are really, really good because right now it's kind of a no-brainer. We can, even the conference board, I think, could probably do it in a group of um, harvesters, um, prepare beforehand for this January's meeting, but look at the notes that we'll get from this meeting and, and use them. But as we get more into it and more... Uh, the work that we do here will be more relevant to the decisions that the uh, commissioners make, then I think we'll, the re responsibility will be a little heavier and we'll have to really think this through and get a, a good group or individual to do those things. But So for this year, I think at this meeting we should talk a little bit more about the facilitator idea or the chairman idea of from outside this group if there's anything more to do to roll, get that ball rolling. Um, and then I'm happy with um, kind of an organic approach to the reporting to the annual meeting and the interim meeting. Thank you. I, I, I think that probably summarizes where the group is on this right now, is that it's, it's, it's kind of the freeform reporting that we currently have relative to the state of the process right now is probably sufficient. Um, the idea of a facilitator seems to have some traction uh, around the room here. So um, I'm open to suggestions as to how you would like to proceed in terms of uh, finding a facilitator for this. Paul, you said you had some, you might have a suggestion or someone you wanted to talk to that. Um, are there other recommendations from around the table, people drawing on other experiences that they uh, would like to bring forward? Well, not drawing from other experiences, but I think it would be fruitful to find someone who has experience with a management strategy evaluation. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer, but... Well, I, I, I think we need... we probably... Uh, I don't know if we need one from each country or not. I'd actually like to talk to my fellow commissioners. I have a feeling they're going to say, if we have things on the table, such as compensating for bycatch in other regions, we all know that's about Canada against the U.S. If those are the kind of things we're going to talk about, I think my commissioners will say, well, we have to have co-facilitators. But, but let me discuss it with them, and, uh, especially since Paul doesn't know his, can't announce his man right or person today. Uh, we'll do that very quickly. And then I'm not sure how we're going to get the whole U.S. together, because uh, this isn't about the commissioners, it's about this group. But uh, So I'm a little, I'm a, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm a little confused on going forward right now, I guess. Did you have your hand up? No. no? Um, I, I, from the standpoint of the near-term objectives about how to get through the inner meeting and the annual meeting, uh, I think John's, you know, he, he's got a lot of experience at a PEG that's a small group, uh, probably can just facilitate that. Conference board has got to be, what, 60 or 70 or more people in that room when do that. So maybe that's a little less uh, uh, manageable doing that informally. But I think it is important that when it gets the presentation, maybe beyond those two boards, but to the, to the commissioners, even though that at times we've had half of the commissioners here, that that is really the public's opportunity to hear what we've been up to. Um, and I think it's going to talk this year, it would, I think it's fair to say that it would be talking more about process in, or processes, some 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So I always tell which is the Canadian side and which is the U.S. side. It's, it's process or process. Uh, but anyway, that part I think is going to be more about the process that we're going to, that that report, the individual, which should be the title of a, some guy designated the individual to report, uh, where the public's going to hear that. And I would further submit that the the narrative of that should be pre-written so that there's consistency in the message between what's said at the at the PAG, what's said at the uh, conference board, and what's said uh, in front of the commissioners, which is also publicly broadcast. So there, I think the, the consistency is important, and where the specific interests that may be in the PAG or maybe at the conference board, that would come out in the questions, and then you can appropriately address that. But but I'd, I'd like to kind of see that narrative before it, uh, you know, as a member, to make sure it's covering those things and it doesn't get into things perhaps like allocated compens or compensated allocations and such, because I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. Just um, thinking about the upcoming meetings, the interim and the annual, <laughs> like maybe here's a suggestion for a way ahead, is that uh, there is a presentation that the staff provides on work done to date on a strictly technical basis. And um, there could be um, a presentation or comments uh, that the commissioners can make, as, as already uh, said, uh, there's been uh, four commissioners that attended at least some of these meetings and some more than one that we could provide some feedback after we hear that uh, presentation. Um, so that that could be a way ahead for the next meeting anyhow um, until we sort out exactly how we want to go in the long term. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like that at this stage. Um, might I suggest further to that 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 within the if we're looking at facilitation that within the national sections that they could feed up through the lead commissioners suggestions for facilitators that could be discussed at the interim meeting because the interim meeting doesn't have the two advise the two other advisory bodies at it so that would that reporting would not be taking place until the annual meeting so there is a little bit of time before that to allow us to then reconsider the facilitator idea or co-facilitators. Um, and they could have the, the members of the MSAB feed this up through the lead government commissioners. Is that how do people feel about that? Let's go with that process and then you'll by the by before the interim meeting if you have suggestions on facilitators that you could feed to the to Jim and Paul and then they could discuss this at the interim meeting as to uh, the way forward for this okay thank you that's helpful I think it's there, there is a recognition that we're probably that this is not a critical need right now in terms of the sort of reporting outwards but I think it will be in the future as Steve was pointing out as we get more into sort of things that are a little more policy laden than we are right now So we're kind of at the uh, end stage of where we were on, on this process right now. Uh, the question I want to pose to you uh, right now is, uh, at this point, we don't have something scheduled before um, our, the next two annual and the annual meeting and the interim meeting. Uh, we would not anticipate probably having something until uh, probably May as we had this year, but I'm a little bit more concerned about the idea of us getting feedback from you folks relative to your experience with the simulation tools and how we do that. Uh, so what I might suggest in this for discussion is to have uh, sort of a rump session of this group during the annual meeting uh, to try to, to get that feedback from you. This it would have to be fairly compressed, that's the only thing, and so we would desire to have that in written form prior to that rump meeting, but it would might be nice to have a small session of this group at the annual meeting uh, to have some additional discussion on this prior to a meeting, say, in May. I'm open that for comments. Um, well, I'm happy to participate in a, a short session at the annual meeting. I imagine yeah, I would probably attend, but I think generally that um, other stakeholders may not be engaged enough or interested enough in this process until they know 
more specifically how it affects them. If they don't really understand it, it doesn't really affect um, setting catch limits, and it, um, they might not even be. It might be hard to get them interested in even playing with the tool, and that and that's just my my gut feeling. Um, I'll leave it at that. Other thoughts, Peggy? I th I'm having a deja vu moment because I think I said this last time, but I think that's reasonable and I think we can do that. We're, our world is a little smaller than the whole harvesting sector. We're going to have a meeting in December. Um, I'll prepare them for whatever discussion we put on that agenda about the MSAB by introducing them to this tool. I'm a little scared to say that, but I think I'm going to do it because with the introduction that, you know, over the years, most of our members have gone to the IPHC for years and years and years, and we've seen these changes in harvest rates and big, big time policy changes because of, in many cases, things that they have recommended. And then the next year, the Commission says, okay, well, we heard what you said, and so now we're going to do this, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work, and right there is the kernel of why the MSA, the MSE process is valuable. So I think they'll remember that it will be uh, something that they can relate to. So I, I don't think it's a problem for us to do that at the annual meeting. So you're suggesting getting this group together sometime during the annual meeting. That, that was, or was that, did I mishear that? that? That was the suggestion to try to facilitate the feedback on using the shiny tool. That's, that was the main okay. reason for that, Jim. All right, oh, that, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what I thought. So, yeah, I don't think that's, I think most people here are going to be there, uh, at least on the Canadian side. Do uh, you want to put out some suggested times? Not yet. <laughs> no, 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 I know, I know, not yet. <laughs> yeah, preferably not like at the end of a day that's gone until six or seven o'clock at night. But uh, yeah, just put some suggested times. And I think can't speak for the Canadian group at all, but I think generally, you know, we'll probably have some sort of internal meeting and process, and and be able to come up with some consensus on what works best. An, an alternative for people to consider is is us. Um, putting out some form of solicitation to you, sending out an email to you saying with some specific questions about how you've worked with the tool or something like that. That's an alternative to sort of trying to set it up as a free-form meeting um, at the annual meeting. Um, in listening to Peggy's suggestion about presenting this to Hannah, I was getting all excited imagining myself being a fly on the wall watching how this well went over. Uh, at the. <laughs> and um, I guess I should offer up to the to the group that if you want to involve me to explain the tool and how to use the tool, I'm happy and willing to to travel around. It seems how my wife isn't working. Um, you may have to babysit a toddler or something like that, but I'm happy to do that. <laughs> I was thinking too that the, um, if you wanted to generate interest up in the council process, you're there for the SSC meetings. You could have a short session in the evening about shiny, and I'd be happy to, you know, certainly announce a report on the MSAB meeting as, at the council meeting as well. So, um, Bruce, in your case, and you mentioned about uh, sending out some kind of an email and maybe a framework of a list of questions or just a reminder how to focus people's comments, uh, whether or not you have the gathering at the annual meeting, that probably would be a good idea to do that because uh, those individuals that may not be there at the annual meeting can have that, and even those of us that intend to be there, uh, well, it would also be helpful to either gather our thoughts or maybe send them to you and still have an opportunity to address that if there's a you know, if there is an ad hoc meeting put together, so I would I would suggest that you have that in either case, the, do the email thing.
Okay, from that I'm taking that the staff would generate uh, an outreach memo to you, some request to you of currently undefined staff <laughs> structure, um, asking you for your experiences on the shiny prior to the annual meeting. Uh, so we have a feeling for that, and that from that we could, um, I would sort of shy away from uh, a meeting of this group at the annual meeting if at all possible because it's a compressed enough thing there to begin with and having stacking something else on it's not not very desirable so if we can do this much more through internal communication that's better for us I think so nodding around the table okay <laughs> so we'll scrub the idea of, of a rump meeting at the annual meeting and work more on uh, outreach within the this group itself okay Okay, anything else? Some wrap-up discussion, feedback, closing remarks from anyone? Oh, here we are. John and then Peggy. Well, I just uh, was writing down the things I think I learned at this meeting. Um, the first is that reducing the size limit to 26 or 28 inches, at least for me, has some future. Uh, the second thing is that most models have too many moving parts to uh, be easily understood. <laughs> And the third is, the next time I'm watching the Weather Channel, I'm going to pay very close attention when they start predicting hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And this Peggy. is unrelated to that sort of thing, but I was wondering if we have a location for the interim meeting yet? Yes, it's at the yes. hotel back then. Yes. It's at the hotel back then, the University oh. District. Yeah. Same place, so yeah. if you were already staying. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Jeff. <laughs> I'd just like to say thanks to Steve for um, putting together the shiny tool. This is a lot more fun to play with than the last version that you put out. <laughs> and uh, I, I think there's some meaningful stuff in here, and it'll be fun to go home and um, actually share this with some of our fishermen. Uh, one of the things that Alan had in his presentation that really um, helped me be more clear in my mind about what this process is was that diagram that he showed, that circular diagram that shows how this thing works until it gets into implementation and then you get the new ideas. I think that will be helpful also with the stakeholders moving forward. If they can see that thing, I, for me it really drew a, a picture in my mind as to how this is supposed to work. Um, so maybe we can incorporate that somewhere. Uh, you can steal that one too maybe, Stephen. All right. And, and also that checklist there, the green and the red, I, I thought that was pretty cool. So maybe we could borrow some of these ideas, but I think we've made a lot of progress. I know I learned more, I think, in this meeting than I had in the previous three put together maybe. It, and uh, I think um, our vision is becoming more clear. So thank you. Sorry. All right. If there's no additional comments then thank you all very much this I think has been a really productive meeting for us um, I know it was a little a little slow to get started in terms of getting wrapped into the the details of this the simulation modeling but I think it's helped us a lot just this discussion to sort of clarify some of the things we need to do more on the operating model and put these things forward for you can work on them a lot better so thank you guys very much <laughs>